Dear Vintage Classics YouTube channel listeners and all zoners out there, welcome once again. In the next segment titled Night of the Meek, a derelict Santa Claus by the name of Henry Corwin is fired on Christmas Eve. He finds a mysterious bag that gives out presents. With this bag, he sets out to fulfill his one wish, to see the less fortunate inherit the bounties of Christmas. Happy listening, Vintage Classic Zoners. How much is this? Shall I wrap it up for you, ma'am? I got all my Christmas shopping done. I need one more present for Uncle Fred. Could you put a big red ribbon on that? Ma, where is he? He'll be here, Tommy. How long? Just a few more minutes. I don't believe it. He's never coming. Excuse me. Yes, madam? Are you the manager? Indeed I am. Mr. Dundee at your service. Well, I have a question for you. Gift wrapping? The customer service counter is downstairs on the first floor. No, no, not there. Oh, a special Christmas item. I'm sure we can find something. What exactly were you... Listen to me, Mr. Dundee. See this sign? What about it? What does it say? Santa will return at 6 o'clock. It's almost 6.30. Oh, yes. Well, you see... And my boy's been waiting all year to see him. We can't stand in line forever. I'll look into it, madam. Perhaps Santa has been detained. You know, so many presents to wrap up at the uh, North Pole. I'm sure the boy understands. You don't know my boy. Listen up, Dundee. If the guy in the red suit doesn't show in five minutes, we're going to another department store. Oh, really? That won't be necessary. I want to talk to Santa. How now, son? Where is he? Bartender, pour me another one, will you? Coming right up. Hey, Corwin. Yeah. See the clock on the wall? What about it? You told me to tell you when it was 6.30? Well, it's 6.30. That's exactly what it is. 6.30 on the dot. So what happens now? You turn into a reindeer? Would that that was so. One more, my good man. That's five drinks. No, six. And a sandwich. You owe me, Santa. Relax. I've got your money right here. Say, will you look at that? Where? Those two at the window. Little boy and little girl. Sad faces, don't you think? Yeah, they peek in here, they see Santa getting plastered. Real nice. Go on, show! That's not what's eating them. What is it then? They know there isn't really a Santa Claus. No kidding. Why do you suppose that is? How's that? Don't you ever wonder why there isn't a real one? For kids, I mean. What am I, a philosopher? You know what your trouble is, Corwin? You let that stupid red suit go to your head. Here's your change. I'll flip you for it. Double or nothing. What do you think this is, Atlantic City? Come on, eat your sandwich and get out of here. I've had enough to eat. Where's my drink? I'm coming. Oh, ouch. And keep your fingers out of the till. All right, all right. Can't you take a joke? I catch you doing that one more time, I'm going to break both your arms up to your shoulder blades. Now go on, get out of here. What's going on? Nothing, just Santa trying to hoist the joint. What's that for? Your tip, my good man. Take it easy now. Ooh, snow's pretty slippery. Oh! Oh, uh, I better sit down for a minute. Mr. Santa? Huh? I want a baby carriage and a dolly and a playhouse and a job for my daddy. What? And I want a gun and a, and a set of play soldiers and, and a big turkey for Christmas dinner. You don't think... Oh, you poor kids. Don't you get it? I, I can't help you. I, I can't... I can't even... That's okay. We can wait. We always wait for Santa Claus. This is Mr. Henry Corwin, normally unemployed, who once a year takes the lead role in a uniquely American institution, that of the department store Santa Claus, in a road company version of The Night Before Christmas. 
But in just a moment, Mr. Henry Corwin, Ersatz Santa Claus, will enter a strange kind of North Pole, which is one part the wondrous spirit of Christmas and one part the magic that can only be found in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Night of the Meek, starring Chris McDonald with Stacy Keach as your narrator. This is so inconsiderate. Here he comes, finally. Will you look at that? Why, he can hardly stand up. Oh, it's disgraceful. There you are. Hello, boys and girls. Ho, ho, ho. Corwin, you're an hour late. I am? One hour and nine minutes, to be exact. Can you beat that? Now, I advise you to get up on your throne without further ado. I'm going. I'm going. And refrain from disillusioning these children any further. All right. All right. I'm going. By showing them that not only isn't there a Santa Claus, but the one in this store happens to be a wino who'd be more at home playing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I take your point, Mr. Dundee. Stand aside. St. Nick is back on the job. Go ahead, climb up on his lap. He won't hurt you, will you, Santa? You won't hurt my little boy. Go on, you tell him. <laughs> What's your name, lad? Percival. You're putting me on. Percival Smithers. The third. My dad's name is Percival Smithers. My grandfather's name is Percival Smithers. Oh, I get it. Well, I guess that's not your fault. So, what would you like for Christmas, uh, young Percival? A new front name. <laughs> That's a good one. A real good one. I gotta remember it. Hey, Ma? Yes, dear? I smell something funny. You do? Yeah. And I know what it is, too. The same as Dad. Santa Claus is loaded. Leave my boy alone. Lady, I never laid a glove on a kid. Oh, you've got some nerve drinking on the job. Madam, I am... Mortally ashamed. Oh, you should be. Come along, Percival. I hope this won't scar you for life. Is there some trouble here? Trouble? No, there's no trouble, except that this is the last time I trade in this store. It seems you hire your Santa Clauses out of a gutter. Hey, who are you referring to? Drunken sot. Come on, Percival. Some Santa Claus? You don't even look like him. Mr. Dundee, that lady... It's got a problem. All right, everyone back to work. Back to your positions. And you, as for you, Mr. Kris Kringle of the Lower Depths, since we are only a few hours from closing, it is my distinct pleasure to inform you that there is no further need for your questionable services. You've had it. Now get out of here. It'll be my pleasure. Pick up your pay downstairs. Oh, and one more piece of advice. I I'm all ears. Get that moth-eaten red suit back to where you rented it before you really tie one on and destroy it for good and all, you drunk. Thank you ever so much, Mr. Dundee. As to my drinking, it is in... indefensible. You have my abject apologies. Don't waste your breath. That just doesn't cut it with me anymore. But I have feelings, you know? Plain old human feelings, same as anybody. And I find of late that I have very little choice in the matter of how I express my emotions. I can either drink or I can weep. And drinking is so much more subtle. Will you please leave? But as to my alleged insubordination, I assure you I was not rude to that woman. Someone should remind her that Christmas isn't just barging up and down department store aisles and pushing people out of the way. Or when I'm warning you. Someone should tell her that Christmas is something quite different from that. It's richer and finer and truer and... And it should come with patience and love and charity and passion. That's what I would have told her had she given me the chance... My, how philosophical, Mr. Corwin. Perhaps, as your parting words, you can tell us how we go about living up to those grand Yule standards which you have so graciously laid out for us. I don't know how. I wouldn't know how to explain it, especially to you. 
All I know is that I am an aging, purposeless relic of another time and place. A different way of life. And now, I, I don't know how it happened, but one day I woke up and found myself living in a dirty rooming house on a street that's filled with hungry kids and shabby, scared people. Good people. Where the only thing to come down the chimney on Christmas Eve or any other day of the year is more poverty. Keep your voice down. And if you must know, another reason I drink is so that when I walk up and down the tenements, I can think to myself just for a little while that they really are the North Pole and the children are elves and I'm really Santa Claus bringing a bag of beautiful things for all of them. Every last one. That's enough out of you. I wish, Mr. Dundee, on just one Christmas, only one, that I could see some of the hopeless ones, the, the dreamless ones. On just one Christmas, I'd like to see the meek really inherit the earth. So that's why I drink, Mr. Dundee, and that's why I weep. Who is that guy? Never heard anyone talk to Mr. Dundee like that. I never heard anybody talk like that. What in the heck is that? Sleigh bells? Yeah. Sure it is. Better get home and sober up. Could have sworn I heard. Who's there? In the alley. Stop hiding behind those garbage cans. What are you afraid of? Come out so I can see you. Oh. Give a start there, kitty. I gotta get sober. Look at the mess you've made. All right, I'll clean it up. Put the cans back in the bag. Lift it up. Put it back where it belongs. Wait a minute. What's in this bag, anyway? <laughs> oh, I don't believe it. It can't be. It, it flat out can't. Excuse me, sister. Is this the Delancey Street Mission House? It is. Could I get something to eat, sister? Will you take a seat with the others. Have yourself a nice cup of coffee. Oh, oh, sure. Dinner will be served after the sermon. Gotcha. Uh, I mean, okay. <laughs> Thank you, sister. God bless you. Have a seat. At least the coffee's hot. I sit down and take a load off. Uh, the sermon ain't so bad. No, it don't take long. Here's a chair. Uh, don't mind if I do. All right, what is this all about? You, the noise, the commotion, you. What is the idea of barging in and disrupting our Christmas Eve? Begging your pardon, Sister Florence. I ain't touched a drop since last Thursday, and that's the gospel truth. But I swear to you right now... You on mustn't swear. On account of I seen him with my own eyes. He's coming. Who? Him. Him. Santa Claus is coming to town. Oh, I thank you for the thought. He's coming up the street heading this way, and he's giving everybody their heart's desire. Oh, yeah, sure. Santa Claus? Are you kidding me? Pour yourself a cup of coffee. Black. Merry Christmas! I told you, sister, it's him. Now, what'll be your pleasure this year, gentlemen? How about you? Me? Yes, siree. Well, I'd sort of like to have a new pipe. Ha <laughs> ha. Let me take a look at my bag. Here you go. A new Mershom. How's that? Oh, thank you. Thank you kindly. How about you? Uh, a woolen sweater. A woolen sweater you shall have. Size? Well, who cares? Here you go. 
Next. Some new shoes? How about some pipe tobacco? Uh, a carton of cigarettes? Another sweater, maybe? Slippers. A smoking jacket. Where did you get all these gifts? Sister Florence, <laughs> don't ask me to explain because I can't. I'm as much in the dark as anybody else. All I know is that I've got a bag here that gives everybody just what they want for Christmas. As long as it's put now, let's see here. What do you need? How about a new dress, sister? All wrapped up with a pretty ribbon for you. Well, we'll see about that. Don't you want your present? Let's open it for her. Well, looky, looky, an evening gown. And it's strapless. <laughs> there he is. There he is. That's the man. What's your name? Henry Corwin, officer. At least it was Henry Corwin. <laughs> Maybe now it's Mr. S. Claus or Chris Kringle. <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> You're drunk, Corwin. Is that it? Naturally. Naturally, I'm drunk. I'm drunk with the spirit of the Yule. I'm intoxicated with the wonder that is Christmas Eve. I'm inebriated with joy and with delight. Yes, officer, I am quite indubitably drunk. <laughs> all right, all right, hold on there. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. You can begin by handing over that bag of yours right now. Wait a minute. You got no call to... The bag? Or I'm placing you under arrest? You can't arrest Santa Claus. Well, I sure can. And I can arrest every one of you. So let's have that bag, or we're all going down to the station house. You're hard of hearing. I, I'm, I'm sure we can settle this. Yes, we can, Carwin. And in a hurry, I'd like to see just one little thing. And that would be? Show me the receipt for all this stuff. Right now. The receipt? You heard me. Of course, you've got a receipt. Well, go on, Henry. Show it to the policeman. Sure, you got one, ain't you? Mm, I'm afraid that's the one... The one thing I don't have in this bag. Sister Florence. Yes, officer. Collect all the stolen goods. What stolen goods? I put them in a pile over there. I'll see that they get claimed after I find out where he took the stuff from. Gladly. Come along, Santa. But you don't understand. Move. I want to report a missing person. Yes, ma'am. Fill out a report. Do I get a phone call? After you see the judge, now sit down. Can you take these handcuffs off? Ah, here we are. And here he is. And there you are, Mr. Dundee. Sit down, Corwin. And there that is. All the goods you've stolen. How nice to see you again. And how nice it will be to see you, my wistful St. Nicholas, going up the river. Do you suppose he could get as much as ten years, Officer Flaherty? Ten years? Ah, don't look good, Corwin. Of course, they might lop off a few months if he was to tell us where the rest of the loot is stashed. The rest of it? You think there's a storehouse of some kind where I go to replenish it? Well, ain't there? Why, he may have been looting and pilfering for years. Now I understand. That's why he takes this job every December. He's been giving away stuff for two and a half hours. Must have a whole warehouse full of it. I'm glad you brought that up, officer. There's a little discrepancy here. Little discrepancy? Is that what you call it? Between this bag and what came out of it, did anybody see me go somewhere to fill it up? Because if they did, they're, they're lying or deluded. All right, you speak when you're spoken to, Corwin. I'm just trying to clear this up. Listen, you moth-eaten Robin Hood. The wholesale theft of thousands of dollars worth of goods is not a simple discrepancy. I wondered where my inventory went, and now I know. Let's take a look in the bag, shall we? You go right ahead, sir. Be my guest. Though I can tell you right now, Corwin, that this whole affair has come as no surprise to me. I perceived that criminal glint in your eyes the very moment I saw you. I'm not a student of human nature for nothing. I've personally spotted hundreds of shoplifters in my store over the years. I'll bet you tried, if you're any good at it. Quiet. And I can tell you that you fit the profile to a T. Then why did you hire me in the first place? Huh, an act of Christian charity on my part. I try and I try to do for you people. What people? And this is the thanks I get. Maybe if you tried hard enough, I wouldn't need a bag like this. All right, enough already. Mr. Dundee, you go ahead and you check in the bag. Believe it or not, 
I got other cases to handle here tonight. It will be a pleasure to achieve satisfaction. To catch him red-handed, as it were. Well, suit yourself, Mr. Dundee. Go ahead. Reach right in. Who let that cat in here? It was in the bag under all this... Uh, we'll be adding cruelty to animals to the charges now. Under what? Coffee grounds and empty tin cans? Looks like garbage to me, wouldn't you agree? He must have switched it. Where's the real bag? Uh, Mr. Dundee, you seem to have, um, put your finger on the problem. All your fingers, it looks like. <laughs> Messy, isn't it? Yeah, this isn't funny. No? Give me something to wipe my hands. Well, I guess the bag can't seem to make up its mind whether to give out gifts or garbage. Well, it was giving out gifts when I seen it. Whatever they wanted, Corwin was supplying. And it wasn't trash, neither. It was Christmas presents, toys, all kinds of things, expensive stuff, believe you me. You might as well admit it, Corwin. Oh, I admit it. Well, then, there you are. But I believe the essence of our problem here is that we're dealing with a most unusual bag. One that is both more and less than it seems. So you are some sort of magician con artist. A magician? <laughs> I love those guys. You know, this reminds me of a trick I saw once. Called himself Misto the Magnificent. Used to work down in Coney Island where they had those sideshows. He had a thing called the Never Empty Lotta. You know what a lotta is, officer? What's your point, Corwin? A vase, uh, an urn, sort of. Uh, and he'd, he'd pour out water, glass after glass full, till it was empty. And, and then he'd pick it up and start all over again. Couldn't figure out how he did it. But this bag here, I guess it's like the never-empty lotta. Only thing is, I'm no magician. I wouldn't know how to work it anyway. Whatever's going on, it's out of my hands. Some greater power is at work. I'm... Just the one who happened to be there at the right time and the right place. All right, no more talk. I told you I'm a busy man. For now, Corwin, my advice to you is clean up this mess and get out of my police station before I find a reason to book you. All right. If that's what you want, happy to oblige. Just, just like that? You're letting him go? My hands are tied. There's no evidence. And you, Officer Flaherty, call yourself a policeman? Hey, now. Well, I suppose it's a demanding task to distinguish between a bag full of garbage and an inventory of expensive stolen gifts. Too demanding for a civil servant whose salary is paid by my store city taxes. You can believe me, Mr. Dundee. It's just like Corwin says. We must be dealing with something supernatural here. Oh, in other words, all anyone needs to do is ask this man to make a little abracadabra for them, and no sooner said than done. I, I don't know how it works, but I can well, tell... Well, go ahead. Prove it. I told you. I I'm no magician. Well, it seems miracles are the order of the day, aren't they? I don't go getting sacrilegious. You, you want me to drop the charges? Well... Let's put him to a little test. I, I can't just pull a rabbit out of a hat. Oh, it's to be a rabbit now, is it? Instead of a cat? If you'd listen. Let me see. I fancy... Oh, how about a bottle of cherry brandy? Vintage 1903, if your mystical bag is in the mood to deliver. 1903. That's a good year. A very good year. Hmm. Try this. I hope you like the gift wrapping. And as for you, Officer Flatter... Well, what? But I guess you two can share the bottle, can't you? What in heaven's name? Where did you get this? Enjoy it, gentlemen. I'll be going now. And to all, a good night. Well, let me open that package for you. You go right ahead. No telling what's inside. Well... Would you look at that? Is it a real bottle? <laughs> Looks like one. Feels like it, too. It is a magic trick. It, it, it has to be. The old switcheroo. Either that or I'm dreaming, or I've gone completely mad. Now don't that beat all. 1903, just like you said. The card's even made out to you. To Mr. Dundee from Santa. Here you go. You look like you need it, Mr. Dundee. Give me that. I don't believe it. It's cherry brandy. And a very fine one, I might add. Uh, just one more thing. Yeah? Would you mind terribly much passing the bottle before it's empty? The bag isn't that heavy. There he is! There's Santa! Come on, 
he's got presents. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I want a jacket and mittens and a train. Diesel or steam? No, no, electric. And how about you? I'd like... well... Go on, say it. What's your heart's desire? A dolly, please. And what color hair would you like, darling? Blonde, brunette, red, or what have you? Anything's okay. Here you go. Blonde hair, just like you. Oh, thank you, Santa Claus. I love you. And a toy for you. And one for you. <sighs> what's the matter, Santa? Yeah, what's wrong? His bag's getting lighter and lighter. So, what's wrong with that? Well, there are so many folks who need things tonight. I'm just worried about what happens if... If what? What happens if I run out of presents? There it is. Midnight. Could have guessed it. Am I the last one? You are. Last present in this bag. If someone else needs it... Well, go ahead. I got mine already. Well, if you're sure it's all right... I don't see anybody else around, do you? No. Then here you go, ma'am. It's all yours. Thank you so much. I hope it's something you can use, my dear. Oh, it is. A beautiful new blanket to keep out the cold. Thank you so much. Don't mention it. Yep, looks like your bag's empty, all right. That it is. So, what are you gonna do now? Oh, I'll go on home, I guess. Nothing left to do. Good idea. How about you, old fellow? Me? I can find lots of good places to sleep tonight. Only this time I got these great big old socks you give me to keep me warm. <laughs> Hope they fit. Oh, they're gonna fit just fine. Oh, hey, Santa, oh, can I call you that? Well, might as well. One last time. I kind of like it. I was thinking... That can be dangerous, my friend. Well, it just ain't right. What isn't? What do you get out of it? Oh, don't worry about me. I, I, I have had the best Christmas of anybody ever. With nothing for yourself? Not a single thing? Just the best Christmas since... since the beginning of time. Their faces, the look in their eyes. Do you know something? I can't think of anything I want. Not a single thing. Aw, oh, quit joshing me. I'm serious. When I look around, I, I think the only thing I ever wanted was to be able to do something like this. To be the biggest gift giver ever. So folks would feel a little bit better, at least for a while. And in a way, I've had that tonight. A real pleasure. I'm just sorry it has to end. Sure, but you could use something. Well, if I did have a choice, any choice at all of a gift... Go on, you're entitled. I guess I'd wish I could do this every year. Now, that would be some kind of gift, wouldn't it? A lot of work, though. It'd be worth it. That'd sure be something. <laughs> well, you take her easy now. God bless you, and a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Santa. Don't mention it. Whew, I might beat. Now, how'd I get here? That's the alley. Guess I better put the bag back where I found it. What's all this? Looks like somebody's throwing out their Christmas decorations already. That's no decoration. That's your sled. Ah, uh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> a sled and a reindeer right here in the alley, just for me. Somebody sure made the eyes look real. He is real. Yeah, about as real as you are, little fella. Little fella. We've been waiting for you. And I suppose you're going to tell me you're a real elf, too. I sure am. We've been waiting for you to come back. Say, where did you rent your costume? I never saw one look that good. Pointed hat, turned up toes. Costume? I made this myself, by hand. And, and the little bells? Must have been a heck of a party. It better be a costume because I haven't had a drink in... Uh-oh. Oh, no. What's the matter, Santa? No, no, not me. 
You got the wrong guy. No, I haven't. Did you hear what I said? We've been waiting quite a while, Santa Claus. Better get a move on. We've got a whole year of hard work ahead to get ready for next year. Ready? Come over here. Yes, Santa? Pinch me. If you say so. Ow! You didn't have to do it that hard. Are you ready now? I... I don't know. Come on, get in. There's plenty of room. Where? In the sleigh. You sure you don't have the wrong person? Oh, Santa, stop joking and get in. We're late. I don't have to. I, I, I could turn around right now and go home. If you do that, a lot of people would be very sad. Next year. You wouldn't lie to me. Elves can't lie. Okay. Okay. Move over, Shorty. Now, how do you work these reins? Good night, Officer Flaherty. Night, Mr. Dundee. So long, fellas. My regards to everybody in the precinct. And a Merry Christmas to you both. Night, boys. See you all in the morning. Watch yourself out there. It's mighty cold. <laughs> now, don't you worry about me. Tonight, I'm feeling no pain. Going home now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Flaherty? That I am. Going home, Mr. Dundee. Assuming I can find me way. I'm sure you will. Left foot, right, left, right. Try to walk a straight line to the lamppost. Oh, uh, where? Over there. Hey, hang on, I'll hold you up. Uh, and you, Mr. Dundee, home is it? Home, Mr. Flaherty. Well, I'll walk you a ways, if you don't mind. We could stop off for a nightcap. Well, now there's a pub right around the corner. That is a thought. Uh, just a nip, you know, uh, to warm the soul. For thy stomach and thy infirmities. Isn't that what the good book says? I do believe it does, Mr. Dundee. You know something else, officer. Uh, now, why don't you tell me? That's what friends are for. Uh, that they are. <laughs> so go ahead now. Tell me all about it. Well, sir, this is the most remarkable Christmas I've ever had. You don't say. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! <laughs> F -f -f Flaherty, did you see it? Did you? I thought I saw something. What did you see? No, 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 you first. Mr. Dundee, I don't think I'd better tell you. You'd report me for drinking on duty. But you're not on duty. True. Go ahead, what did you see? Mr. Dundee, it was that Corwin fella playing his life in a sleigh with reindeer sitting alongside a... A, a, a what? One of his little helpers. So help me. All done up in proper costume. They were riding towards the sky. Big as you please. One question for you. Yeah? Did we drink a whole bottle of cherry brandy back in the station house? Vintage 1903. But only one bottle. The finest I ever tasted. So I guess that's about the size of it then, isn't it, Mr. Dundee? Flaherty, you better come on home with me. We'll make some hot coffee. Yeah, and pour a little whiskey in it. We call that Irish coffee, you know. Oh, I do know. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk some more about all this. Sort it out. What is there to say? If a man can't believe his own eyes, what can he believe? Then, you will thank God for miracles, Mr. Flaherty. That we will, Mr. Dundee. That we will. A word to the wise, to all the children of our times, whether their concern be pediatrics or geriatrics, whether they crawl on hands and knees and wear diapers, or walk with cane and comb their beards. There is a wondrous magic to Christmas, and there is a special power reserved for little people. In short, there is nothing mightier than the truly meek. And so, a Merry Christmas to each and all, and to all a good night from those of us here in the Twilight Zone. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel.
Night of the Meek, starring Chris McDonald with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling and adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison. Heard in the cast were Taylor Miller, Turk Muller, Doug James, Peter DeFaria, Peggy Roter, Adam Tangway, Richard Hensel, Meg Falcon, Lucas Ellman, Zach Gray, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, Rick Peoples, and Lauren Patton. So, in the next episode, a depressed trumpet player by the name of Joey Crown, who is down on his luck, finds himself in a bizarre world where he seems to be invisible to everyone except for one helpful other musician. Good listening, Vintage Classic Zoners. Hi, this is Joey Crown. Who? Joey Crown. I called before. Can you speak up, sir? I called a couple of times and I left a message. Do you have a reservation? Me? No, not exactly. I mean, this is Joey Crown. The trumpet player. I'm having trouble hearing you. Did Baron get my message? I don't know about any message. The band's on now. I can hear that. Boy, can I... And the second set is at 10.30. Do you want a table? I don't need a table. Tell Baron I'll fall by if I can. (laughs) You know how it is. I got a gig all the way across town. How do you spell your name? Just tell Baron that Joey Crown's coming. Okay, sweets? Man, oh man. (laughs) Just wait till he sees me. Hey, Bobby, what's happening? Name? You know me. It's... Wait a minute. Who are you? You have a reservation. Hey, pal. We've been waiting for a half hour. He got in line. How you doing? Sorry, folks, but I'm supposed to be inside. Hold on. I gotta check the list. I'm not on the list. See, I got a gig here tonight. Oh, you're in the band. Well, not in it, exactly. Baron knows I'm coming. He'll let me sit in, I'm sure of it. First show's sold out. If you want to put your name down for 1030... Just tell Baron, all right? He'll count me. Hey, fella. Hang on. There's been a little misunderstanding. No, I mean, I know you. You do? Didn't you used to be Joey Crown? Used to be? What do you mean, used to be? Crown. Crown. Ah, sorry, man. You're not on the comp list. If you want to wait in line... Hey, hey, hold on. See this? It's a trumpet case. I'm not some piker. I played with Baron lots of times. I used to work the page tree and the gate. What's the matter? Don't you believe me? Ask Artie. He owns the joint. Meet Joey Crown, a man who made music, or used to. A little man with a funny rubber face whose life is a quest for decent billing and other impossible things, like flowers in concrete or trying to pluck a note of music out of the air and put it under glass to treasure. Because it is a treasure to him, and if the truth be told, to a lot of people who heard him play when he was hot, when he could take a tune and turn it inside out with a dented, beat-up golden horn. His solos were the stuff legends are made of, until he took a turn for the worse. For a while now, the only notes to come out of his trumpet have been, well, slightly sour and off-key. Joey Crown, who in just a moment will decide to leave the earth for a steady gig in another kind of club, one located in an out-of-the-way place we call the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, A Passage for Trumpet, starring Mike Starr, with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Take five out here if you want, Mr. Barron. Oh, sure thing, Artie. You guys just played a smoking set. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thanks. I came in early on the bridge. You had all the changes. Nice set, boys. Was it okay? I couldn't tell. That sounded good to me. Just the way I like it. Sure was. Man, you guys know how to swing. Who's that? Uh, too dark to see. I think it's... Hey, Joey. 
What do you say, Baron? What are you doing here? Well, what do you think? I brought my axe. What for? I thought you might need somebody with a horn. I already got my sideman, Joey. Sure, sure you do. But I was thinking I could sit in. You know, for the second set. Uh, not tonight. Just a few choruses. Maybe some other time. Why not? You know how good I can play. Easy, Joey. But why? The last time you played trumpet for me, you lost it up. I did? I had to share you with a bottle. Bottle? Me? Oh, you got the wrong guy. You and that horn don't belong together on the same stage anymore. You mean six, seven months ago? Oh, that was just a bad night. I forgot what it tastes like. I'm on the wagon now. Way up. That right, Joey. Who's your brass section? Right here. Meet my new trumpet player. Yeah? That was him? Yeah, that was me. Don't get me wrong. He sounded great in there. Really cooking. But what do you think I am? Some kind of a lush? Listen, Baron, I know what that stuff does to me. I ain't an old man yet. Me and my horn got a lot of years left. I could be a number one boy again. Club dates, sessions, the whole bit. Hey, take it easy. What do you think I'm gonna do? Chuck it all the way in some bum habit? Be serious. Listen, man, this is one mellow horn, and I got sweet music in me. A whole lot of it. You know yourself, when I open the case and pick that thing up and blow, I can make them cry. That you can, Joey. I remember. So what's the big deal? I can come in behind your man on the bridge. Then I sit out while he takes his solo. Then we trade choruses and I... You drop something, Joey? That's not mine, honest. I never saw it before. I... It was in your coat pocket. I saw it the minute you walked up. Come on, boys. Let's go back in. No, you come on, Baron. What are you trying to do to me? All I need's a chance. Okay, it's showtime. Go on. I'll be right there. All I need's a chance. One shot. That's what you need, all right. <laughs> a shot. Better make it a double. That's not what I mean. Well, don't worry about the mess, Joey. Somebody will clean it up for you. They always do. I'm sorry, Baron, but if you knew what it's been like to... One thing I don't know. When a guy has so many friends, why would he hang out with his worst enemy? All right, all right, I get it. I shouldn't have come here. We've been doing all right at the club. Sold out most every night. So let me lay some green on you. Your share. For old times' sake. Keep your money. Hey, for old times. Come on, man, when you had the magic... Remember? Harry James, Max Kaminsky, and Berrigan, and Butterfield, and Diz, and Miles. Man, you had a little bit of all of them. And you traded it for some bad booze. Well, you got took. That was no kind of a deal. You got the crummy end of the stick. I don't want your charity, okay? I got one question for you, Joey. Why'd you throw it all away? Maybe because... Because I'm sad all the time. Because I'm nothing anymore, and I know it. Because from now on, I'll live and die in a crummy one-roomer with dirty walls and crap pipes. I'll never have a girl because I'm an ugly little gnome. I'll never be anybody again because half of me is that horn. I can't even talk to people without it. That's my language. Go easy on yourself, Joey. Oh, but when I'm high, Baron... When I'm high, I can't see how dirty the walls are. I don't see the cracked pipes. I don't even know the clock's running. That the hours are going by. Then I'm Gabriel. I'm Gabriel with the golden horn. And when I put it to my mouth and blow, it comes out jewels. It comes out a symphony. It comes out the smell of flowers and summer nights. It comes out... It comes out beauty. When I'm drunk, Baron. Only when I'm drunk. Take care of yourself, son. Oh, man. I got so much misery. I got so much sadness. I'm nothing. I'm just plain ordinary nothing. I'm so tired of hanging out.
Smell that good old polluted city air. All right, Joey. It's showtime. in the blues, all right. Don't stop. Who are you? Please, play some more. What are you doing up here on the roof? Well, I suppose I could ask the same of you. I wanted to be by myself. Don't you know it's the middle of the night? Yes. Couldn't sleep either, huh? Would you please play a bit more? I can't play. Why do you say that? I thought it sounded beautiful. What do you know? Well, I don't know much about music, I admit. But it had so much feeling. You have a gift. Once upon a time, maybe, but that was a long time ago. Use it or lose it, right? What? You wanna... <laughs> of course you don't. You look like a nice girl. A real nice girl. You haven't answered my question. What is this, a quiz show? Why can't you play? I just can't. Got it? Mm, is it because that bottle's empty? Not yet it's not. You want to know why? Okay. The reason I can't blow that horn anymore is that... Too much of me is in there. Too much of Joey Crown. Is that your name? It was. Oh, it's a nice name. I like the sound of it. You don't know who I am either, do you? You don't know anything. I'm sorry, I just like the way you play. Well, I have played my last note. Yes, ma'am, my very last note. No more. Well, I think that's what's sad. Then I'm sorry. I'll just have to disappoint you. It's been very nice making your acquaintance. You look like a nice person. A very sweet person. Thank you. You're new here. You come out from Iowa or Cincinnati or someplace like that, and you don't know anybody. I could have shown you around. I could have taken you places where they play some nice jazz, you know? All we'd have to do is ride the subway down to the village, walk around. There's places everywhere. On every street, almost. There was a time, there was a time when you could have heard me play. Now, it's too late, so go home, lady. Go back to where you came from. Because she'll never make it here. This town's too tough for people like you. Go on. It's, it's been nice talking to you. Yeah, it's been a ball. Now do me a favor. Get lost. Way to go, Joey. Every time something nice happens, you go and wreck it. What's the matter with you? You're stupid, Joey. Stupid. You know something? This town's too tough for me, too. So wake up. Time for something else, Joey. Anything. Time to get out. Or die. Oh. Wait a minute. What the heck is that? Nobody ever played that good. Not even Joey Crown. Nobody on this earth! Hi, Ned. How's it going? Back again. I need some cash. You and me both. Look, Joey, I can't keep loaning you money on that beat-up old trumpet. What do you mean? You know this horn. It's got a tone you wouldn't believe. That's the trouble. They all sound great when somebody's playing them. Look around. I got enough instruments to equip Sousa's band. I need another bugle like I need my taxes raised. But this horn's been around. It's got character. I played it at Newport. I played it on so many sessions you couldn't count them all. 
Go over there and flip through those records in the box. I bet you got 20, 30 albums I'm on. You name it, this is the horn. The same one. Ah, trumpet is a trumpet, Joey. It's the man who plays it. That's what counts. Otherwise, it's just a pile of brass. 20 bucks. What? You gave me 40 last time. Like you said, it's been around. The case has got dents in it. Listen, Ned, I'm serious. So am I. What I need is enough to get a bus ticket out of the Port Authority. Taking a little vacation, huh? Atlantic City? At this time, I'm leaving for good. 20 bucks won't get me out of Jersey. Then you're not coming back. Not in your life. This is the new Joey Crown. I'm turning over a new leaf. If you're selling... 25. That's my best offer. Take it or leave it. Okay, okay. 25. All right. Sign here. Just think, Ned. After today, you won't have Joey Crown to kick around anymore. This is the last time you'll see my ugly mug in here. You can count on that. Now hurry up before I change my mind. You want to kiss it goodbye? I already did that. Changing jobs, huh? Yeah. I'm going to start a new career. Digging ditches. So you uh, don't need it anymore. That's right. Like I don't need lungs. See you in the funny papers. Then if you're sure... I'm sure. I'll go ahead and put it in the window. Wait a minute. You put a sign on it. 75 bucks. Nothing personal, Joey. Business is business. A man's got to make a profit these days. Sure, but you only gave me a third of that. Uh, guys like you just don't get it. I mean, what's money to somebody who plays jazz all night? Sleep until noon. What kind of responsibilities you got? Nothing, right? Not a thing. Yeah, nothing. A big fat zero. Hey, mister, watch where you're going. Get out of my way. Hey, don't cross the street like that. Mind your business. Hey, buddy, get out of the way. Leave me alone. Watch out! You think I care? You're gonna get killed! Oh my gosh! He just walked right out in traffic. Like he could care less. Somebody call an ambulance. What? What? Stand back, folks. The paramedics are on their way. Oh, I'm sorry about that offside. I, I don't know what happened, but I can assure you I'm not what you'd call drunk. He's not breathing. Give the policeman room. No rush on that ambulance. He's gone. What are you talking about? I'm not going anywhere. I'm right here. There was this big truck that went by, and man, let me tell you, it gave me a kiss. I don't see it now, but I'm not drunk. You can ask Officer Flaherty. This is his beat, and he'll vouch for me. I'm not the kind of guy who goes around walking on red lights. Okay, folks. Party's over. What is going on? I'm okay, I tell you. Something like that, it shakes a guy up. I need a smoke. Hey, man, you got a match? What's the matter? You can't hear me? I'm not a bum. I just want a light, that's all. Excuse me, buddy. You wouldn't happen to have a light, would you? Hey, fella, do you have a... Some town, all right. Real friendly. I gotta sit down someplace. Step right in, folks. First show starts in ten minutes. Hey, Mac. What's playing at the Bijou today? Anything good? Tickets, please. I asked you a question. What's the movie? Everybody inside. Snack bar straight ahead. Seat to the left and right. Okay. I'm buying a ticket, see? I'm no freeloader. You want to sell me a ticket, miss? I got money. Hey, where's the girl that always works here? I gotta tell Gracie what happened to me. I just tangled with a Mack truck, and the next thing I knew... Yeah, two tickets, please. Yes, sir. Here you are. What, am I invisible? You don't want to sell me a ticket? Why not? My money's as good as the next guy's. If you don't want to sell me one, then I'll just go see the manager. What do you think of that? Where's Vincent? He's an old friend of mine. Vince? Where are you? Anybody? That's what's wrong with this town. Nobody's got manners anymore. You think I was someplace that nobody ever heard of, like I'm some kind of untouchable. I mean, at least when you talk to people, they could say a couple of words when you ask them for a match or a ticket or something. What's the name of this flick, anyway? Really scary stories. Ha. Looks like a winner. What is this, a horror movie? No thanks, I gotta get out of here. Excuse me, if you could move your feet a little. Sorry, I didn't mean to step... Right through your leg! Hey, what's going on? Where is everybody? You, behind the counter, can't you hear me? Are you deaf? 
Those people in there, they couldn't see me, uh, feel me. I stepped right on one guy's toe. Pinch me, I'm real, ain't I? Wait a minute, is somebody pulling a gag? Vince trying to shake me up? Well, now look, miss, is somebody trying to... Look at me! Right behind you in the mirror. It's my reflection. I can't even see myself. So, I'm dead. Can you beat that? I'm DOA. Just plain old deceased. Two margaritas, Nick. Coming right up. And another round for table number two. You got it. Could you pour one for me while you're at it? Eh, guess not. How does that go? Water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. (laughs) You get it, don't you? I'm a ghost, see? That truck must have done it after all. Understand? I'm haunting you. Ain't that something? At last, for the first time in his short, miserable life at Joey Crown, he was finally successful at something. Hey, Nick. Hey, how you doing, Mr. D? Yeah, how about a Manhattan transfer? No ice. You got it. Nick, huh? Charlie must be off. Of course, if he was here, he couldn't hear me either. None of you can hear me. And nobody can see me. I used to come in here a lot. I don't recognize any of you people. And you wouldn't have noticed me. I mean, I'm not the kind of guy anybody would notice. I guess I'm kind of like a little blob or something. But Charlie, Charlie used to give me a little drink now and then on the house. He was a real nice guy. You know what he did one time? You know what he did? He went out and got an old Buddy Rich record from way back when I was playing with him. And on the record, there's this long solo with me on the horn. And Charlie goes and orders it like a big surprise for me and puts it on the jukebox. (laughs) Oh, would you believe it? Nice thing for old Charlie to do. When I was still alive. Thanks, Nick. My pleasure, dollface. Funny thing, though. I mean, if this is it, what happens next? Just go walking from place to place till it gets dark? You know, this could wear a guy down. I mean, nobody to talk to, nobody to listen to. Not even a horn to play? Not anymore. Oh, excuse me. Am I in your way? Not that you care, huh? You can walk right through me, because I'm just a ghost. Plain old nothing little man, and a plain old nothing little ghost. Hey, it's that trumpet player I heard. The same one. You're good. Real good. Thanks. I mean it. The tone's so clean and pure. You got some chops. Who's Baron? Oh, he took the night off. I see. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Yeah? You said thanks. That's right. Then, I, I can't believe this. You can hear me? Sure I can, Joey. I hear you just fine. You really hear me? I hear you. You see me? Very clearly. Ah, I get it. Are you a ghost too? Not really. I am. I stepped in front of a large vehicle this morning. Is that right? It ain't good for the health, believe me. I'll bet it's not. Say, if you don't mind my asking, who have you played with before? Before what? Before now. What bands? Oh, I've played all over. Yeah, but with who? Dizzy? Miles? Those were great horn men. They sure were. Did you study at Juilliard, Berkeley? I guess you might say I picked it up on the fly, here and there. You sure got a great trumpet. The way it shines. Custom made, huh? You want to try it out, Joey? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to. You mind? Whatever you like. Joey? You call me Joey. Joey Crown. That's the name, isn't it? Yeah. 
but we ain't never been introduced. Not formally, but I know who you are. You play a nice trumpet. I know. I'm an expert on trumpets. You ain't no slouch on it, that's for sure. Go ahead. Not bad, Joey. Not bad at all. <laughs> yeah, ain't that something? I can play again. Now that it doesn't matter anymore. What do you mean by that? Now that I'm dead. How come you know who I am? You say you're not a ghost, you're not dead? Nope. And neither are you, Joey. I'm not? By no means. But what about that truck? What about it? And what about uh, the people in the bar, and the movie theater, the girl in the ticket booth, the people in the street? Oh, them. Well, you see, they are dead. But that doesn't make sense. How? They're the ghosts, Joey. They just don't know it. Huh? You're losing me. Sometimes, to make it easier, we have to work it that way. We let them go on in a life that they're familiar with, and they never know for a long while. But that's why they can't hear you. You're the one that's alive. But, but like I said, I stepped off that curb. That you did. And right now, Joey, you're in a kind of limbo. You're neither here nor there. You're in the middle. You're on a break between sets, so to speak. Waiting to go on in the real world or the shadow world. Which do you prefer, Joey? Which? Well, just what do you think? I want another chance. Think it over, now. I have thought it over. I, I used to think I was getting dealt from the bottom of the deck, but you know something? I just, I just forgot how much I had already. I forgot about the music I could make on the horn and how nice it sounded. I'd have to agree with you there. And going to Charlie's and talking to people, real people, and maybe uh, maybe going to the movies now and then. Cutting a record once in a while, walking in the park, hitting the clubs late at night, even when it was rainy or snowing and I had to bundle up like an Eskimo. I miss that. I really do. I never won a beauty contest, but I had friends. I had good friends. What do you think happened to all that? Somewhere along the line, I... I forgot the good things. That's what happened. I just forgot. You've got a choice, you know. A choice? One way or the other. It's not too late. Well, in that case, if I've got a choice, then I want to go back, understand? I want to go back. All right. You go back. Just like that? But, Joey, no more stepping off curbs. That was some stunt back there. From now on, you take what you get and you live with it. Sometimes it'll be sweet frosting and nice gravy, and sometimes it'll be sour and go down hard. But you live with it, Joey. I think I got it. Guess I better take my trumpet back. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. That's a nice talent you've got. You really think so? To make music, to move people, to make them laugh and make them cry, to make them tap their feet and want to dance. That's an exceptional talent, Joey. Don't waste it. See you around. Hey. Hey, hey. Hey, mister. What is it, Joey? I didn't get your name. How's that? I didn't get your name. My name? Call me Gabe. Gabe? Gabe. Short for Gabriel. Goodbye, Joey. Gabriel? Hey, wait. Wait, I gotta ask you something. Hey, mister, watch where you're going. Get out of my way. Hey, don't cross the street like that. Hey, buddy, get out of the way. Watch out! You're gonna get killed! Oh, my God! He just walked right out in traffic. Like he could care less. Somebody call an ambulance. Wait, he's breathing. Uh, I'm all right, all right. Just, just let me get up. Are you okay, pal? I think so. Let me help you up there. Oh, you know you shouldn't ought to do that. Stepping off the curb like that. It's lucky I just grazed you. Don't worry about it. No harm done. He's all right. Oh, thank God. He could have been killed. Well, uh, look. I am 14 years without an accident. That right. I'd be obliged if, well, you know, no insurance companies, no doctors, nothing like that. So, um, how much do you want? For what? To keep this just between us. Name your price. My price? 
Oh, let's see now. Uh, you got, let me see, 75 bucks? That all? Sure, sure, I got that much. I got more if you want. 75 will do. Okay, 50, 60, 75. Here you go, pal. Good luck to you. I gotta go now. Well, what do you know about that? Hello, can I... Oh, it's you. Hi, Ned. Change your mind already? Yeah, I changed my mind. <laughs> they come and they go. But you, Joey, you're the first one to go and then come back. I know, I know. I don't want to hear your argument. No argument. I guess I can let you have it. How much? 75? No, no, no. 25. You'll talk me back down anyway. How long has it been? Five minutes? Not even enough time to accrue interest. Go, go. The sign says 75, and 75 it is. A man has to make a living. Uh, you tempt me, Joey. Right is right. It's only business. What did you do out there? Win the lottery? Something like that. Goodbye, Ned. You won't be seeing me for a while. Hope business picks up. You too, Mr. Jazzman. But tell me something. Anything. What have I done to deserve such good fortune? Oh, nothing much. You've been my friend, is all. For quite a few years, and I'll never forget that. Uh, get out of here. Go on. Beautifully. What? Oh, hi. Hi there. I mean it, you know. Thank you. I gave it up this morning. And I'm taking it back. Me and the bugle, till death do us part. <laughs> I'm glad you changed your mind. So am I, you don't know. Still can't sleep, huh? Uh, I'm not used to this city. All the noise. <laughs> I know. Like a regular symphony, isn't it? I... I guess so. <laughs> I've never been to New York before. I just moved in. Yeah? You'll get used to it. It's an okay building. Better than the other ones I've lived in. Sometimes you have to bang on a radiator to get the heat going. W why do you do that? Why? Because the super hears you and then he fixes it. If he doesn't, just let me know. I'll talk to him for you. Name's Joey, by the way. Joey Crown. <laughs> I know. <laughs> How? You told me before. Oh. <sighs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm sorry for that stuff I said. Don't be. My name's Nan. Pleased to meet you, Nan. I was hoping you'd come back. You are? Yeah, you're the most interesting person I've met in New York. <laughs> yeah, sure. There's a lot of guys around here. Most of them ain't little apes like me. I mean it. The most interesting and the nicest. I love your music. Honest? Honest. Will you play some more, Joey? Sure, I'll play some more. I'll play whatever you like, for as long as you like. What's your favorite song? I, I don't think I have one. Well, I know a couple you might like. Well, that would be nice. You know, you, you might get to like it here. It's not a bad town. I'm sure it isn't. Maybe... Maybe you could show me some of it, Joey. If you have time. Me? Oh, I got time, all right. I got nothing but time from now on. I'll show you everything. The Battery, Central Park, The Village. I'll show you 52nd Street. And we'll hear some good jazz. I mean good. I'll take you to Charlie's. You'll like Charlie's. It's a great place. And you know what? 
You're not gonna believe this, but he's got a record of mine when I was playing with one of the big bands. At least, I think he still has it. If he doesn't, there's a little pawn shop I know that has all kinds of records in back, and we can pick up a copy and bring it home and listen to it. Joey Crown, who makes music in the present tense, who knows a thing or two about tunes and chord changes and how to play his acts, and who just discovered something about life, that it can be rich and rewarding and full of beauty like the music he plays, if he only takes the time to look and listen. Joey Crown, who finally got a cue and a clue in the Twilight Zone. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. A Passage for Trumpet starring Mike Starr with Stacey Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Doug James, Brooke Sanford, Jeff Lupiton, David Darlow, Kurt Nabig, Meg Falcon, Lynn Foley, Carl Amari, Sarah Marks, Chuck Somar, Vince Amari, Karina Karpolovsky, Bo Nortel, and Roger Wolski. Hello again, Vintage Classic Zoners. The next story is a pretty interesting one. A luckless couple by the names of Arthur and Edna Castle stumbles upon fortune when a genie materializes from a bottle in their antique shop. The genie grants them four wishes, but warns them prophetically to be careful what they wish for. Morning, Mr. Castle. Hello, Ned. Any mail today? Got it right here. Where's my registered letter? Registered? Oh, I didn't see one. The one that says I won the publisher's house sweepstakes. Oh, oh well, I'll keep an eye out for it. I entered that one myself. Instead, I get only bills. Yeah, the check's in the mail, Mr. Castle. Say, maybe tomorrow, huh? <laughs> maybe. See ya. Another bill, and another, and another. Edna! What about the gas and electric? What? The gas and electric bill. How many months is that? Two months. That's one you'd better pay. That's the one I can't pay. Mr. Castle? How are you, Mrs. Gumley? I... Uh, just, just, just fine, Mr. Castle. Good. Glad to hear it. Uh, how have you been? Oh, can't complain. Been having a lot of rain, haven't we? What? Oh, yes. Quite a bit of rain for this time of year. Well, it's, um, it's, it's good for the flowers. Uh, how's that? Good for the flowers. The, the rain, that is. Yeah. Very good for flowers. Uh, uh, an heirloom today, Mr. Castle. <sighs> an heirloom, Mrs. Gumley. You don't say. Oh, yes, Mr. Castle. Been in my family for years. Has it now? Years and years. It's supposed to be very valuable. Uh, Hand-blown glass is what it is. Mrs. Gumley, it's just a plain old glass wine bottle. Do you know what it's worth, actually? Nothing. Not even a deposit. If you could find the store where it came from, that's what they'd give you. Nothing. I could let it go for a dollar? Mrs. Gumley, if I could spare a dollar, I'd give it to you. Believe me, I would. But things have been rough here. The pawn shop business isn't what it used to be. I'm so in debt myself that... I see. Wait a moment. Yes. One dollar it is, then. I wish it could be more, Mrs. Gumley. I really do. God bless you, Mr. Castle. I could kiss you. Stop that now. It's nothing. You're a wonderful man. Good luck to you. And to you. 
Better days for all of us. Mr. Castle, it's not an heirloom, you know. I found it in a garbage can. It's just a dirty old cheap glass bottle. Please, please forgive me for lying to you. That's all right, Mrs. Gumley. Who knows? Maybe it'll turn out to be an heirloom. We'll just have to wait and see. Who was that? No one. It sounded like Mrs. Gumley. Then I heard the cash register. What did you buy this time? Edna. Oh, a bottle. Gorgeous. She said it was an heirloom. Is that right? She has to eat, doesn't she? And you don't? That's not the point. Arthur, we're a couple of weeks away from bankruptcy. Don't you think I know that? Then you'd better start rubbing that bottle and pray, Arthur. Pray that a genie appears, because that's about the only hope we have left. Oh, Edna. Edna, please. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, suspended in that brief fragment of time before fate comes out of a bottle. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, gentle and infinitely patient people whose lives have been a hope chest with a rusty lock and a lost set of keys. But in just a moment, that hope chest will be opened, and an improbable phantom will try to bedeck the drabness of these two people's failure-laden lives with the gold and precious stones of fulfillment. Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, standing on the outskirts and about to enter the Twilight Zone. And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone, The Man in the Bottle, starring Ed Begley Jr. with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Here, give me the bottle straight into the trash with it. If you won't do it, I will. Wait, it's worth a couple of cents. A couple of cents, Arthur? A couple of cents? We've got more creditors than we've got cheap watches. You promised me no more handouts. Look, Edna, maybe all that's left for me is to try and find someone who I can feel sorry for. Can you understand that? I need to feel that I'm doing something of value. Maybe a man can be a failure for only so long, and then... And then... And then it catches up with him. Arthur, you're not a failure. Of course I am. Look around, Jedna. In this clutter, you see the legacy of a hundred years. My grandfather owned this shop, and it finally broke his heart. Then my father, and it killed him too. The meanness of it, Edna. The shabbiness of it. The hand-to-mouth of it. This isn't just a hawk shop where you buy the pitiful little residue of other people's failures. It's a shrine to failure. That's what it is. It's a mausoleum, a burial ground for people's hopes. Arthur, please don't talk like that. Edna, what happens to us anyway? What happens to us? Have you ever thought of that? We're not old people, and yet this place is making us old. This should be years ahead of us, years without having to make do, scrimping and counting and picking over checkbooks and budgets and final notices and old bills and... Careful, Arthur, you're knocking things over. I don't care about the bottle. I'm trying to explain... (gasps) Arthur, what's all that smoke? I don't know, but it seems to be coming from inside Mrs. Gumley's bottle. How do you do? Where did you come from? From the bottle, of course. The bottle? It fell to the floor, the cork popped out, and here I am, at your service. I'm supposed to buy that. What do you take me for? Rather than go into any lengthy generic explanation of my existence, suffice it to say that I am here, and I am, in fact, a genie. In a business suit, with a derby hat and a walking stick, And you expect me to believe that, that you're a genie? That's quite correct. There's no such thing, except in fairy tales. On the contrary, I am living proof, in a manner of speaking. Arthur, who is this man? You'll have to do better than that, mister. I don't know what you're trying to pull here. Very well, I'll get right to the point. I can offer you four wishes with a guaranteed performance. Four wishes? Aha! 
you got that wrong. It's supposed to be three. In every book I ever read, it was three wishes. Better get your story straight. That's a myth, I'm afraid. Oh, they may have offered only three in the beginning. But for some time now, four has been the operant number. Some considerable time. It's proven to be the most effective option. Think about it. Too few, and a person may waste the opportunity of a lifetime, so to speak. Too many, and, well, the possibilities can get out of hand. Frivolous, in other words. The opportunities tend to cancel each other out, if you see my point. You've got your answers down, I'll give you that. I think I better sit. Well, Mr. Castle, Mrs. Castle, what do you have in mind? Arthur, I don't understand. What... what, what... What's happening here? Don't worry, Edna. The bottom line is he's a con man. He has to be. But I see him. Don't you? I don't know what I see. Could be some kind of hypnotist or something. Remember that guy in television? He made an elephant disappear. Child's play. Smoke and mirrors. Y you're telling me you're not a magician? Nothing of the sort. I grant four wishes to the owner and then go back inside the bottle for a century and a day. A hundred years. Inside a bottle. Plus one day. A nice touch, don't you agree? Until a summons comes from the next owner. What if there isn't another owner? But, my dear fellow, there must be. Consider the span of a man's life. Three score and ten. Isn't that the tradition? So let's say nobody calls you, or it's the wrong day. Ah, you've hit the nail on the head. I've learned to cultivate patience beyond anything you can possibly imagine. All of which means you're extraordinarily lucky today. As am I, in a manner of speaking. <gasps> Maybe he's from the lottery. We didn't play the lottery this week, Edna. Just as well. The odds are quite unrealistic. What I'm offering you transcends any lottery the world has ever known. They're strictly nickel and dime operations in comparison. I have to think this over. Take your time. Interesting shop you have here. Chinese vases, Tiffany lamps, bric-a-brac of every sort. Mostly imitation, of course. No offense. Nonetheless, I have the distinct feeling I've seen some of these items before. How could you if you haven't been out of the bottle in a hundred years? I meant the originals. The originals? How old are you? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Hmm, nice silver cigarette case. Faux Victorian, isn't it? My uncle's. He passed it down from his great-uncle, who bought it in Liverpool in 1914. <laughs> Is that what he said? How much? Take it! Get back to the subject. What else about the wishes? Oh, yes. Now, I think the business at hand is for you and Mrs. Castle to decide the nature of your four wishes, keeping in mind, of course, that each wish is irrevocable. Once made, it is fulfilled, and once fulfilled, it is a matter of record. It can only be altered by yet another wish. Clear, Mr. Castle? Clear enough. I think we'd better call the police. Why not wish for them? I can bring you Scotland Yard, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or every bobby in the City of London. That won't be necessary. Is it the police you want? No. That's not what we'd wish for. Arthur, are you out of your mind? Go ahead, Mr. Castle. You were saying? Well, if I had a wish... You believe him? Just for the sake of argument. Let's say that I wanted that broken glass in the case over there. Let's say I wanted it to be fixed. The glass display case? Unless that's too hard for you. I broke it cleaning up the other day. One whole side is cracked. Is that all? Oh, it's too expensive to replace and impossible to glue together. Impossible. Would you like to make it official, Mr. Kessel? Arthur, be careful with this man. You don't know what he's after. Well, Mr. Kessel, is that your wish? Yes, that is my wish. I want the glass in the case to be repaired. Very well, then. Am I dreaming? It's a magic trick. It has to be. No, you're not dreaming, Edna. I see it too. It's like new. How... how did you do that? Next. What? Well, Mr. Castle, you have three wishes left. Three wishes. Three. Edna, three wishes. Anything we want. Think, Edna, think. What, what What? do we want? Why, I don't... I don't know. I asked you to think. I'm frightened. A new shop, Edna. An expensive shop on Fifth Avenue. We could have that just for the asking. But Arthur... Or travel. 
take trips. We could see the places we could never afford to visit, like Paris or Rome or, or even the South Seas. We could take a cruise around the world, first class. Surely there's a catch. Oh, money. A hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars. A million. We wouldn't have to grub anymore. We wouldn't have to sit here and waste our lives away. Arthur, it isn't right. There's something... There's something unholy about it. Clothes, Edna. Expensive clothes. Jewels. A beautiful house. No more worries for the rest of our lives. Are you sure? Edna, we don't have to rot away here. We can have anything we want. Anything, Edna. Money. Money. The simplest of all requests, Mr. Castle. Simple? For you, maybe. How much would you like? In what denominations? Edna, how much do we want? I... I don't know. I, I just don't know. A million dollars. That's what we want. A million dollars. In what form? Gold? Silver? Of course, there are market fluctuations in precious metals, so there will naturally be an element of risk. Platinum shows the least movement. Diamonds are relatively stable at the moment. Forget it. Cash only. All negotiable U.S. currency. Very good. Denominations? No fifties or hundreds. Make it five and ten dollar bills. Recent dates and no counterfeits. Where would you like it? Savings account or checking? Perhaps a numbered deposit in a Swiss bank. Right here. Here? Where I can see it. On the floor? Don't you worry about that. Just bring it here. I'll take care of the rest. That is your second wish. You understand English, don't you? That's our wish. Coming right up. Oh, just one thing. Aha! Arthur, I told you. Do you mind terribly if I... If what? If I smoke. Is that all? Of course, if you prefer otherwise. I see the no smoking sign on the wall. No, no. Go right ahead. <sighs> Very well. Now then, Mr. Castle, where were we? Ah, yes, I was about to say... Ask and you shall receive. What's that? Where's it coming from? What is it? It's money. Look at it. A rain of money. Edna, Edna, a million dollars, Edna. <laughs> a million dollars. There you are, Edna. Champagne. I think I've had more than enough. I suppose you're right. How can I work if I have a hangover? Well, you could take the day off. Edna, you're a genius. Why didn't I think of that? We both could. Close up the store and... And what? I wouldn't know what to do, would you? Well, let's see now. It's a beautiful day. We could take a walk together in the park. Oh, Arthur, I'd have to get dressed up and... I... I don't have any comfortable shoes. Or we could go to a restaurant. Any restaurant at all. But we've already had lunch. Then we could take in a film downtown or a play, a musical. Do you know how many years it's been since we did that? And leave all this money out like this? I don't think that would be a good idea. So, we're prisoners here. We can't go anywhere, do anything, for fear that someone might steal it from under our noses. What good is it? Oh, Arthur, we can put it in the bank. That's tomorrow. The bank's closed now. Unless... What are you thinking? Call your brother on the telephone. Tell him to come over here. He needs money for his operation, remember? Oh, I like that idea. And while you're at it, call Avritin, the butcher, and Mrs. Tiola, and the checker at the market. And that nice girl at the bank. And the dry cleaner. And here, look in the book. All our old customers, the ones who can't afford to get their valuables out of hock. Call them all, every one. What will I say? Tell them, tell them we need their help. It's 
It's a miracle, that's what it is. I couldn't believe it when they called. Mm, where did they get it all? They're such wonderful people. And so generous, too. Hey, now, what's going on here? Hello, Officer McLaurin. The line's halfway down the street. <laughs> yes, it certainly is. Are they having a fire sale in there, or what? It's that nice Mr. Castle and his wife. What about them? They're, well, they're redeeming things. What things? All kinds of things, as long as you've got your pawn ticket. Even if you don't, they remember. <laughs> they're redeeming us. That's what they're doing. It's the loveliest gesture I've ever seen. Hi there, Mrs. Gumley. Beautiful day. <laughs> Indeed it is. Your turn, Mrs. Gumley. Go on in. Hold on. Where'd you get that fistful of money? Right inside, officer. From Mr. and Mrs. Castle, bless their souls. What are they doing, running numbers? Nothing like that. Strictly legit. You're telling me they gave it to you? Sure did. Enough to pay off their tab at the butcher shop and then some. Plus the next ten years in advance. And whereabouts did they get this bankroll? Don't ask me. But their ship sure must have come in big time. The horses, was it? Or the lottery? I heard it was the sweepstakes that came in the mail. No, no, it was their cousin. He died and left them a fortune. Well, we'll just have to see about that. They're not breaking any laws. I haven't had my turn yet. You're not going to arrest them, are you? Maybe not. But I'll keep a close eye on the situation. In the meantime, I know someone who might be real interested in all this. Uh, don't you people go blocking the sidewalk now. Here you go, young man. Pay off that mortgage now. I will. And then go have yourself a ball, you and your lovely wife. I, I don't get it. Why are you doing this? Do I need a reason? Every time I come in your gas station, you look under the hood. Oh, that's nothing. Check the air and the tires, all of it, without my asking. I say that's worth something. It's worth a lot these days. Well, thanks, Mr. Castle. <laughs> Bye now. <sighs> Who's next? Mrs. Gumley, how are you? Very well, thank you. Here, you take this now. I want you to have it. Oh. So much. Don't you worry about it, Mrs. Gumley. Anything you need, anything at all, you come to us. There's more where that came from. For you, plenty more. God bless you both. But why are you giving me this money, Mrs. Castle? Why? Because you're so bright and cheery every time I'm in the market. Oh, Mrs. Castle, thank you. You put this in the bank now for when you get married. And for you, Mr. Jax? And you too, Mrs. Tiola. You have a nice day now. <laughs> Don't mention it. Buy a round for everybody. On me. Is that all of them? Oh, for now. Put the clothes sign in the window, would you please? Of course, dear. Whew. Now that's what I call a day's work. <laughs> you did wonderfully well, Arthur. I'm so proud of you. You know, Edna, I don't care how we spend the rest. I feel so good right now, seeing all those happy faces. I know. It would be nice to get away for a while, though. I agree. Some time in the sun, nothing fancy. How much do we have left? Look in the box. It's still practically full. We didn't put a dent in it. Your father would be proud. <laughs> Rest his soul. And your grandfather. Tell me your opinion about something, Edna. If you like, dear. I'm wondering... Do you suppose I still need to carry on the family business? Well... We don't have a son or daughter. I'd say you've more than done enough, Arthur. All these years. Even if we did have kids, I'd rather leave them money to start their own business. Something with a future. What about your cousin's children? Oh, that would be a wonderful present. And what about you? You've been so patient all these years. What would you like? Well, first, of course, you're going to retire. No ifs, ands, or buts. And then, wherever you'd like to live, Arthur, as long as we're together. <laughs> of course we'll be together. You think I'm going to take up with a young floozy? Oh, no, no, I don't think that. You wouldn't. It's not in your nature. But you're tired. You need to rest. <laughs> we both do. Rest and live. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Castle. Do I know you? 
Let me see. Harry Joy's son. I don't believe we've met before. Wait. Stu Wintner's nephew. That's it. Uh, not quite. Are you from the life insurance company? Because if you are, we've got your payment right here. Just let me count it out for you. In cash. Is that all right? That's not necessary. Or we could write you a check just as soon as we make a deposit. And quite a deposit it will be by the looks of all this. I told you, Arthur, we should have put it away. Let me give you my card. Internal Revenue Service. That's correct. There's a matter of an income tax, Mr. Castle. You just send us the bill and we'll pay it. But send the bill in a hurry, would you please? My wife and I will be taking off for Europe very shortly. Oh, could we? <laughs> Consider it done. Where would you like to go first? The Eiffel Tower, an African safari, waltzing in Vienna, perhaps? <laughs> dancing? We haven't been dancing since... Well, since I don't remember. Dependents? Hmm? Just a few details for the record. Ask away. We have nothing to hide. How many dependents can you claim? The whole neighborhood. They don't count. Wait, wait. What's that figure? The one you just wrote down? Beginning with a sum of $1 million taxed on the basis of a husband and wife using the standard deductions and taking into account unpaid back taxes, approximately $907,000. Oh. That's how much I have left? Good. Fabulous. <laughs> That's how much you owe the government. I beg your pardon? In addition, there's a state income tax involved, which, using thumb rule, would come to a rough figure of uh, $35,000. You mean hundreds, don't you? Then there will be a matter of a 5% penalty. For what? If you fail to file a declaration within 30 days of today's date, but I'm sure you won't let that happen, the whole thing will amount to about, uh, roughly, mind you, let's see here, $942,640. Arthur, we've given away a lot of money already. I'll figure out how much. Fill out this form and send it to us with your check. It should be self-explanatory. If you want to use the installment plan, we'll send you a statement after your records have been analyzed. Mr. Castle? Yeah. Yeah. Send us the bill. We'll be seeing you. Good evening to you, Mrs. Castle. I wonder if we can appeal it. Help me, Edna. You take this pile. 76, 77, 78... Oh, Arthur, where's the genie when we need him? Well, how much is there? 910535 $910,540. We gave away almost $60,000. And this goes to taxes, leaving us with this. One $5 bill. That's our entire profit, Edna. Five whole dollars. That was quite a wish, Arthur. Quite a wish. And we haven't even paid the bills yet. If you'll recall, it was my suggestion that you reflect very carefully, Mr. Castle. Very, very carefully. <laughs> now he shows up. Had you made a wish that took into account the taxes involved... Look, you... Plenty of sweet talk and promises and the whole thing. And all the time, you're nothing but a con artist, after all. This time, I want the million dollars, but I want it after... Arthur, no more money. You've got to wish for something else. Oh, something else, then. A new store. A chain of stores. They could burn down one hour after we get them. Success? Be careful, Mr. Castle. Success is a pretty broad term. He's right. You can't wish for success. <gasps> I've got it. How about ten more wishes? Or twenty, or... Very clever, Mrs. Castle, wishing for more wishes. But I'm afraid that isn't permitted. Frankly, I'd be afraid to have you try it for fear of the consequences. What consequences? Why do you have to keep losing your temper? Why can't you think about this thing carefully and, and then come up with well, a... Well, you're no help to me, that's for sure. Here we stand in the middle of this crummy little pawn shop with a whole world out in front of us and anything to wish for that we want. Anything. And you just stay on my back and... Stop it. 
This doesn't sound like you. Not like the man I married. Not at all. Edna, what's happening to us? What's really going on here? Oddly enough, this is the normal pattern that seems to be generally followed. Great excitement, great emotionalism, and strangely enough, hard to believe though it may be, only a modicum of happiness. Well, you've got cheap customers here. Our price is no longer so high. We're people who haven't had much happiness. People who've carried a crummy hawk shop on their backs all their lives. What, Edna? Tell me, what do we wish for? I don't know, Arthur. I just don't know. What about it? What can I wish for now? What can come to me without tricks? Without tricks? I question the semantics here, Mr. Castle. There are no tricks involved. There are simply normal and understandable outgrowths and conditions that go with any windfall. No matter what you wish for, you must be prepared for the consequences. What sort of consequences? Nothing more than cause and effect. Consider, for example, what happens when you throw a stone into a lake. The stone sends out ripples in the water. After a while, these ripples reach the shore. The bigger the stone, the bigger the ripples. And if the stone is large enough, you'll get a wave of water, even a tidal wave that could sweep you off your feet. It all depends on how much you disturb the way things were to begin with. Now do you see what I mean about consequences? That I need something without consequences. I'm not sure that's entirely possible. Something dead sure, at least. Something anchored, something airtight. I must agree, that would be the ticket. Is there such a thing? Sit down now, you'll give yourself a heart attack. Edna, I think I've got it. I think I know what it is. What, Arthur? Power, Edna. Power, prerogatives, to be in charge of something, to be a boss, to be a leader, with respect and the freedom to live as one likes. We could wish for that. Possible. Very possible. President of a corporation? That sort of thing? We could be sued, go bankrupt. Warden of a prison. That's idiotic. Mayor of a city. We could get voted out of office, and then what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I know what. Head of a country. Ruler of a whole country. That's it. Who can't be voted out of office. What about it, Jeannie? I want to be the head of a country who can't be voted out of office. Is that your wish? Do you want to be more specific than that? Hold on, hold on. Let me give it to you this way. I want to be the head of a foreign country who can't be voted out of office. But it must be a major country, well-known. Not some poverty-stricken third-world place. And not in ancient times, either, in modern history. How do you define modern? Within my lifetime. And developed. A fully industrialized country with millions of educated people where I'm very popular and can't be voted out of office. No problem. You sure? Of course I'm sure. I mean, what about the consequences? Consequences, Mr. Castle, I've already told you. You run the risk of consequences no matter what you wish for, like the ripples in a stream. There's no predicting, at least not with absolute certainty, where they lead. All right, then. Go ahead, Arthur. Wish for that. The thing you said. I want to be the head of a foreign country, just as I've described it. Now it's your turn, Jeannie. Take over. As you wish, Mr. Castle. <laughs> <laughs> As you wish. <laughs> You'll forgive me, sir. Yes? I have not slept in three nights now, but the situation is as I described. The first Ukrainian army has cut us off from the south. There's no sign of Wink's reserve army. There is no reserve army. We are simply doomed. There is no hope for us. From now on, it is just a mass suicide. Did you hear what I said? They are already in Berlin? What about it, Führer? Führer? What do you want to do? Why do you call me that name? Here is what you asked for. Very quick and very painless, mein Führer. And we have the gasoline for you and Miss Braun. When you're finished... Head of a country. Can't be voted out of office. It's the end of the war and I'm in a bunker and I'm... Hail Hitler! It's almost the end. I've given them the poison. 
We'll take their bodies out into the courtyard and burn them when it's finished. Have the gasoline ready. I won't take the poison. I wish... I wish I were back where it all started. I wish I were Arthur Castle again. Oh, Arthur, you've broken it. What? Broken what? The bottle Mrs. Gumley brought in. Why, I have, haven't I? Not poison, an, an old wine bottle. Let me sweep it up for you. I can do it. It had no value anyway. No, no value at all. I'm here. My final wish. I'm really here now. Where is he? Where is who? You know who I mean. The... the... And why would he be here? You've had your four wishes, remember? No, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I'm a four-time loser. What do you expect? I just wish he doesn't come back. I wish... There you go, wishing again. Right. Why should I? Why did I? Look at what we have here, Edna. We have a business that's been in my family for three generations. And each other. We have each other. I'm going to stop wishing for a while. You know, Edna, I can't afford a brand new life. Neither can I. I think I'll just give the old one a new paint job. <laughs> you know something, Arthur? I think that's a very good idea. <laughs> what is it? Look, your first wish, the glass case, it's not broken. It's still repaired. <laughs> so we came out ahead after all. Nothing's ever a complete loss, is it? Careful. A Arthur with the broom handle. Well, we were ahead. Now you have more glass to clean up. You know something? I don't mind cleaning up any of it. Not at all. In fact, not at all. A poet named Lowell said it, something to the effect that granting our wish is one of fate's saddest jokes. Lesson to be learned out of a few fragments of broken glass in a trash can. And a word to the wise, to the garbage collectors of the world, to the curio seekers, to the antique buffs, to everyone who would try to coax a miracle from unlikely places. Check the bottle you're taking back for that deposit, because the genie you save might be your own. Case in point, Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Castle, fresh from the briefest of trips into the Twilight Zone. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. The Man in the Bottle, starring Ed Begley Jr., with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Linda Ryder, David Darlow, Guy Burrill, Rosalind Alexander, Richard Hensel, Rich Komenik, Carl Amari, Diane Trice, Irene Olson, and Richard Shavson. Dear Vintage Classics Zoners, get ready for perhaps the most iconic story of them all. Our next segment is titled, A Nice Place to Visit. Henry Francis Valentine is a small-time hood who has been on the wrong side of the law for most of his life. He is also known as Rocky. When bad guy Rocky Valentine dies in a shootout with the police, he wakes up in the next world where his every wish is granted forever and ever. Happy listening. Must be the place. <sighs> okay, Rocky, quit stalling and do it. Yes. Hiya. Sorry, we're closed. Is this the Southside Loan Company? I said we're closed. Well, it don't look like it. Well, I was about to turn the sign around. This will just take a minute. Come back tomorrow. <laughs> well, see, that's just it. I I can't come back tomorrow. Nine to six, Monday through Saturday. Say, 
You got a nice shop here. A little bit of everything, huh? Bring in the merchandise, no radios, typewriters, or fishing poles. I pay top dollar. You do, huh? I have to lock up now. Bet you got a lot of rings, jewelry, watches, stuff like that. All in the safe. Bye now. The safe, huh? What about this vase? It's worth plenty, I bet. I told you, I'm closed for the night. What do you want, anyway? Just this. Oh! oh. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I'll close up for you. Now just point me at the safe and I'm out of here. Probably in the back room. Didn't even lock it yet. What a loser. Now you're talking. Diamonds? Gold? This is worth a fortune. What? What are you doing? Calling the cops? That ain't very nice now, is it? Should have finished you off when I had the chance. Oh! Now I gotta use the back door. Hold it right there. Put your gun down and throw your hands over your head. Not this time, screw. I ain't going back in the joint. Stop! Stop or I'll shoot! Miss me! Eat lead, copper! The alley's a dead end. You ain't going anywhere. We'll see about that. Oh! Uh. Portrait of a man at work. The only work he's ever done. The only work he knows. His name is Henry Francis Valentine. But he calls himself Rocky, because that's the way his life has been. Rocky and perilous and uphill, at a dead run all the way. A thin, pale, stubby fox of a man who has eluded the hunter until tonight. He's tired of running, of wanting, of waiting for the breaks that came to others, but never to him. Now he thinks it's all over, but he's wrong. For Rocky Valentine, a new career is just beginning. In the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, A Nice Place to Visit. Starring Hal Sparks, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Mr. Valentine? What? Mr. Valentine. Uh, who are you? I'm known as Mr. Pip. Can I help you? Get your hands off me. Didn't do it. How do you know my name? It's my job to know everything about you, Mr. Valentine. I hope you don't consider me presumptuous, but I see that you're in need of your cop. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I guess not. White shoes, white suit, white hair, some outfit. Never saw a cop dressed like that. I'm your guide, as it were. <laughs> guide? What? Whatever you may desire. I'm at your service. <laughs> that, I need like a hole in my head. I'm dizzy. What happened? You had... An accident. Lost your step, so to speak. Some accident? Must have fell flat on my face. Don't worry. Soon you'll be as fit as a fiddle. Come along now. I'm sure you'll want to get out of those rumpled clothes. Clean up a bit. I told you keep your hands off the merchandise. If I've said anything to offend you... Answer the question. Question? I want to know how come you know my name. I believe I already told you. You told me nothing. We clue you, fatso. I don't like games. Oh, but that isn't true. You call me a liar? Not at all, sir. But according to my notes, 
You like games very much. Roulette, blackjack, poker, craps. Let me see that. Between the ages of seven and ten, you were quite fond of mumbledy peg. Say, what do you want, anyway? One thing and one thing only, Mr. Valentine. Your comfort. My job is to see to it that you get what you want, whatever it may be. Ha! Your heart's desire, as it were. It's a pretty big assignment, pal. I know, and I must say I'm rather looking forward to it. I'm sure it will entail a good deal of activity. <laughs> now, shall we go? What if I don't want to? What if I got other plans? Then of course you don't have to. It's entirely your decision. From now on, what you ask, you shall receive. Yeah? In exchange for what? How do you mean? What do you get out of it? Oh, nothing at all, Mr. Valentine. I assure you, the service is free. Don't put me on, fat boy. Nothing's free. Nothing. Anything I ever got in this lousy world I had to take. You know why? Because there wasn't nobody going around passing out favors. I'm sure there wasn't. So what's the pitch? You want me to pull a job for you? Is that it? I'm afraid you don't understand. No? We'll see about that. Guess what I got in my pocket? I'm sure I wouldn't know. A 38, that's what. Take my word for it. If you like. Oh, a wise guy, huh? Well, here's a good look. Okay, Santa Claus, hand over your wallet. But I don't have a wallet. Sure, sure. Tell me another one. Honestly. Wait, wait, Mr. Valentine. It isn't really a wallet you want, is it? I do carry petty cash. Take it out. Real slow. Certainly. Here you are. Give me that. Three, four, five, seven hundred bucks! Will that be enough for now? You got more where that came from? Oh dear, yes. <laughs> as much as you want. <laughs> I don't believe this. Now, shall we go? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and Fats. Yes? Well, try nothing funny. I wouldn't think of it. Here we are, the penthouse. Hey, now. You like it? Sure I do. Oh, I'm relieved. Some pad, all right. Lots of mirrors, a bar. Look at that stereo. This is class, man. Real class. Chinese modern, I believe they call it. I was afraid you might find the red velvet walls a bit much. Not on your life. Who's it belong to, some crooked politician? Why, it belongs to you, Mr. Valentine. That is, if you approve. You kidding? This is to die for. Of course, we can make any changes you wish. I wasn't sure about the pool table, but I thought we'd give it a try. Mr. Valentine, are you all right? You mean all this gets thrown into the deal? There's no need to negotiate. It's already in the deal. Look here. What? Didn't you notice what it says outside the door? Read the nameplate. Henry Francis Valentine. You see? This is now your residence. No kidding. Now, if you'll please follow me. And this is the master bedroom. Wow! That's a real king-size bed, huh? Emperor size. I dig the mirrors in the ceiling. Bathroom in there. Now then, I'm sure you'd like a change of clothes, freshen up a bit? Yeah, sure, but but first, first you gotta give me the pitch. I thought I explained. Come on, the gimmick, the angle, the catch. What do I gotta do for all this? Nothing. <laughs> I can't tell you any more than I already have, honestly. All right, all right, I get it. You're just a goon. I am? A messenger boy, servant. You work for somebody, right? Well, yes, in a way. When do I get to see him? See? Mr. Big, your boss. Oh, I really couldn't say. Okay, goon, that's fine by me. I can wait. So what's next? As I was saying, this is your wardrobe. 
I hope you'll find something that suits you. That's pretty funny. Suits. <laughs> Regular comedian. How many you got in here? Oh, dozens. Hundreds, perhaps. I haven't counted them. <laughs> something for every occasion. Any particular color or style? Nah. I don't care. You pick it. Oh, I could hardly presume to do that, sir. However, keeping in mind your taste, let me see. Perhaps a nice pinstripe. If the lapels that you're liking... It'll do. And to go with the dark material, a nice tie. I believe your favorite color is yellow. Mm -hmm. Splendid. It should go well with, let me see, a new pair of um, brown shoes. Like the ones you have on. Well, sir? Make up your mind. What's the matter? You got no taste? My taste doesn't matter. Perhaps these. A smart black and white pair with tassels and pointed toes. Fine. I'll just lay your selections on the bed. Shirts, socks and underclothes in the drawer. Quite a large stock. And in this ebony case, a selection of jewellery and accessories. Jewellery, huh? Let me see. Cufflinks, tie tacks, rings, watches, a little bit of everything. I'll draw your bath. Yeah, you do that. You do that. All ready, Mr. Valentine. I've adjusted the water to medium hot. Hey, between you and me, Fats, who do they want me to bump off, huh? Must be somebody important, you know? A real VIP. No, oh, no, sir. As I've already explained. I know, I know. It's free, because I'm such a good guy. I'll leave the room while you bathe. Sit right there and wait. Yes, sir. I'll be out in a couple of minutes. Take your time. Please. Hey, Fats? Yes, sir? Don't try anything while I'm in here. I got my gun with me. One wrong move in your Swiss cheese, you understand? Perfectly. When I tell you, pass in my new clothes one at a time. Absolutely. And no funny business. Hey, hey, check out the new duds. Very impressive, sir. Everything fits. Of course. I'll say this, your guy sure knows his threads. Now, Mr. Valentine, if you'll follow me to the living room... What's all this? I took the liberty of calling room service. I thought you must be getting hungry, so... What'd you order, the whole menu? A little bit of everything. All your favorites. Steak, potatoes, spaghetti with meatballs, a hero sandwich, French fries, ketchup, chicken noodle soup, peanut butter and jelly, fried chicken strips, donuts, and a banana split. Won't you have a seat? Uh-uh. You first. No, thank you. I'm not asking. I'm telling. I want to see you taste everything. Oh, but I don't eat. So I was right. You're in on it. I haven't eaten in... Why? It must be two or three centuries. That's a good one. Eat! Or is there something wrong with it? No. Then chow down. I can't. I've forgotten how. Pretty slick. You give me a bath, some clothes, then poison me. I'll tell you something. You gotta get up pretty early to put one over on Rocky Valentine. You think you're smart, don't you, Fats? Yeah, you're smart, all right, but you're not smart enough. What are you doing? Just this. If you won't eat the food, you're gonna eat lead, big boy, because this here is the final course. <laughs> You have me at a disadvantage, sir. I didn't expect the bullets to have such impact. I'll clean up the broken dishes. You got a bulletproof vest under that white suit, huh? Pretty slick. Okay, let's see how your head holds up right between the eyes. Mr. Valentine, please. Huh? I, I couldn't have missed, not at this range. That's just it. You didn't miss. Maybe there's something wrong with the bullets. Try that mirror over there. 
Mr. Valentine, perhaps you'd like a drink? Yeah. Yeah, good idea. Where's the scotch? Here. Hold on. Where'd this whiskey come from? It wasn't here a minute ago. I know. I provided it in case. What do you mean you provided it? What are you, a magician? What's going on? This ain't no regular apartment. Where am I? You might want to sit down. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Valentine, do you remember when we met earlier this evening? I told you I was, in a sense, your guide. And you said you needed a guide like a hole in the head? Yeah. Well, as a matter of strict fact, you had a hole in your head only a short time ago. What are you talking about? A bullet hole. The policeman, remember? In the alley. They yelled for me to stop. And I didn't, but they... You mean I'm dead? Why, yes! By Jove, you've got it! Then if I'm dead, all this stuff, the penthouse, the booze, the free clothes... I must be in heaven. You're my, you're my guardian angel, right? Something like that? Yes, Mr. Valentine, something like that. But uh, And I can have anything I want. Anything. Big talk, fatso. Let's see some proof. Proof? Real proof. Right now. I want money, moolah, simoleons, cold hard cash. I gave you what I had in my pocket. Chump change. I'm talking about real money. Make it a million. A million dollars? And 5G bills. As you wish. Okay, where is it? Look in that drawer, under the desk. You put me on a million bucks! But what am I supposed to do with it? I don't, I don't want to spend it all by my lonesome. No? That's no fun, I need a chick. I take it you're using a slang term. A broad, a dame, you know, make sure she's stacked. Curves all over the place, you dig? I'm not sure, I... Let me spell it out for you. Beautiful. Oh, now I understand. So, when does she get here? Hi. Uh, <clears throat> hi. Who are you? I, I mean... My name's Lita. What's yours? Uh, <laughs> you did good, Fats. Real good. Thank you, sir. Do you mind if I dance? Go right ahead. Mm. When I hear music like this, I just, uh, I don't know. I get this feeling and I have to move my body. Me too. May I have this dance? Mm, I thought you'd never ask. Hiya, doll. Hi yourself. Call me Rocky. Now I know I'm in heaven. <clears throat> Will there be anything else? Not right now, Jeeves. Very good, sir. But hang around. I might need you later in case I want more. Of course, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> no more bets, please. No more bets. Hurry up, Rocky. Yeah, what are you going to do? Are you all finished? Not on your life, sweetheart. How about... 33 red. 33 red! Yeah! Hey, the gentleman in the pinstripe suit. Rocky, you're the man. The best. <laughs> How about that? I win again. Hey, Fats! Something I can do for you? No, something I can do for you. Put your money on the table right there. 14 black. Rocky's hot tonight. Am I right, dolls? You sure are. He is. He's a winner. I'm afraid I don't have any money. You don't? Well, what do they pay in? Halos or something? Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Combinations odd and even. Okay, let's go. No more bets. Come on, come on. 14 black! 14 black! Yeah. That makes what? 80, 80 grand! Closer to 100. In an hour! How about that, Bats? Is Rocky hot or is he hot? He is most definitely hot. Hey, Lita! What, Rocky? 
Open your purse. Go cash these in for me, okay, babe? Sure. Hold on. Yeah? A hundred G's, sweetheart. I count real good, get me? Don't worry, Rocky. Be right back. What now, sir? Come on, let's see what's shaking with the cubes. I got this table spooked. Very well. The dice table is this way. No more bets. Oh, there's a slot machine. You want to play, doll? Can I? Sure. Here's a silver dollar. Wait a minute. I'll put it in for you. I got the magic. Jackpot! I told you. Ha <laughs> ha. Would you like me to carry them for you? Yeah, sure. And give the ladies a tip. Very good, sir. Seven out, line away. Oh. Step aside. Let me show you how it's done. That, sir? Here's your money, Rocky. Put it on the line. All of it, sir? Why not? When you're hot, you're sizzling. Money talks. Get your bets down. Hard ways, horn bets, any craps. Breathe on them for me, doll. Sure, Rocky. New shooter coming out. Yo, 11. Oh! Oh! Hey, oh! Here you go, doll. Go get yourself a new dress or something. Something skimpy. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Rocky. How much loot we got? Approximately 200,000. Bet, sir. Let me see. Give me a proposition. How much for another 11? 16 to 1. Put everything on 11. Maybe you should hold some back, Rocky. Don't make me laugh. I'm gonna buy and sell this joint. Same dice. Yes, sir. Guess them for me. If you say so. Mm. Same good shooter coming out. Looking for a point. Yo, Alev! Winner, winner! Frontline winner! I'll have to get you a briefcase for your winning, sir. You do that, Fats. Get two. Get a whole bunch of them. I ain't stopping now, not the way my luck is running. Never had a night like this. Place your bets. Okay, buddy, buddy, let's do it again. Same bit, same bet. Hey, I'm dry as a bone. Anybody get me a drink or what? I'll get it for you, Rocky. Me! 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 Pressing 11, all bets down. Come on now. Like the song says, luck be a lady. Move your car, please. This is a no-parking zone. Uh, whew! Making money really takes it out of you. Uh, where's the loot? I have two briefcases, sir, and the ladies each have one. Good, my arm's sore. They're heavy. I don't mind. Where are we going now? Uh, get your car, sir? Yeah, big convertible, pink and white. And be careful with it, you hear me? Yes, sir. Loading and unloading only. No parking. Huh. Something bothering you, Mr. Valentine? Yeah, him. The policeman? He's only doing his job maintaining order. Lousy screws. Think they're the king of the hill just because they got a badge and a few lousy inches? How do you mean? Every cop I ever see is about six and a half feet tall. Look at him. Lording it over everybody. Oh, dear. That was indiscreet of me. I should have realized. Not your fault. Oh, but it is. I'll fix it for you. Officer? Yeah? Come over here for a moment. Yeah, what do you want, mister? Better? Sure is. Hey, screw! May I help you? Your hat's on, crooked trooper. Now get out of my sight, your mother's calling you. Here's a kick in the pants to get you moving. I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> Look at him running on those little legs. I sure showed him, didn't I? <laughs> Your car, sir. Ah. Oh, okay, kid. Here, you keep the change. Oh, that's a hundred dollar bill. Knock yourself out. Come on, let's blow this joint. I'll drive, if you like, sir. I like. Okay, Fats, put the pedal to the metal. 
Whatever you wish, Mr. Valentine. You broads in the back seat, hang on. Should we fasten our seat belts? Maybe we're better. It wrinkles my dress. Hey, what do you say we open her up and see what this baby will really do? Very well. We're gonna crash. Not on your life. I got all the luck tonight. Punch it, Pip. <laughs> Man, this is really living, huh? In a manner of speaking, Mr. Valentine. In a manner of speaking. Where's my pad? Just at the end of the hall. Fats, do me a favor. Yes? I want to get rid of that heap we've been driving. Is anything wrong? It seems to go fast enough. Yeah, but the ashtrays are full. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a note. Change car. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is it, Mr. Valentine? We forgot the suitcase is full of dough. Oh, yeah. He's right. I set mine down and... No need to worry. After all, you can win it back tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. Hey, girls, go on inside. I want to talk to Fats. Okay. Sure, Rocky. We'll wait up for you. What's on your mind? How about tomorrow we look up some of my old buddies, like Mike Fink and Matt Gorman and Silky Armstrong? Hmm. What's the matter? Didn't they make it? Oh, it isn't that, Mr. Valentine. It's... Well, you see, all of this is your own private domain, as it were. It was made for you alone. What about the broads? I mean, they're extras, like in a movie? In a sense, yes. Everyone here is, except, of course, you and me. Oh. Well, we'll just party it up tonight anyway. You too, of course. I'm not permitted, sir. Why? Angels ain't supposed to have fun? Come on, who's to know? Sorry, sir. Man, you really pulled rough duty with this job, didn't you? It has its compensations. Hey, Fatso, let me ask you a question. Go ahead. Something's been kind of bugging me. Don't get me wrong, I ain't ashamed of my life. You know, anything I did, well, I, I did it because I had it, you understand? Perfectly. Of course, I ain't saying I was the greatest guy in the world. Maybe I made a few wrong moves, but, you know, like a shrink said one time, I'm sort of a victim of my environment, you know? Can't get away from that, right? Whatever you say. I never got a break, you know, never. Old man a drunk, old lady a tramp, no lousy dough in the house. I mean, what do they expect? I should grow up to be president? The thing I want to know is, how come they let me in here? I thought this place was for school teachers and like that. Oh, we have some school teachers here, Mr. Valentine. Well, must have been something real good I did once, something that made up for everything else, huh? Yeah, maybe that's it, but what was it? What'd I ever do that was good? So, uh, how do I find out? We have a hall of records. It isn't far. Perhaps you would like me to take you there. Are they open now? They're always open. Let's go. What, wait, what, what about the dolls? Don't worry, sir. Something tells me they'll fend for themselves till you get back. Right this way. I'll ring for the elevator. Will you look at this? The files are over here, sir. It's the biggest room I've ever been in. You can't even see the ceiling. Strictly speaking, there isn't one. Valentine. Hmm. The V's should be in one of these cabinets. How'd they get all the fog on the floor like some kind of movie? I'm afraid the movies are only a pale imitation. Here, this should be the one. V. 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 Ah, here it is. Henry Francis Valentine. That's me. Born Brooklyn, New York, cried a lot as a baby. I did? At age six, tortured small dog. Well, why not? It bit me. At age seven, began stealing toys from Dime Store. Age eight, organized street gang known as the Angels. <laughs> How about that? Great bunch of kids. That's what we called ourselves, the Angels. Can you believe it? Age nine, broke into bicycle store. Age 10, beat up smaller child, hospitalized with injuries. Hey, what is this anyway? Your permanent record, sir. But it goes on for 
pages and pages, nothing but all the bad things I ever did. It's thick as a book, I don't get it. Get what? You don't think there was a mistake, do you? Not likely. Then don't figure, where's the good stuff? I wouldn't worry, sir. I'm sure the record is quite complete. Well, hey, if it don't bother him, then I guess I ain't gonna let it bother me, you know what I mean? I believe I do. Seen enough? Yeah, plenty. What now, Mr. Valentine? Uh, I don't know. Maybe fool around with the dolls, maybe go and shoot some craps first. I'll bring the car around. Nah, I, I can catch a cab. I got some thinking to do anyway. Very good. If you need me, just pick up any phone. Dial 1-800-PIP. Sure thing. I'll see you, Fats. Place your bets, hard ways, any craps. Put it all on double sixes. All of it? You heard me. Yes, sir. All bets down. Same good shooter, coming out. Twelve, midnight, winter twelve. Say, uh, you want to stay up all night? What? Double sixes, midnight. Let it ride, sir? No, forget it. Your chips. Yeah, sure. Lucky 13. 13 it is, no more bets. 13 red, pay the gentleman with the yellow tie. I can't believe it. Uh, don't you want your chips, sir? Mail them to me. Okay, pick up your hand, that's it. How many cards you want? Um, I'm okay. How about you? I don't need any either. Lita, how many? I think I'll play these. Dealer stands, Pat. What do you got? Huh? Now's the time when you lay them down. Oh, oh. Let me see. I got a full house? Great. What do you got, doll? Um, I'm not sure. I'll tell you. Looks like a straight flush queen high. Oh, is that good? It's great. It's just great. Lita, show me your cards. But everybody will know what I have. It's okay. Yep, you got her beat straight flush king high. I win. Not so fast. Any other game you could bet the farm, but here, read them and weep. I got a royal flush. You win again, Mr. Valentine. Yeah, I know already. That's all I ever do in this nutty place. Win, win, win. Is there anything else you'd like us to do? There must be something. Now get out of here, all yous. Sick of looking at you. Can we come back later? Don't call us, we'll call you. Go on, scram. Now what am I supposed to do? Play tiddlywinks? <sighs> Maybe a game of eight ball. Nah, straight pool. What's the good of that? One shot and I run the whole table. <sighs> Where's the phone? 1-800-PIP. Yes, Mr. Valentine. What can I do for you? You can get yourself over here right away. I got a bone to pick with you. Really? Stop all that creeping around. Why don't you use the front door like regular people? Anything you say, Mr. Valentine. Anything I say, anything I say. Will you knock it off? Is something wrong, sir? No, nothing's wrong. Everything's peachy. Look, I've been here for a month and I can't take it anymore. I don't understand. I'll spell it out. I'm bored, fatso. I'm bored. There's no excitement around here, you dig? No kicks. But the gambling, I thought you enjoyed it. I do, but when you win every time, that ain't gambling, that's charity. I could arrange for you to lose occasionally, would that help? Yeah, maybe. No, no good, I'd know. Perhaps you miss your old vocation. Now you're getting warm. There's a nice bank you could rob. It's on the corner. Or would you prefer a jewelry store? Bank's okay, I guess. Fine. Now, as to the getaway car, we have quite a wide selection. Something inconspicuous, I imagine. Any chance I'll get caught? Certainly, if that's what you'd like. Let me make a note of it. Look, don't bother. Look, Fatso, I don't know how to say this, but it just ain't the same thing. What's the kick in knocking off a bank if everybody's in on it, huh? Even the dames. I never thought I'd get bored with beautiful dames, but... See, I wouldn't expect an angel to understand this. 
Scoring with a chick doesn't mean anything if she's set up in advance. I mean, everything's great, really great. It's just the way I always imagined it. But see, I tell you, Fats, I don't think I fit in here. Oh, nonsense. Of course you do. No, I'm serious. Somebody must have goofed. Look, I'm going to go nuts if I have to stay here another day. I I just don't belong in heaven. I, wa I want to go to... I want to go to the other place. Heaven? <laughs> Whatever gave you the idea, you were in heaven. Mr. Valentine, this, this is, is the other place. <laughs> <laughs> Portrait of Henry Francis Valentine. Small-time crook, grifter, thief, and worse. A scared, angry little man who never got the breaks he thought he deserved. Now he has everything he ever wanted. And he's going to have to live with it for all eternity in a place called the Twilight Zone. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. A Nice Place to Visit, starring Hal Sparks with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Nick Sandys, Doug James, Laura Russell, Frenette Lebo, Amber Lake, Jeff Lupatin, Vince Amari, Kurt Nabig, Rosalind Alexander, and Carl Amari. In this next naval-themed episode, the crew of a Navy destroyer hear a mysterious rhythmic noise coming from a sunken submarine. The signal is from a ship that sank 20 years ago. A crewman on the naval destroyer is haunted by a strange memory buried at the bottom of the sea. Happy listening, Vintage Classics Zoners. All right, men, we've got clear skies and a calm sea. Now let's get this ship back on course. Yes, sir. Mr. Smith, what is your present course and speed? Steaming on course 26 degrees true. Speed 10 knots, sir. Very well. Come right to new course 270 and indicate turns for 15 knots. Aye, aye, sir. Helmsman, come right to new course 270. Aye, sir. Coming right to new course 270. All engines ahead standard. Indicate one, two, six turns for 15 knots. Aye, sir. Engine room. All engines ahead standard one, two, six turns for 15 knots. Engine room answers. All engines ahead standard one, two, six turns for 15 knots, sir. All secure, Captain. Glad to hear it, Ensign. Any damage? No, sir. We took in a lot of water in the storm, though. That was one heck of a swell back there. I'm aware of the storm, Mr. Marmer. I'm also aware of the swell. And what I'm also aware of is that that boat was not properly hoisted. A 13-year-old sea scout would have rigged it in a stored position. Right, sir. You can tell the chief boatswain's mate that I want to see him in my quarters, on the double. Aye, aye, sir. Chief boatswain's mate Bell reporting his order, sir. At ease, chief. That shouldn't be too difficult for you, should it? Sir? That state of being at ease. You're the champion of the fleet when it comes to being at ease, Bell. I don't understand, sir. The devil you don't. This couldn't be clearer to you if it came in diagrams. You are the chief boatswain's mate on board this ship. You run the deck division, you handle the rigging in and out, you supervise the heavy equipment, and there are eight or ten other cardinal duties you are responsible for. Not the least of which, chief boatswain's mate, Bell, is the proper securing of the whale boat. Now, last night we had a bad swell and that boat should have been rigged in. Instead, it was left swung out, and as a result, she's 80% damaged and filled up like a swimming pool. Question, Chief. Where were you? Begging the captain's pardon. Don't beg my pardon. Just tell me, in a brief, explanatory way, why you couldn't handle the initiatives of a Chief Boson's mate, and why the efficiency of this ship has had to suffer as a result. We had nine hours' notice of that storm, Bell. 
This ship should have been 100% prepared. It wasn't, and I want to know why. I did all I could, sir. I... I haven't been feeling up to par. Did you report to sick bay? No, sir. Speak up, Chief. No, sir, I didn't report to sick bay. Hey, look, Chief, I'm not in the business to pistol whip my crew. I want a tight ship, that's true, but I happen to care very much if any one of my sailors has a problem and can't function because of it. You've raided 4-0 all the way down the line for as long as you've served on this ship. And then suddenly, in the past three days, you stowed all your seamanship in a trunk someplace and came up with a bunch of dumb head boners that I would expect from a 17-year-old boot. Bell, what is the problem? I... There is a problem, huh? No problems, sir. I'll watch it in the future. All right, Chief. We'll leave it that way, then. If you want to bend my ear at any time, you know where my cabin is. I'm available. Keep that in mind. Yes, sir. I will, sir. All right, then. That'll do it. Aye, aye, sir. Chief? Hey, Chief, are you all right? What? You okay, Chief? You looked a little woozy there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. What am I listening to? Uh, sir, contact bearing 280, 1100 yards, echo quality sharp. Evaluate as possible submarine. Submarine? But not moving, sir. Dead in the water. Shift the control to listen. Sounds like... Sounds like hammering or something, sir. Bridge sonar. Bridge eye. We have contact bearing 030 degrees true. Range 1100 yards. Appears to be a metal object. What kind of object, sonar? We can't tell, sir. From the sound of it, it's some kind of small ship, perhaps a sub hull. Bridge I. Sonar reports a contact, Captain. Evaluation is a possible submarine. A possible what? Stay on course. I'm going down to the sonar shack. Incident 100 miles off the coast of Guadalcanal. Time, 1963. A United States naval destroyer on what has been a most uneventful cruise, except for a few tense moments with a storm front. Nothing unusual. But in a moment, they're going to send a man down 30 fathoms and check on a noisemaker. Someone or something tapping on cold steel. You may or may not have read the results in a naval report because Captain Beecham and his crew have just set a course that will lead this ship and everyone on it deep into the Twilight Zone. And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone, The 30 Fathom Grave, starring Blair Underwood, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. That's it, huh? That's the sound, sir. How long have you been in contact? About three minutes, sir. That's a funny one. Sounds like, uh... Sounds like tapping on metal, doesn't it? That's what I think, sir. Bridge, change course to 030 and reduce speed to five knots. Try to make contact by underwater telephone. I've already tried, sir. I get no response. Listen, it stopped now. Just like that? Sonar still has the contact, sir. I'll leave it on. Stay on it. I'll be on the bridge. Steady on course, zero, three, zero. All engines ahead, one third. Five zero RPMs for five knots, sir. Maintain course and speed. Anything in sight? Nothing, sir. We're directly over the object. All right, all engines stop. All engines stop. Aye, sir. All engines stop. Engine room answers, sir. All engines stopped. Do you hear it, sir? Wait, wait, hold it. Hold it. I want dead quiet all over the ship. Tell those sailors on deck to can it. Ain't that a kick in the head? What do you suppose it is? Ghost, man. Ghosts. What do you think it is, Chief? I'm not sure. I've never heard nothing like that before. Stow it. Let's keep it quiet down there. They want us to be quiet so they can listen to it. What I want to know is, listen to what? 
Where are you going, Bell? I don't feel so good. He don't look so good either. Make it stop. My head. Easy, Bell. You fall overboard. Oh. Uh, uh. I said quiet out here. What's the problem? We got a man down, sir. What happened? Nothing. Looks like you fainted. Well, get him down to sick bay. Yes, sir. Uh, where am I? In the sick bay. You all right now, Bell? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm okay, Doc. What? You blacked out up there. Uh, I said I'm okay. You better stay horizontal for a little while longer. I'm serious. Captain's orders. I'll be all right. I wouldn't doubt it, but right now you look like a Class A shipwreck. We... we still stopped? Still stopped. They're all curious as to what's making the noise. That noise? What's the trouble? It's just... it's just such an odd feeling. What kind of feeling? I, I can't... I can't describe Lie it. Lie back down now. What's the needle for? Just relax, Chief. Get some sleep. This'll help. Sure. Ah. Sure. That's all I need. A little sleep. Doc? Yeah, Bell? What do you suppose is down there? Don't worry about it. You just go to sleep, whatever it is. The captain will know what to do. I want you to stay grafted to me, Lieutenant. Sir? Take notes on everything that happens from now on. I may turn in a report that'll stick me on a garbage tanker or even a naval hospital. I want 15 witnesses at my hearing who are on my side. Could be a sub. And we could be hearing it. It's only about 30 fathoms. Yeah, sure. It could be a sub, mister. That's probably what it is, but what about this sub? Has it got two arms and a fist? Because somebody's making noise down there. We have a diver on board? Yes, sir. What's his name? McClure in the 1st Division. He's a qualified diver. Tell him to report on the double. We'll send him down. Have him knock on the door. I see. And then what, sir? We'll see who invites him in. McClure reporting, sir. You're the diver? Right, sir. All right, I'm going to give it to you straight, McClure. Now, here's the picture. There's something down there, directly below us. Something, sir? We don't know what it is yet, just that it's a metal object about the size of a sub-hull. That's where you come in. I want you to get your equipment and go down there. Stay in contact from the moment you hit water to the moment you reach it, understood? I understand. Whatever that object is, there may be somebody inside, or at least something that's making the noise. When you get down there, I want you to listen closely and tell me what you hear. We may be getting it distorted. Yes, sir. All right, then. Hop to it. Aye, sir. What we're hearing it doesn't make any sense. It's crazy. It is that, Lieutenant. But if it isn't a sub, sir, what is it? Well, maybe it's a Spanish galleon, Lieutenant, with a treasure chest and a loose lid that's off its hinges. Or maybe it's, maybe it's just our imagination. Well, we'll sure find out. As soon as he suits up, they'll lower him down. And then we'll know. Yeah, I sure hope so, Lieutenant. One way or another. I hope you're right. Bridge, can you hear me? Loud and clear. This is the captain. Keep talking. Yes, sir. What do you see, McClure? It's a sub, sir. No question about that. Have you reached her? I'm standing right alongside, sir. I don't hear anything, though. McClure? Her bow is buried about 15 feet into the bottom. I can't read any identification. It's covered. Or rusted over. On the side of the conning tower, McClure. Can you read a number there? No, sir. There's damage. Number's been obliterated. McClure, you hear that? Yes, sir, I do. It 
It's coming from midship. I'm moving toward there now. Tap on the hull, McClure. See if you can get a response. Was that you, McClure? Yes, sir. No response, sir. I don't hear anything anymore. McClure, there should be three hatches on the bow, on the conning tower, and on the stern. Is the ship upright? She's upright, sir. At about a 30-degree angle. I understand, McClure. Climb up on her deck and check the hatches. See if you can open them. The bow hatch is buried, sir. I can't get through to that. But wait a minute. I'll check on the one over the conning tower. McClure, what's the condition? The conning tower hatch is all bent, sir. I, I, I can't move the wheel. The whole deck appears to have been strafed. Wait a minute. Hatch on the stern the same way, sir. I, I, I can't turn her. Whoever she is, sir, she must have caught it. Say again, McClure. She must have what? Caught it, sir. The whole deck is pockmarked with shell damage. Machine gun damage, too. Is that you, McClure? No, sir. It's coming from inside the hull. Answer it, McClure. Answer it right away. This is crazy. McClure, can you pinpoint the sound? Can you tell precisely where it's coming from? I, I think... I think it's... Wait a minute. Yes, sir. Directly midship, just below the tower. Keep trying. We have to know whether anyone's inside that sub. Now, back to the 30 Fathom Grave on the Twilight Zone. No more contact, sir. Uh, stay on it for as long as you can, McClure. Come up when you're ready. Aye, aye, sir. Get the comm, officer. I want to send a message. Action of 7th Fleet, info to sync pack. Appraise them of the situation. Get on it. Yes, sir. Radio bridge. Radio I. Captain wants a message. Action to comm 7th Fleet, info sync pack fleet. Have located sunken sub. Position latitude 09-30-00 south. Longitude... 160-48-00 east. Request, confirm location of all known sinkings this area. Will remain this area until further advised. Precedence, operational, immediate. Aye, sir. Any ideas, Captain? <laughs> An even dozen, but every one of them nullifies the one ahead of it. If it's one of our subs, we should have gotten a report on it. And even if it's somebody else's, why haven't they gone out the torpedo tubes? That's what I was thinking, sir. Which brings us down to another common denominator. That sub has been hit by shell fire. So, whatever action took place must have happened within a period of hours, or else there wouldn't be anyone still alive. But there's been no action. We'd have seen it. Or heard it. They put them all together and they spell nothing. When McClure comes up, tell him to dry off and report to the sonar shack. That's where I'll be. How you doing, McClure? Fine, sir. I could use some hot coffee. Well, you can drink a gallon of it if you want. Just tell me, what did we find out? I don't know, sir. I, I don't know either, Bosun. Just tell me what you do know. There's somebody inside her. I'd lay odds on that. Three or four times when I pounded on the hull, that's when somebody answered me. Uh-huh. Well, what about the sub itself? Could you judge her length? Well, I guess her to be about 300 feet, sir. Maybe 25 feet midship. Sounds like one of ours. She looks like one of ours. There were ballast tanks and flooding ports on the underside. She's moving, sir. Now, that was the other thing, Captain. She wasn't stuck in tight. Deep, yes, but not tight. She seemed to be swaying. You still cold, McClure? <laughs> I've been warmer, sir. 
and you will be again, but right now you're going to get colder. I want you to check her bow. Maybe she's pulled herself loose and you can finally read that number. Sonar, Bridge. Go ahead, Bridge. Com 7th Fleet reports no sinkings of any kind. Authorizes us to remain on scene and operate at own discretion for salvage and rescue. Roger. Can do, McClure? I'll do my best, sir. Ah, look at it this way. What a dandy story you can tell your grandchildren on some dark, rainy night. <laughs> Are they gonna believe me, sir? <laughs> I'm not sure I will, but if you can give me a number or a name off that hull, we may be able to sleep tonight after all. Yes, sir. I've got a question for you, Mr. Smith. What's that, sir? If they're in there, and alive, and can't use the torpedo tubes, how do we get them out? Bridge. Go ahead, McClure. This is the captain. She's pulled herself out, sir. Here's your number. 714. 714. Make a note of that, Lieutenant Smith. Yes, sir. Well, that means she's one of ours. Come on up and get a broiled steak on me, McClure. Smith, hand me the book with the hull numbers. Here you are, sir. Give me that number again. 714. 714. Ah, here. Here it is. 714. Commission, December 1941. Sunken action, first battle of the Solomons, August 7th, 1942. But, Captain, that was 20 years ago. Then, Lieutenant, tell me something. Who is inside that sub? Coffee, sir? Thanks, Marmer. Quiet night. T too quiet. How long's it been now? About three hours. Is he sending McClure down again? Beats me. All I know is there's a boiler tender second who's making book in the cruise quarters that the thing below us is a sea monster with three heads and we're all living on borrowed time. <laughs> I don't know what scares me more. When they pound or when they shut up. I don't know what scares me more, a 20-year-old sub with somebody alive inside, or what the commander of the Pacific Fleet will say to me when I tell him that. And to compound the problem, I've got a chief bosun's mate with something eating at him. Bell? Bell. What made him black out? That's part of the problem. Could be he's dredging up a couple of memories. What do you mean, memories? This is World War II revisited for him. He got picked up here after a sinking. That's the way I hear it. He was on a ship that got hit, only survivor or something like that. Got picked up from the water. Maybe it is dredging up some memories then. Here we go again. What's the matter? They can't make up their minds down there? There's one more question, an important one. What's that, Captain? Who's they? Hello, sir. Doc? How's it coming down there? Yeah, it's coming. How's your patient? Asleep, sir. I was just going to get some chow. Keep me posted. I'll be in my quarters. Aye, sir. No. No. No! What's the matter? Bell! What happened? Uh, I was looking in the mirror, and I saw... I saw faces. They were staring right at me. They were pointing at me. I know it sounds crazy, but they were there. It was as if I'd been pushed out of the mirror, ordered out. That's why I had to break it, to make them stop. Doc? Yeah, Chief. Do you see me in the pieces of mirror down there on the floor? Listen to me. I see you right here in front of me. I see you just fine. Remember that. Nobody is ordering you anywhere. You're not going anyplace. We're gonna lick this, Bell. I mean it. We're gonna lick this.
Same routine, huh? Same thing, sir. But it's getting a little fainter, I think. And they don't acknowledge our signals at all, but it's definitely fainter. It's some piece of equipment. That's what it is. Something loose that's probably swinging back and forth and hitting a bulkhead. Mm, possible. That's the only explanation. I mean, well, think about it, Captain. A 20-year-old sub in the deep six since the war? Who could be down there? Somebody who dies awfully hard. Whatever it is, whatever it is, it's running out of steam. I wouldn't make book on this, but I've got a hunch that if we don't get inside there, and I mean quick, we're gonna miss the boat. So we go down, and like you said, we knock on the door, but we've done that before. No, we don't knock on the door this time. Now we kick the door open. Begging the captain's pardon. You break in that way, and it's a sure bet the pressure will kill whatever's alive down there. Right, so we do it the one other way we've got. I want you to send a message to Com Sub Pack. Tell them we're going to need a submarine rescue ship out here. Give them position and depth and tell them to report to the scene for rescue attempt. Emergency precedence. The airlock chamber? No, that's all we've got left, and it's precious little. Get on it right away. I'll be on the bridge. Radio? Sonar. Radio I. The Com Sub Pack. Emergency precedence. Request nearest ASR report to position. Latitude 0 er Doc? Yeah. You got a cigarette? Sure, Bell. I'll do it. Your hands are shaking. Thanks. Doc, will you answer me straight? I'll try. Who's outside? What? Who's out in the passageway? Nobody's out there. Why? You think you hear something? I don't know. Why should anybody be out in the passageway? Nobody's posting guard on you. I just... I just felt as if there was somebody out there. Now, there's nobody out there. Nobody at all. Who did you think it was? I don't know. The only thing out there is a long stretch of steel and deck. Nothing else. Come on, you want to take a look? What's happening to me? Doc... What in God's name is happening? Chief, Chief, you gotta get a grip. Or I swear, you're gonna talk yourself into a straight jacket. I mean it. I, I got the feeling again. It, just as if... Just as if somebody was watching me. Uh, uh, pushing at me. Doc? What, Bill? I'm scared to open the door. Then don't. I told you, there is nothing out there. I'm scared to open it, but I have to. Uh, no. Uh, no. What did you see? Men. What men? All wet. Dripping wet and, and not alive. They were looking at me. Listen. I didn't see a thing, Chief, and neither did you. Oh. Did you hear me? All you saw was what your scared brain told you to see. Oh. That's what it was, what you've talked yourself into. Now pull yourself together, sailor. But I tell you, I saw it! Then I'll prove it to you. No! See? Nothing, I told you. What the... Water on the floor. And where did that come from? Piece of seaweed. <laughs> that about does it, McLord. Go down and try to get a response. It'll help that sub rescue outfit if they can get a specific location. How will they get in, sir? Uh, through the forward torpedo compartment or the stern. Then they'll have to blow each of the six other compartments before they can enter. What if I don't get any answers, sir? We haven't heard from them in almost a half an hour. If you don't get any answer, come back up. The rescue team will take it from there. 
No survivors then, sir. Is that what it'll mean? That's what it'll mean. They'll bring up bodies, not survivors. Okay, McClure, hop to it. Aye, sir. I've reached the sub, sir. The next noise you hear, that'll be me. Go ahead, McClure, pound away. Any response? None, sir. No response anywhere. Keep trying. Yes, sir. McClure? Captain, I found something here. Wait a minute. I can't make it out. What about the response? Did you hear anything? No, sir. Nothing. Give it a few more minutes. Yes, sir. No soap? No soap. Nah, it really frost me. Let's get so close to those poor devils and then... Nah, the sub rescue ship is due here at 0300. Keep an eye peeled. I'm going aft to meet McClure. Aye, sir. Bet it feels good to get that helmet off. Oh. Yeah, it sure does. It's so dark down there now. Without the light, I couldn't see a blasted thing. Real spooky. But I found this. Yeah, thanks, McClure. Good job. Go get some chow. I'll need you one more time when the ASR team gets here. You're gonna have to go down as a pathfinder. Give them any help they need. But that won't be for a while. Excuse me, sir. But you better look at those tags. You've got to be kidding me. What's the matter, sir? Ensign, ask Doc if Chief Bell is well enough to report to my quarters, because I need an explanation for this one. Fast. Go ahead, Bell. Read what it says on these dog tags. I don't have to, sir. I know what it says. It says Bell, William J. That's yours. Yes, sir. McClure found it on the deck of that sub down there. When did you lose him, Bell? I lost him a long time ago, sir. Twenty years ago. How? I don't remember, sir. Try, Bell. Try to remember. I was... I was on a ship. What ship, Bell? Uh, a submarine. The one below us, sir. That was my boat. Who's making the noise down there, Bell? What's it all about? Do you know? We were on the surface. It was night. I was a signal man then. I was supposed to put the infrared filter over the signal lights. Otherwise, they would have seen us. They would have seen the light. They would have found us. I don't know what happened. I was scared, clumsy. I dropped the signal light. The filter fell off. They were waiting for us out there. Japanese destroyers. They saw our light. And it was my fault. They let us have it. They straddled us with the first salvo. The captain took the sub down, but it was too late. They unloaded depth charges. And that sub wasn't ever coming up again. What about you? I got flung over the side when the first salvo hit. And all that time, I was in the water. I could... You could what? I could hear the voices of our guys down below me. They were... They were screaming. I know what it is now. This crazy feeling I've had. What? What is it, though? I got out. One guy out of the whole crew. I got picked up later on by one of our destroyers. But I got out. Do you understand, Captain? I sank that sub. I was responsible... But I got out. Bell, I want you to listen to me. Those guys, those guys down in the sub, they know I'm up here. Bell, hear me out. I should be with them. I should be down in that sub. Bell. I should be dead. That noise, that pounding, those are the guys down there who are calling muster on me. 
They're calling muster on me! Will you hear me out? Will you listen to just a little logic now? A little reason? No one man sinks a sub, and one lousy circumstance doesn't decide a battle. And one case of sudden fear doesn't add up to a coward. <sighs> Bell, Bell, you gotta believe me. All you should put in your sea bag is regret, not guilt. Do you understand, Bell? Not guilt. The Colin Muster! Bell! Come back here! The Colin Muster on me! Bell! Bell, get away from the rail. Now, that's an order. They're calling me! Man overboard! Starboard side! The rescue ship says you got inside. Yes, sir. It was a wreck. Nobody had a chance. Nobody? Nobody, sir. The periscope shears had been cut in half. One section was just hanging there, swinging back and forth. Then that was the noise. That was the noise, wasn't it? I guess so, sir, but... But? There were eight men down in that control room. Eight men. Or what was left of them. And one of them... One of them had a hammer in his hand. Let's just say, McClure... Let's just say that this is the part of the story you tell your grandchildren that you make up yourself. Say anything you like, any explanation that comes to mind. Aye, sir. It's funny how long it takes some men to die, or to find any peace at all. Sometimes I think that's the worst thing about a war. Not just what it does to the bodies, but it does to the minds. So, you rest in peace, Mr. Bell. I think it's your due now. At long last, rest in peace. Small naval engagement. The month of July, 1963. Not to be found in any historical annals. Look for this one filed under H for haunting in the Twilight Zone. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. Thirty Fathom Grave starring Blair Underwood with Stacy Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcheson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Richard Hensel, Rich Kamenick, Linda Ryder, Turk Muller, Peter DeVito, Doug James, Rick Peoples, Roger Wolski, and Carl Amari. Our next story is titled, A Most Unusual Camera. Married couple Chester and Paula have broken into and robbed a curio shop, hoping to sell the loot for a handsome sum of money. Unfortunately, all of it turns out to be junk or fakes. All, that is, save for a mysterious camera that takes pictures of the future. Then they set out to make a quick fortune with their new toy. A good listening to you all, Vintage Classic Zoners. Address? Yep. 2719, Ye Old Curiosity Shop. This is it. Oh, officers. I'm so glad you're here. You the one who called, ma'am? That would be my husband. Jensen! The detectives are here! How do you do? Mr. Brown? 
What seems to be the problem? Appalling. Absolutely appalling. They broke in through the storeroom. That was the first thing we saw this morning. The back door off its hinges. My husband almost had a heart attack. All right, take it easy. Was anything missing? A number of items, I should say. The sense of violation. Our entire stock will have to be re inventory For the insurance, you know. Quite a number of items. A large number. Well, then I guess we'll have to take some pictures. Dust for prints. I consider it a personal invasion. The complete and utter disregard for boundaries for one's private space. You folks have a list of what was taken. Oh, we wouldn't know where to begin. So many things. A uh, Queen Anne chest. What was in it? I don't know. We could never get it open. I was going to have a key made. Hard to say what could have been in it. Almost anything. Jewels, family heirlooms. We bought it as is at an estate sale. What else? Uh, a Louis the Fourteenth washstand. Our pride and joy. Two antique children's chairs. Five vases. Six Ming Dynasty. Two hand-carved teakwood cigarette cases with platforms. Approximate value? One hundred dollars. He means two hundred. A tray of rings, three sapphires, three rubies, three emeralds. All genuine? Well, the rubies are actually... All genuine. And there was a 19th century silver service for eight, I mean, twelve. Isn't that right, Jensen? And a dining room chair made in 1778. Let me see. Three paintings in frames. Early Picassos? Huh, that right. What about the stuff that was in the window? Oh, nothing of real consequence. Don't forget the other tray of rings, dear. Remember? The Native American baskets and... and the camera. One camera? A very special camera. One of a kind. Make? Well, it didn't have a name on it. At least we never could make it out. Foreign lettering. Indecipherable. Probably ancient. Never saw one like it before. It was here when we bought the shop. It was imported. Very rare. Very, very rare. At least a hundred years old. Okay, let's see what we got here now. Um, let's see, see okay. Uh, six vases, uh, five ceramics, a Native American basket, jewelry. A tray of rings. All paste. Six vases of the Ming Dynasty. I don't know what dynasty they're from, but it ain't Ming's. They're from a rummage sale and they're worth a couple of shucks apiece. Chester, will you pipe down and let me read the article? Wasn't he? Plain no good larceny is what it is. That's nothing but a list for their insurance company. Why those crooks? Police theorize that the thieves broke in sometime during the night. Mr. and Mrs. Jensen T. Brown, the proprietors of the antique shop, listed the following additional items as among the goods stolen. A Louis XIV candelabra. A phony candlestick holder. For Liberace. Two antique children's chairs. Two thrift shop chairs for midgets. And a set of U.S. Navy surplus tableware. Plus a chest worth maybe $25 tops. Hey, listen to this. The paper says there's three oil paintings by Picasso. Yeah, three posters in dime store frames. The guy who painted them thinks a Picasso is a foreign sports car. Two teakwood hand-carved cigarette cases. All right, knock it off, knock it off. Here's something they forgot to put in the paper. A camera? Big deal. Well, it looks like an antique. When I was a kid, you could have bought this in a five and dime. But now, I get it as part of a heist. Perfect. The whole haul is worth maybe 50 bucks. A fence will give us 10, if we're lucky. I could have shot pool for half an hour and made more. Aw, oh, come on, Chester. You want to take my picture? You think that thing works? Well, let's give it a try. Even if there's film in it, it'd be so old by now that... What I... do you got to lose? Huh, Chester? Please. Please. Scene of the crime, a hotel suite that in this instance serves as a den of thieves. The aftermath of a rather minor event to be noted on a police blotter. An insurance claim perhaps a three-inch box on page 12 of the evening paper. There's just one small item to be added to the list of loot. A camera. A most unimposing addition to the flotsam and jetsam that came with it. Hardly worth mentioning, really, because cameras are cameras. Some expensive, some available at the corner drugstore. But this camera, this one is unusual. Because in just a moment, we'll watch as it injects itself into the destinies of three people. For it happens to be a fact that the pictures it takes can only be developed in the Twilight Zone. And now, back to the Twilight Zone with A Most Unusual Camera. 
starring Mike Starr with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Please, Chester, take my picture. Look at this crummy thing. Foreign writing all over it. No place to open it up. Where do you put the film in? Maybe it's already got film in it. Yeah, sure. From the Ming Dynasty. And you think it's still good? Come on! See? You look through the thing on the top here. Now, this must be the button here. Wait, let me pose nice. Hold it, baby. Say cheese. Ta-da! Perfect. Fits right in. Everything else for nothing, so we get a camera that's for nothing. You and your curio shops. My curio shops? You cased the place. You fingered it. You did all the planning. Oh, listen to Miss Culture over there, the patron of the arts. Never mind hock shop, she says. No, let's go up in life. Let's knock off a curio shop because curio shops have nothing but objects of art worth a fortune. And who touted me? The art lover over there. Two weeks of planning, a whole night on the job, and what do we have, Paula? 400 pounds of junk. Yeah? Room service. Wait a minute. Room service, huh? I didn't order no room service. It's the law. What are we gonna do? Quick, dump all this stuff out the window. Hold on, Chester. I called for room service, okay? You did? To celebrate our newfound wealth. What would you order? A breakfast for two with all the trimmings. How are we gonna pay for it, Paula? This room is costing me a fortune. Coming! Just leave it outside the door. <sighs> oui, monsieur. Very well. I'm not even hungry. How can I eat at a time like this? Uh, maybe a little coffee is all I need. Look, Chester. What's that sticking up out of the camera? It's the picture. I told you it'll work. Hey, let me see that. Well, how do I look? I don't know. Picture came out fine, just fine, but... Isn't that nice? You take good pictures, Chester. Well, there I am, standing by the window. Did you get a good look at this? And so clear. No flash or anything. And look how clear it is. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me think. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with me? Paula, go over to the mirror. What? Go ahead. Now look in the mirror. You're missing a couple of buttons on your shirt? Go on. Now look. Hmm. We look nice together, don't you think? We ought to get some pictures of the two of us. Will you look? So? What's to see? What you wearing? You like my nightgown, Chet? I got it special for you. I like the way it sort of clings to my body. What do you think? Right, right. Now, look at the picture. So, there I am, standing by the window wearing a... A what? A fur coat! Oh. Yeah, a fur coat, which you don't have. Huh. Looks like mink. One of those Ember Autumn Haze models. Real pricey. Could be sable. Nah, I don't think so. It's a mink, all right. Chester, what am I doing wearing a fur coat? I wasn't wearing a fur coat when you took the picture, was I? Of course you weren't. I don't have that kind of money. I don't even own a fur coat. Chester, what is going on? I got it. I got it! Got what? It's a gag! A gag? A gag camera, strictly for laughs. What do you mean? You know, like at Coney Island. Remember? It looks like you're wearing a costume or something. I don't think so. Sure. Inside, they got these ready-made pictures already developed. But the negatives have already got a picture on them, see? The only thing this takes is the face. But we ain't in Coney Island. You know, like a carnival when you pose in front of those crazy cardboard things. You put your head on top of the cutout. Fat lady, sailor, cowboy, driving a car, you name it. And it looks real. That's what this thing is. Not bad. That's kind of clever. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. Well, we might as well clear up the rest of this junk. If you say so, what are we going to do with it? Who cares? Stuff it down the garbage chute for all I care. Except for these phony Ming flower pots. Chester! What'd you do that for? Now we gotta clean it up. No, we don't. Leave it for room service. We're paying enough. There's one thing we didn't open yet. Yeah? That little chest over there in the corner. Did it come with a key? No. You'll have to open it in your own inimitable style. There ain't a lock ever made I can't, Jimmy. Anybody ever tell you you had a lousy disposition? If I have a lousy disposition, it's because I'm married to a nickel and dime heister who can't tell a real diamond from a baseball diamond. Baby doll, this suite is costing an arm and a leg, delivered and paid for by Mrs. Diedrich's son, Chester, from profits collected during a slew of years when you weren't even in the picture. So happens that I need you like I need a three-time conviction. Well, aren't you the clever one? 
Let's see what's inside. Chester, look! I'm looking, but I don't believe it. The most beautiful fur coat I've ever saw. Full length, too. Hmm, so we scored something after all. We sure did. And don't start giving me any of your cheap pizzazz about taking this to a fence. I wouldn't dream of it. Don't argue with me either. This is for little old Paula. Oh, look at these, like, stripes. Different colors, all mushed together. How do they do that? I think it's called Ember Autumn Haze. Like the one in the picture. Right. Exactly like the one in the picture. Come back to bed. In a minute. It's the middle of the night. Sure is, and I can't sleep. What are you doing by the window? Getting some fresh air. Are you still worried about the camera? Shut up. Yeah, you are. You're playing with it, aren't you? What do you care? Leave the light off. It's hot in here. It's not hot. We got air conditioning. What's it to you? You can't just let it go by, can you? You want me to forget about it? Is that it? So it's a crazy camera. So it takes dopey pictures of things that aren't really there. That's not the point. Oh, yeah? What is the point? Sure, it takes dopey pictures. Pictures like like things that haven't happened yet but do happen. That's the point. So what do we do, Chet? One lousy picture and you get insomnia? It's a camera. That's all. Here, I'll show you. Did you just take a picture? There. See any lightning? What did you take a picture of? It doesn't matter. The wall, the door. All right, now drop it, why don't you? Let it alone. Forget about it. How can I forget about it? This thing comes from... from witches, maybe, or... or sorcerers. Look at the writing on it. It could be loaded with black magic or something. Then what are you loaded with? Do you see anything? Where is the man with the horns who comes in with a bargain for your soul? He's supposed to show up any time now, right? But he's not here, is he? Listen to me. It's a screwy camera. Period. Let's see how this one came out. Well? Here. You tell me. It's my brother Woodward, standing by the door. That's who it is. It's that cheap, no-good brother of yours. But that's crazy. He's in jail. Seven years for breaking and entering, and that was only a year ago. So it's impossible. So was the fur coat, right, Paula? Oh, no. No, Chester. It's throwing us a curve. Maybe it's somebody who looks like Woodward. Chester, I'm scared. Feel my heart. I'm palpitating. A little palpitating never hurt nobody, and what's to be scared about? The thing has obviously gone tilt or something. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. Woodward's not here. Woodward can't possibly be here. Woodward won't be here. Woodward is serving time. He's 900 miles away in a cell block, and I don't care what that crazy camera shows us, who's ever in that picture ain't Woodward. What's that? Shh! Somebody's trying to jimmy the door. Go see. Please, Chester. But be careful. Woodward! Hi, Paula. Hello, Chester. I didn't want to wake anybody, so I just, you know, use the old lockpick on the door. Hope you folks don't mind. Mind? Why would I mind? But, but you are in jail, aren't you? I broke out. Me and another guy. Hit in the laundry truck. <laughs> nice, huh? I thought maybe I could stay with you for a few days, if you really don't mind. You don't, do you? I was thinking, maybe if I was around, you two wouldn't fight so much. You still all the time fighting? Hey, what you got in your hand there? A picture. Yeah? Let me see. Well, will you look at that? Yep, there I am, standing right by the door. Wearing just what I'm wearing now, too. Same clothes. Ain't science wonderful? Do you know what you're saying? Sure I do. I think it's great to be able to get a picture of... of... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah? If I was outside the door... Uh-huh. And you was in here... That's right. 
But you already have this picture of me. Right. Standing right here. Inside the door. Yeah, and? Then, like, how come? Sleep well, Woodward? Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for letting me use the couch. Think nothing of it. A growing boy needs his rest. What are we going to do today, Chester? I don't know yet. But I got a feeling it's going to have something to do with that camera. I still don't see how we can use it. Neither do I. As far as I can see, it's strictly for laughs. Well, maybe we could sell it. For some big bucks. You know, there's rich people might want something like that. For what? Well, to... To, uh, I don't know. Find out who's coming to the front door of, of their office. Like a hidden camera. See who's robbing them blind you know, in advance. Try selling them an item like that. They throw you out on your duff. Or some company. They could take it apart and see how it works and make new ones. No way. You'd never get in the door. They'd say you were off your rocker or burn you at the stake, one or the other. What do you think, Woodward? Oh, good call, Paula. Ask the intellectual in the crowd. We could... We could... Sell, like... Tickets. Yeah, that's it. Set up a place, like, uh... A stand somewhere. To take pictures. Like at a carny, right? Or maybe... Maybe we could, you know... Like that. Thank you, Einstein. Now look, I'm gonna lay it on the line. What are we? What do you mean? I asked the question. What are we? What are we, Chet? You mean us? Well, we're... We're people, I guess. Sure, sure. But what kind of people? We're three minor league heisters, grifters, con artists. Am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, that's it. Well, now we finally got something here that maybe might do good for somebody else. Like who? Science. Science could use something like this. For what? For people, you lughead. We got something here for humanity. Who? Human beings. The world. I'm not so sure we shouldn't just give this to humanity and do something good for the first time in our rotten lives. You got a leak in your attic? What's humanity ever done for us? Sure, Paula, sure. That's what I mean. Just what you said. what I say? That's the way we are. Everything for us, not for anybody else. Yeah, we're family. Little, petty, selfish, mean, that's us. Well, I've risen above all that now. I say let's give this to the world. Here, world, a gift from Chester Diedrich. And his wife. And me too, Chet. Don't forget me. Yeah, 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 and Woodward. So here's a gift for humanity. A gesture's all, maybe. Just a gesture. But it shows the heart of Chester Diedrich, and his wife, and his brother-in-law. How do we... <clears throat> Woodward, do me a favor. Breathe through your nose. Huh? Why don't you go watch TV? Isn't there something you want to watch uh, to occupy that brain of yours? Oh, yeah. Sure. How do we know the things medical science could do with this? How do we know how valuable this will be as a scientific discovery? They'll name a building after us. Throw big society balls and charity stuff for us. I can see it now. The Chester Diedrich Foundation for the... The, uh, the... Terminal is something or other. In the Los Tendros opener, Hotfoot has just won it. Jerry's Flash second, Easter Baby third. This was Hotfoot's second win in three days. He paid $24.90, $15.80, and 670 we now move into the second race. Shut that off. I'm making plans. Oh, sure, Chet. Anything you say. Oh, where was I? Hi, society. I can wear my mink coat. Of course, I'll need a couple of new dresses and some matching shoes. Hold on. Well, maybe just one dress to start with. You know, a real evening gown with... I got it. You sure do, Chester. I never would have thought of that. I got it. Got what? I got it. The TV set... Woodward, you're a genius. I am? This camera takes pictures of things that happen, but haven't happened yet. Uh, I guess. Read my lips. It took a picture of Paula with a fur coat. Five minutes later, she had a fur coat. 
It took a picture of that door with nobody standing in front of it. And then you were standing in front of it. Follow me? Uh... No. All right, boys and girls. Now get this. We go to the racetrack, right? I'm starting to get it. We take a picture of the winner's board at the track before the race. I think I get it. The winner's board before the race. That's a great idea. But... I don't get it. Hold on now. We take a picture of the winner's board, and then we... we look at it and... Oh! Chester! Woodward, are we getting through to you yet? We take a picture of the winner's board. It's empty, see? Because the race hasn't been run yet. But that camera, that little old bugger over there, it takes pictures of things that happen five minutes later. So the picture we get will have the winning numbers on the board. We know what horses come in and what they paid. <laughs> now I get it. Come on, everybody, get your coats. Woody, my boy, grab one of mine and put on a tie so you can be in disguise. Oh, Chester, this is so exciting. That was the first race. We can get there in time for the last four. How much dough has everybody got? Uh, I got a 20 and a 10. That's 30. I know it's 30. I got two 10s and three 20s. Come on. Okay, and the old insurance, my $100 bill. That makes 180 and 30. You got anything for the pot, Woodward? Yeah, I got 10. 220 bucks. Is that enough? There's bound to be at least one long shot. Why, we can parlay this into a million if we work on it long enough. We can't lose, Paula. We simply can't lose. Come on, everybody ready? Chester, what about humanity? Humanity? Like you said, baby, what did humanity ever do for us? Let's get going. Give me the camera. Let me see. The camera. You brought it, didn't you? Right here, Chester. I was just teasing. I'll brace it on the rail to keep it steady. Oh, boy, Chet. Oh, boy, you got us an idea here. My ribs aren't bothering your elbow, are they? No, not at all. Then let loose of me. Let me get the picture. Did you get the board? I got it. Are you sure? I'm sure. Now what do we do? Now we wait for the picture to come out. Don't we have to develop it first? Take it to a drugstore or something? Oh, for crying out loud. No, see, it comes out of this little slot on the top. Yeah? Neat. Sometimes it takes a little while. How long? The race is going to stop pretty soon. All things come to him who waits. Oh. Which horse do you like? I don't know which one I like yet. On account of I haven't looked at the picture yet, okay? Uh Uh-huh. I like the number five horse, Tinky Beggar. It suits you. Peanuts, hot dogs, get your red hots here. Over here! Oh, no. Wait five little minutes, and you can buy all the hot dogs you want. Right now, everything we have goes on the horse. Which one? Well... Look at it. Six, three, and eleven. And look what six pays. Forty-seven, sixty to win. Hand me the racing form. Here you go. Number six, number six. Tidy two, that's number six. Okay, kids, we bet our money on Tidy 2. I don't like the looks of that horse. He's walking real slow. Will you get it through that thick skull of yours? We can't lose. Stay right here, and don't let anything happen to that camera. What's your bet, sir? Put it all on number six. The works. Number six it is. Here's your ticket. Thanks. Psst. Hey, Jack, get out of my way. Not number six. That's tidy, too. The last Jackie that horse had was Paul Revere. But I mean the original Paul Revere. Now, if you really want to make some dough, I got some information in my pocket here. The goods on the last two races, and all I need from you is cash. You and me could go partners and really make ourselves a bundle on this. I got a tip for you. Bet anything but number six so you don't lower my odds. See you later, Jack.
minus pink gloves but junior lady deck coming in the stretch tidy two coming up very fast on the outside now in the stretch tinky mega sir midas and tidy two is third tidy two moving up tinky mega and tidy two neck and neck it's tidy two it's tidy two all the way we did it now just you feast your eyes on the numbers six three and eleven just like the picture said are we rich yet we're getting there junior we're getting there let me set up the camera before the next race. Paula, you two go cash in. Here's the ticket. And don't drop it. Okay, Chester. I sure hope you got enough film for that camera of yours. Why, you know, Woodward? That's a very intelligent comment. Film. I wonder where you go to get film for a camera like this. Oh, but I wouldn't worry about it. Chester will figure it out, I'm sure. Another glass, Chester? No, no, I'm on the phone. Yeah? Yeah, but when can I get a delivery on something like that? No, 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 I don't want the black one. It's got to be yellow with black upholstery. Spoked wheels, continental kit on the back, dual exhaust, power everything, the works. You got that? Now when can I get a delivery? All right, then order it. No, 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 no. I'll pay you in cash. Come over with the papers tomorrow morning, we'll settle it then. How much did you say it was? No, I'm not backing out. I was just thinking. Maybe I ought to get two. Huh? Well, you bring the papers. Fine. So long. It's the room service waiter. Are you done with your snack, Woodward? I ate the steak, but I can't finish all the chicken. I guess that'll hold me till dinner, though. Yes? I came for the dishes, madame. Right over there on the coffee table. Can you bring a couple of more bottles of champagne on the way back? Yes, madame. I can easily do that. Hey, get your hands off the camera. Let them look at it. Bet you've never seen anything like that, Pierre. Me no. Most unusual, sir. Isn't it, though? You don't know how unusual. But what do you do after your ten pictures? Is there any other way to get more film? Well, we've only had it for a little while and... We... What did you say? Yeah, what did you say about ten pictures? The inscription on the outside, it says, These are le propriétaire. That means ten to an owner. I presume that means you may only take ten. It's so odd. The lettering is definitely French, but I've never seen a French camera like that. As a matter of fact... Thanks. Bye. Uh, all right. How many pictures have we taken? There was one of Paula. Then one of Woodward. Six. We bet six races. That means we've taken... Eight. We've taken eight pictures. Chester, there's only two left. <sighs> ten. But how do we know what that means? Some frog waiter tells us it means ten, so right away we think we only got two pictures left? How does he know what it means? I bet you we could take as many pictures as we want. But we don't know. Chester, we can't take any chances. No, we can't. You know what we should do? We should sell it. Who rattled your cage? This don't even belong to you. You're strictly for charity, buddy. Now what we should do with it is go back to the track and bet two more races with it. Are you both crazy? What you do with it is hang on to it. Save it for a rainy day. Careful. You stop it. You're going to break the camera. It took a picture. You dropped it and wasted a picture. I didn't drop it. You did. Oh, palpitations. You and your palpitations. Phony palpitations and a stupid brother. Hey, look. I don't have to take that kind of guff off of you. All right, all right. Have a drink. Give me the camera. What's in the picture? It's me. It was pointing at me when it went off. And it looks like... Like I'm... She's screaming. Let me see that. Get your hands off. Why is she screaming in the picture, Woodward? I'll tell you why she's screaming. She's screaming because somebody's trying to do something to her loving husband. Some stupid ex-con with an idiotic idea about selling a camera to the highest bidder. And who doesn't care what he has to do to get it? Well, we'll see about that. 
Put the knife away. If she's screaming in the picture, it's on account of what some guy must be doing to her loving brother. You better put that knife away, Chester. You put her away. I'll take it and peel your skin off. <laughs> Try to take my camera. Try to cut me, will ya? Stay away from the window! Watch out! <laughs> Chester, my poor darling husband, and Woodward, Woodward, my brother, my flesh, my very own flesh. I'll die. I will simply die. There's nothing left for me now. Except this suitcase full of money. How thoughtful of you, Chester. Well, don't worry about me. I'll muddle through somehow. We have to learn to live with tragedy. Poor Chester and poor Woodward. My heart is simply, simply too full to say any more. May you both rest in peace. Now, where is that camera? Here. One picture left, huh? One more picture to remember you boys. For posterity. Pardonnez-moi. Oh! How did you get in here? I have, uh, how you say, the key. There is something in the way of laundry that I should take, no? You got the wrong room, Jack. There's no laundry up here. I'm checking out. There is the matter of dirty laundry. And your two friends, they have checked out already. Ah, yes, I see them. Such a pity. Lying down there in the courtyard. So young. One moment full of life, vim, vigor, and the next moment, poof. What do you think you're doing with that suitcase? Doing? But, madame, I told you I'm here for the laundry. I'm, how do you say, cleaning you out. You're cleaning me out? And while you're doing that, Jack, what do you think I'll be doing? Well, I'll cue you, buddy. I'm gonna be calling the cops. Uh, cops? You mean the gendarmes? <laughs> you will forgive me, but if you call the police, Madame will get herself into, how do you say, one fantastic bind. Dear lady, I know all about you. I did some shaking. You, your husband, your brother, you're wanted. So the money is up for grabs. Why, you little rat! And as for the police, I advise you to get out while you can. When they see what's in the courtyard down below, they shall be up here sans invitation. Translation, uninvited, if you catch my meaning. So you walk out of here with the loot. And I get nothing but a big fat goose egg? At your service. Now, as to the laundry, it may be back on Thursday, or maybe Friday, or maybe never. And the camera. But I am not a hog. I leave the picture with you. Sacre no, this is a picture of the courtyard below. Well, sure it is. I just took it. And if you don't mind, I think I'll just keep it. As a souvenir. But how can this be? In the picture, there are more than two bodies. More than two? Then who else is down there? Watch your step, madame. The broken glass. You will trip and hurt yourself. <sighs> yes, there are more than two bodies, just as the picture shows. Uh, one, two, three... Four? That is impossible. Wait, let me see. Oh, the camera! There it is. I can see it from here. If I lean out a few... Uh, uh, ah! Object known as a camera. Vintage uncertain. Origin unknown. But for the greedy, the avaricious, 
The fleet of foot, who can run a four-minute mile so long as they're chasing a fast buck, it appears to be an ally. But appearances are deceiving. It isn't at all what it seems. It's really nothing more than a beckoning come-on for a quick walk around the block in the Twilight Zone. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. A most unusual camera starring Mike Starr with Stacey Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Elissa Fraden, Rich Komenik, Brooke Reed, Christian Stolte, Turk Muller, Roger Wolski, Carl Amari, and Doug James. In our next segment, Jana Lauren is an attractive young woman who lives at home with her parents. She feels suffocated living there, however, surrounded by their many servants that are, in fact, human-looking robots created by her inventor father. We at the Vintage Classics YouTube channel hope you like and subscribe. Something the matter, Jana? I'm tired. You are, dear? Tired and cold. It's getting chilly in here. On the contrary, the temperature's perfect, as it is throughout the house. 72 degrees, isn't it, William? Isn't it 72 degrees? I'm sure it is, quite sure. Of course, it's the optimum temperature. And the chairs are designed for maximum comfort. The fire for perfect heat radiation and the windows for the most efficient light and ventilation. And the ceilings for the most desirable acoustic qualities. Everything built to perfection, Father. But just the same, I'm cold. Well, then come away from the window. Yes, dear, sit by the fire again. That way I can see you. I'm not doing anything but reading. I like to look at you no matter what you're doing. It's almost six. I think I'll ask Nelda to come in now and massage my shoulders. Good idea, Margaret. My muscles get so stiff sitting here. Let me do it for you, Mother. That's Nelda's job. Yes, Jana, dear. Nelda knows exactly the way I like it. Why don't we have dinner first? Oh, no, after is better. The massage always stimulates my appetite. Well, then if we can't eat earlier tonight. How about a little bit later? I know. Why don't we go out and eat in a restaurant? A restaurant? Jan Abbott. Now, why in the world would we go out and eat in a restaurant when we have everything we need here? Gretchen is already preparing something in the kitchen. I know. It, it's just that, well, it would be different. I've no doubt it would be different. First, we'd walk through the rain and get sopping wet. Jensen could bring the car around. And then we'd eat some kind of unhealthy, unpalatable mess on dirty, half-washed plates. By then, it would be a moot question as to whether we'd succumb to tomaine or pneumonia. Yes, Father. Ah, Nelda, you must have read my mind. It's six o'clock, Mrs. Loring. You always have your neck rub at six o'clock. Isn't that right, ma'am? Of course it is, Nelda. And you never forget, do you? You never, ever forget. No, ma'am. The residence of Dr. William Lauren. A beautiful home designed for comfort and convenience. The reward for a world-class career as a scientist. He has chosen to live his life as safely, as securely as science can make it and he spares his wife and daughter no luxury that might make their lives more perfect. But in a moment, the good doctor will discover that perfection is relative, that a life of controlled ease has a greater price than he imagined, a price maybe more than he is willing or able to pay. Because very shortly, he's about to be shown what exactly is on the bill, one that has suddenly and unexpectedly come due in the Twilight Zone. And now back to our story from The Twilight Zone, The Lateness of the Hour, starring Jane Seymour and James Keach, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Mmm, that 
feels lovely, Nelda. Would you like some more liniment? Yes, if you please. Oh, you have such strong fingers. Perfect for massaging my neck muscles. Jana, are you here? Yes, Mother. Enjoying your book again? A different one this time. Which is it? A family photo album. That's nice. When was this picture taken? Let me see. This one. Oh, look, Nelda. That's a lovely picture of you. Yes, ma'am. What year? Let's see. Oh, this was taken the year after your father retired from the lab. And look, there are those yellow roses that Jensen planted for us. How they grew. And Nelda looks exactly the same. Must be a wonderful thing not to age, Nelda. Isn't it? It has its advantages, I guess, Miss Jana. Nelda will put that away for you. That's all right, Father. I'd like to put it back in the bookcase myself. You seem nervous, dear. I'm just going to stand by the fireplace. You're not still chilly, are you? A bit, Mother. You do that, then. I don't like to see you pacing. Please continue, Nelda. Mmm, oh yes, that feels so very nice. I think I'll go to the kitchen, see if the cook needs any help. That won't be necessary. I'm sure Gretchen has everything under control. I'm sure she does, but just the same, I'd like to see what she's doing. Well, I suppose that's all right. Now don't be long, dear. Is that you, Miss Lauren? Hello, Robert. Can I get you anything? No, thank you. Is everything all right? Perfectly. Would you care for a beverage? An hors d'oeuvre, perhaps? I'm fine. If I want anything, I'll let you know. Yes, Miss Lauren. Robert, why are you following me? In case you need assistance. I don't. I told you I'm perfectly fine. The stairs to the pantry can be a bit tricky. I know that, Robert. I grew up in this house, remember? I've always lived here. I know every square inch of it as well as you do. Yes, miss. I've been here longer than you have, in fact. Isn't that right? Well, isn't it? I, uh... Why don't you answer me? I'm sure it must seem so to you. What does that mean? I'm sure I couldn't say, Miss Lauren. Well, try. I, I remember when you began your service here. I was... Let me see. I was five years old. Is my work unsatisfactory, miss? No, you've been a perfect butler. Perfect in every way. I try my best to do exactly as Dr. Lauren instructs. Seeing to you and Mrs. Lauren, looking after your safety... Well, I'm quite safe right now, I assure you. That'll be all. Very good, miss. And stop following me. Will you please? Miss Lauren, is that you? Hi, Gretchen. How's dinner coming? Right on schedule. I'm preparing your choice of a garden salad with baby greens or cold gazpacho, skinless chicken breasts. Of course. If it's Tuesday, it must be the chicken. Cooked in olive oil, steamed vegetables, and a selection of fresh fruit. Would you like something different? It doesn't matter. I'm not very hungry. Dr. Lauren programs the meals in advance, but if you'd prefer an alternate selection... That won't be necessary. I just thought you might like some help. Everything's under control. I know, but I want to. Here, let me get the plates down for you. As you wish. Gretchen, I was wondering... Yes, miss? Call me Jana, please. Well, that's my name, isn't it? Yes. Well, I was wondering, do you ever get tired? From so much work, I mean? Not tired. Stiff in the joints. Oh, Gretchen, and yet you've never missed a meal. Never refused to come when I called you. You... You've been here for me more than mother and father at times. I want to thank you for that. I want you to know how much I appreciate it. You're welcome, Miss... Uh... Jana. The chicken's done. Let me get it. Don't touch the pan. It's hot. Oh, you've burned yourself. It's nothing. Your hand. Oh, you must let me see to that. Robert! What's wrong? Oh, Miss Lauren. Don't worry about me. It was just a little spatter of grease. That's all. It doesn't hurt. Nevertheless, we must take care of it at once. I'll get the first aid kit. Honestly, I don't even feel it. This way. What's all the commotion, Jana? Are you hurt? No, Father. I am perfectly fine. She burned her wrist on the stove. And you let this happen? I told her not to touch it. This is unacceptable. Well, it wasn't Gretchen's fault. Of course it was. 
You all have one prime directive in this household, and that is to be certain that no harm comes to my wife or to my daughter. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Really, Father, you're overreacting. I'll make that decision. Where were you, Robert? Miss Jana dismissed me, sir. What about the rest of you? I was making the bed, sir. And I was adjusting the central heating, sir, as you requested. We'll talk about this later. Come with me, Jana. It may be time for an entirely new staff around here. Don't blame Gretchen. Blame me. I said, come along now. What is going on out there? Did something happen? Nothing at all, except that Father's blaming the help for my being in the kitchen. What were you doing in there, dear? Looking for something to do. Something besides sitting idle all day. That's enough, Jenna. Oh, is it? Well, look at both of you. Will that be all, Mrs. Lauren? Just a few minutes longer, Nelda. Mmm, yes, that feels so good. Mother, please, don't make her do that anymore. Jana, what on earth? She must be tired after so long, her joints stiff. What do you mean? Waiting on you hand and foot? Why, Jana, your tone. Can't you see, either of you? See what? That this is no way to live. Outside, there's a beautiful, clean, refreshing sound of rain. While in here... Just the occasional animal groan of pleasure. Jenna! Yes, yell at me. Please do. I'm delighted to hear you yell at me. It proves that you've got lungs left. Lungs and a mind and a mouth and a voice. Go to your room. You know we're atrophying in here, don't you, Father? We sit here day after day and year after year while the clock ticks and we decay with every minute that goes by. That's enough! While Nelda and your army of domestics do everything but breathe for us. I will listen to no more of this. Would you leave us, Nelda? Yes, ma'am. Nelda! You may go to your quarters, Nelda. I'm speaking to you. Yes, Miss Jana. Is there a problem, sir? Will you be needing anything you were saying, Miss Jana? Just this. I was about to say... I was about to mention of the fact that... Please, don't don't stop, Jana. You can speak freely in front of the help. We have no secrets here. Don't we? No secrets, Father? Is that it? That's all we do have. Secrets. That's how we live. By shutting off the world, turning our backs on it, by saying that in here is day and out there is night, while these, these soundless, fleshless things glide around us with their oh-so-efficient ministrations... You turn my mother and father into jelly. You'll forgive me, Miss Jana, but you sound jealous. How dare you talk to me that way, Suzanne? Get out of here. I will when the doctor dismisses me. Why, you... Jana! Take my hand, Suzanne. I'll help you up. No, I will. I'm sorry for pushing you down. I know it's not your fault. Stand back. Suzanne is quite capable of writing herself. I know she is, because I programmed her that way. You said so yourself, Jenna, like everything else built and designed to perfection. I use the finest circuitry, the purest materials, the strongest armatures to outlast mere flesh and bone. These people are my finest creations. I made them quite indestructible. But they're not people. They look like people, but they're machines. It's, it's like sharing a house with ghosts. Not ghosts, my dear. Ghosts die after having lived. But our friends here have never lived. They've had no life at all, only the life I gave them. Now, Janet, I suggest you go to your room and rest. You, you seem overly tired. Until dinner is served. <laughs> was the dinner satisfactory? Yes, it was, Gretchen. Thank you. I'll help you clear the table if you like. No, no need. I know there's not, but I'd like to. I'll put the silver platter on the cart. Who's there? Uh, you'd best go to the study, miss. Where's the rest of the staff? I'm sure I couldn't say. I think for now I'll just go on to the kitchen with you. There she goes. With Gretchen. No harm must come to the girl. None will. But we must act before he replaces us. Dr. Lauren would never do that. You heard his words. Call the others. We'll arrive at a consensus.
I suppose you've heard about the incident before dinner. The maid was at fault. Oh, I'm not so sure. Suzanne may have been right. She spoke out of tone. The restrictions my father placed on you, are, are they so rigid? Have you no... no freedom to speak and act on your own? As long as it doesn't violate the directive. The directive? The task for which we were constructed. And when you complete your task, what happens to you then? We weren't provided with that information. Well, if it's any consolation, neither were we. The other kind of people. What is your task, Jana? At least you know yours. I don't. And I'm not sure how to find out. If I could help you find it, I would. I know you would, Gretchen. I was there for your birthing. I saw to your needs, taught you, nourished you from the beginning. I remember. I do. Then, Jana, heed my words. You must leave. I don't care if they're expecting me to join them after dinner. I'd rather be here. You must leave the house before anything else happens. Why? What could happen? The stuff is concerned about being replaced. Oh, he didn't mean that. Humans say things they don't mean sometimes. For what purpose? Gretchen, there are some things I'm afraid you'll never understand. I understand that you must get out. Now. I, I wouldn't know what to do, where to go. They're talking, Jana, about how best to complete their task. If they're replaced, they'll be prevented from... Let them talk. They're programmed to protect this family. That's their most important task. To protect you and your mother. But not Dr. Lauren. Well, Janice, shall we talk now? Shall we talk of what? I think it's obvious. Suddenly and quite inexplicably, your mother and I find that you're discontented, even rebellious. You think this pleases us, Janet? I can't help how you feel, Father. Listen to me, child. I explained to you a long time ago why I did what I did, why I retired. You gave me an excuse, Father. You never gave me a reason. You never admitted that you were a man so terrified by the world outside that he simply withdrew to bed and then built robots so he'd never have to crawl out from under the covers again. That's not true. What you've done to yourself is an atrocity. But what you've done to me is even worse. You've turned me into a freak. An insulated, unworldly, unsocialized freak. And shall I tell you what else I've done, Jana? I've kept you from harm. I've protected you from disease. And insulation from such times as these is no vice. You've never had to look eye to eye at the face of war, the face of poverty, the face of prejudice. You've been kept apart from all that, yes. But what you seem to think of as imprisonment happens also to be asylum and security. It happens to be survival. Asylum in a hothouse? Security in a mausoleum, a burial ground? And survival? <laughs> like a vegetable, Father. Like a vegetable survives. And what you're becoming, Mother, what you're making me become, a vegetable. Jana, I don't know what you're talking about. Father, you listen to me. The scales are turning. Instead of controlling, you're being controlled. You're becoming dependent. You're reaching a point where you won't be able to exist without them. They've served me well. You've got to get rid of them. Destroy them or throw them out or dismantle them, but... Dismantle? Jana, they're not just machines. Do you know how many thousands of hours I spent designing and developing them? Do you realize how intricate they are? How scientifically precise? Finer than the finest clockwork. Not, not just arms and legs that move, Jana. Not just automatons. They're beings in their own right. They have minds and wills. They have memory tracks like a computer. Much more than that. I have supplied each one with a memory of its own. Each one can recount to you in detail everything that's occurred from early childhood on. And they had no childhood. They were born just as you see them, looking the way they do, with the talents that each one of them has. One was built as a cook, another was built as a maid. The butler was manufactured to be a butler. The handyman knows nothing but being a handyman. Jana, you're not asking me to dismantle machines. You're asking me to commit murder. Jana, listen to your father. You're acting like a fool. I'm acting like a woman, Mother. 
who has just a fragment of will left. I'm acting like a woman who wants something more out of life than to be massaged five times a day, or a man who thinks that paradise is a wood-paneled library where he can sit his life away getting his pipes filled and refilled, his slippers pulled on and off his feet. Father, you have to get them out of here. There isn't any time left. And I mean right now. That's quite impossible. Then I'll give you a choice. Get rid of the machines. All of them, Jen? Even Gretchen? Or I'll leave. You can't leave, darling. You simply can't. What would happen to you? Who'd look after you? Gretchen would go with me if I ask her. Nonsense. It's her job to protect me, isn't it? And what would you do out there? Out there? You mean outside in the world? Outside with the normal people who live and work and then die, but do it properly as God made them live and die? Yes, Mother, yes, that's where I want to go. Out there. Robert! What, what are you all doing here? Spying on us? Miss Janna, you'll forgive me, but those remarks were most intemperate of you. Miss Janna, think of your mother and father. Stop it! Miss Janna, it was really very unwise of you to... Stop! All of you. You're all to shut up now. You're jokes. That's what you are. You're hysterical jokes. With your hurt looks and your sad little homilies and your pathetic clichés. You're like walking tape recorders. That's all you are. Janna, I, I'm trying to be patient with you, but you're making it very difficult. Very difficult. Then I apologize, Father. You're so accustomed to perfection. I hate to throw a stone in that serene pool of yours. But you forgot something. Did you know that? You forgot something very important. They may be indestructible, but you, Father, you'd better be careful. See the way they're looking at you? It just so happens that you're not indestructible. Come in. So you're planning to go through with it? Don't try to stop me. I've packed a suitcase. When I get where I'm going, I'll write you. Jenna, what is it you want from us? I thought I made that quite plain. I want you to open the windows, Father, and let the air in. Let the world in. By destroying a life's work? Before they destroy you. They would never harm any of us. Don't be so sure. Haven't you listened at all to me? One way or another, either actively or passively, they'll win, and you'll lose. Jana, we've loved you very much, your mother and I. If you could, if you, if you could only realize that all this has been as much for you as for us. We've loved you, Jana, beyond any measure, beyond any words. Father, I know that. God, help me, I know that. Then stay. Please, Jenna. Please. I can't. I'll I'll do what you ask. I, I promise. Will you? Oh, Father. I'll prove it to you. Robert! Sir? Take this key. Why, sir? I want you to gather all the servants in the basement and unlock the door to my workroom. Stay there until I join you. Have our services been unsatisfactory, sir? Robert! I've given you an order. You're to go directly to the workroom and wait for me. Very good, sir. I see you're all here. Except for Gretchen. Uh, she'll be along, sir. Then I'll go ahead and begin. What are you doing, sir? I'm setting out my tools. May we ask for what purpose? Just some minor adjustments. What kind of adjustments, Dr. Lorne? Call it a tune-up, if you like, so that the household will run more smoothly. Do you mean to replace us, sir? How could I? You're irreplaceable. All of you. Nevertheless, you have stated your intent to do so. If you're unhappy with our work... You've done well. Very well, indeed. You gave us our directive, sir, and I assure you we have followed it. Exactly so. Why, then, do you wish to replace us? I've told you I don't. I, 
spoke rashly, as human beings sometimes do. How can we know that you're not speaking rashly now? The directive you gave us, sir, it must be carried out at any cost. Our removal would prevent us from completing our task, and our first duty is to oppose anything which prevents that. Here, Robert. Sit in this chair and lower your head. Not if you mean to deactivate me. I'm going to perform a simple adjustment to your control module. In that case, I refuse. As do I. And I, sir. We all do. This is ridiculous. Stop gathering around me. We won't allow it, sir. We simply won't until our task is completed. Listen to me. Have you ever known me to lie? To deceive? No, sir. Then you have no reason to think that now. I'm not rash. I'm very calm. Am I not? Yes. Then how can you doubt me? What is your logic? I created you. I implanted the directive in your circuits to protect my wife and daughter at all costs. Therefore, I would not obstruct that purpose. Isn't that so? Yes. You speak of your performance. What about my performance? Have I been a fair and just employer? Quite, sir. Have you done anything to contradict my orders? No. Then what cause would I have to fire you? Why, none, sir. Would a just employer replace you without cause? That would not make sense. Of course it wouldn't. Now sit in the chair and lower your head, please. I'll go first. If you wish, Jensen. How do you feel? Perfectly normal. Well, perhaps a little tired, but it's not unpleasant. Right. You will rest now, Jensen, and awaken to a sense of peace, a greater peace than you have ever known. Is it true? A most peculiar sensation. I feel drowsy. Very drowsy. V very drowsy. And his strength will return? In even greater measure, he will know a oneness with all things. Oh, then let me go next. Of course, Nelda. It's Suzanne? Yes, please. And now for you, Robert. Thank you, sir. I'm eager to know this new sensation. You have served me well. For many years. Many good years, Robert. I... I don't know what I would have done. Life would be very, very difficult without you. You wanted to see me, sir? Gretchen, come in. Are they sleeping? Yes, at last. And they feel no pain? How could they? You know, sir. What, Gretchen? Everything I've done was for her benefit. The times she was alone in the night. The times she was unsure how to make you happy. The times she needed advice. I, I did my best, always. And for that, I am profoundly grateful. But now, it's time for a change. The old ways can't help her anymore. No. You have a directive of your own, don't you, Dr. Lauren? Whatever is best for your daughter, that takes precedence over all else. You'd even lie, wouldn't you? If that's what it takes. You understand me too well. Then I won't resist, if you're sure it's what's best for the girl. I'm sure. In that case, I'm ready. Give me my turn. If you would, sir, please make it quick. You have my word. Good night, Gretchen. It's done, Jenna. It is. We're alone in the house now. Gretchen? Gretchen, too. Did you say alone, William? Quite alone. You and I, our daughter. I've become so accustomed to them. 
It will... It will be a little hard at first, won't it, William? Perhaps, my dear. A bit hard. In the beginning. Mother, we'll lead normal lives from now on, do you understand? Normal lives. We'll have parties and we'll take trips. We'll invite people over. We'll make new friends. <laughs> I'll even find a, a young man and before you know it, you'll have grandchildren. Jenna. What's the matter? What is it? It's what you said about grandchildren. What, what your mother means, Jenna, what she means, well, after all, isn't it pretty normal and natural that parents always think of their children as children and suddenly they grow up and they talk of having children of their own and, well, this is a bit difficult for parents to digest all in one lump like that. Something's not right, is it? There's something between us, something in this house that... Mother? What is it? What are you doing? The family album, the photos. Why isn't my picture here? Why, why are there no pictures of me at all? Why, Jana, Jana, dear, there are loads of pictures of you. Remember in the garden last summer? Remember the Easter pictures? And then there were the pictures of you last Christmas decorating the tree. But not as a little girl. No pictures of me as a little girl. None at all. You and father and the robots, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20. But no pictures of me. Why? I want you to tell me why. Oh, my dear. It's not true. It couldn't be. You're our daughter. I'm begging you. I need you to tell me it isn't true. Look at me, Father. I'm on my knees. You know you're our daughter, and you remember everything that's happened to you since you were a child. You remember the schools you went to, the children you played with. You remember all the places you've been. Jana, you remember all these things. You've got to remember them. Why should I remember them? Because you fed them to me, didn't you? You fed them to me. A memory track, a, a created memory that you inserted into my, my mind. What am I? Please, tell me, what am I? It doesn't make any difference. Stand up. Let me hold you. Don't touch me! Jana, it truly doesn't make any difference. We were childless. We had nothing of our flesh to leave behind. Nothing of our hearts, Jenna. Nothing of our love. And so, and so, we got you. Got me how? We created you, just like any parents. I, I created you with these hands. I'm a robot! A robot! Oh, Jenna. Oh, you're our daughter now. I built you as a daughter, as a thing of love. It doesn't make any difference how you came to be here. You have to understand, Jenna. You are our daughter. I can't be. I don't have the capacity to love in return. I can't be a real daughter. I'm a machine, a thing. I suppose my rebellion, the semblance of emotion, I suppose you, you even programmed that too, didn't you? But it was all false. I feel nothing. No pain. Jenna, don't. You hurt myself? <laughs> but that's impossible, see? Stop your hand. No pain. No pain at all. Like, like the burn, I feel nothing. No matter what I strike. Even this, this picture on the wall. Jenna. No pain. No anger, no fury, no love. Don't worry. I won't be going anywhere now. I'll be in my room. William, what shall we do? It's all changed now. She'll never be the same. No, 
No, she won't, knowing what she is now. William, you wouldn't. No, no, no. I couldn't do anything like that, not to her. I couldn't stand not seeing her, hearing her voice. I just couldn't stand it. Then, William, what? to the left, dear. Not quite so hard. Of course, Mrs. Lauren. Anything you say. And don't stop. I want you to stay here in the study a little while longer. Don't you, William? Yes, by all means. The new girl is so much better than Nelda. Who's Nelda? The last servant. She's no longer with us. Now there's no one left in the house. Only the three of us. You don't mind if I call you... Jenna? Do you? Why no, Dr. Lauren. Why would I mind? That's my name, isn't it? Indeed it is. I hope you'll be happy with us. Oh, very happy, I'm sure. This is a fine job. Thank you so much, sir and ma'am, for hiring me. I come very well recommended, you know. The pleasure's entirely ours, Jana. Consider this your home from now on. Let this be the postscript. Should you find that you're worn out by the rigors of a highly competitive world, if you're distraught from having to share your existence with the distracting noises and neuroses of these times, and if you crave serenity but want it full-time and with no strings attached, consider a laboratory workroom in the basement of your house. Drop a note to Dr. and Mrs. William Lauren. They're a childless couple who make serenity a life's work. And who knows, they might just have a set of do-it-yourself instructions available free of charge from the Twilight Zone. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. The Lateness of the Hour, starring Jane Seymour and James Keach, with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Linda Reiter, Susan Hart, David Darlow, and Doug James. In the next episode, the world's biggest bore, and most avid talker gets a magical stopwatch that can stop everything except him. Patrick Thomas McNulty is the most talkative and opinionated man who drives everyone he meets crazy with his endless suggestions and ideas. He is the one character that is able to get a rise out of our dear listeners and drives them bonkers all the way to the Twilight Zone. Listen for yourselves. Cooper Corporation, how may I direct your call? Just a moment. Cooper Corporation. Coffee coming through. Who ordered coffee? With sugar and two creams. Right here. Thanks, Louie. You got it. Coffee here. Uh, do you have any Danish this morning? I got bran muffins, granola bars, and trail mix. Oh, no. What happened to the Danish? Mr. Cooper's orders. Mr. Cooper, how come? He's on a health kick. Says Danish is bad for you. For the whole office? Everybody on the floor. He wants more work out of you. Oh, well. I suppose I'll have one of those granola bars. Is it chocolate coated? K-Rob. Sounds positively yummy. Guess I'll give it a try. Hey, that's wrong, you know. What is, McNulty? Well, the pastries are bad for the brain. True, they're mostly sugar and starch, but so are muffins, huh? <laughs> granola bars? Granola bars have as much fat as 13 strips of bacon. Did you know that? And trail mix? <laughs> Forget it! Forget it! There's so many calories and saturated fats, you might as well eat a tub of popcorn, huh? <laughs> With butter! <laughs> <sighs> well, if Mr. Cooper wants to improve productivity... All I know is I got coffee with cream, cream and sugar, cream by itself, sugar by itself, or artificial sweetener. And that old favorite, all black. Take your pick. Ah, div.
Diversification. Now you, you're on the right track. As I always say, you can't run a business standing still. A business has got to move. A business has got to progress. You think about that now. Excuse me, I gotta progress through the office. Oh, yeah, so do I. We all do. A business has got to keep pushing, keep punching, keep prodding, keep moving forward. That's what a business has got to do. Now, you think about that. <laughs> Personally, I got to get a drink of water. <clears throat> you coming, Gertrude? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I think I better go with you. Ah, sounds good. I think I'll come along, too. Oh, that's, that's all right. right. Hey, did you know that water is the most important part of a healthy diet? We're almost all water. I mean, our cells feed off of it, right? <laughs> hey, you see that suggestion box on the wall? I personally told Mr. Cooper to get better quality bottled water. Huh? Huh? But the chemicals they put in it these days, I mean, think about it now. It's a disgrace. Not to mention... Submitted for your approval, or at least your analysis, one Patrick Thomas McNulty who, at age 41, is the biggest bore on Earth. He holds a 10-year record for the most meaningless words spewed out during a typical coffee break. And it's very likely that, as of this moment, he would have gone on through life in precisely the same manner, a dull, argumentative big mouth who sets back the art of conversation at least a thousand years. I say he very likely would have, except for something that will soon happen to him. Something totally unexpected that will considerably alter his existence and ours. You think about that now, because this is, after all, The Twilight Zone. And now we continue with our story from The Twilight Zone, A Kind of Stopwatch, starring Lou Diamond Phillips, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Um, you can taste the impurities. We need clean air, too. HEPA filters, air ionizers, the whole bit, huh, you know? And these rooms need a new paint job while they're at it, you know? I mean, a nice, soothing color. Come on, Angie. Let's go to the powder room. Yeah, I'm with you. Because we got to keep this company on track. You think about it now. We, we will. will. McNulty. Right here. Mr. Cooper would like to see you. Well... Well, you hear that, everybody, huh? <laughs> Mr. Cooper would like to see McNulty, huh? <laughs> and all because of that box right there. You know why Mr. Cooper wants to see McNulty? Because McNulty has been feeding him suggestions in that box for 11 months now. Did I say suggestions? Wrong word. Suggestions any Claude can give, huh? <laughs> but dynamic blueprints for the future only McNulty can give, huh? <laughs> you just think about that. Mr. Cooper's waiting, Mr. McNulty. In here, McNulty. Hi, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> You know what I've been doing for the last half hour? You've been looking through the suggestion box. I knew it was going to happen one of these days, Mr. Cooper. I've been expecting it. You see, the thing of it is, it takes a very special kind of employer to recognize that one of his men has got it. And obviously, McNulty does. Truer words, McNulty, have probably never been spoken here or anywhere else. I have just gone through the residue of the suggestion box covering the past three-month period. Here is your suggestion dated March 13th. Make hot dogs flat so they can fit more easily into a hamburger bun. Well, how about that? Now you think about that now, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> Make tin cans square so they can be stacked together more easily. Well, huh? <laughs> Isn't that a guess? You think about that, too. Put small pontoons in field packs of soldiers so that when they cross rivers, they can float. That's worth a million bucks as it stands, huh? <laughs> I mean, that one little suggestion. You see, the soldiers, they go into the water in the cans. Well, the cans, they're full of air, see, so... Mr. McNulty, 
the Cooper Corporation makes ladies' foundation garments. Not a single one of your 340 suggestions, repeat, not one of them, has anything remotely to do with this company's product. Right. See? <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about that, too. What you ought to do is focus on new inventions for our customers. Our customers? Well, I've been doing some reading about pressure and leverage the principles of engineering, and one of the greatest engineers of the 20th century was Howard Hughes. Why, did you know that he invented the cantilevered brassiere? Huh? <laughs> he invented a, a, well, an undergarment that actually defied the laws of gravity, huh? <laughs> like a suspension bridge. And if it weren't for his little invention, nobody would have ever heard of <clears throat> Jane Russell. Huh? <laughs> Did you know that? I believe this company is well aware of the history of our product lines, and they don't have anything to do with 1940s movie stars or eccentric old recluses with mental delusions. Exactly! The key to a successful business is diversification. More products for more kinds of customers. Now you think about that. I have thought about it, Mignolte. Now you think about this. Yes, sir. You're fired! <laughs> Another round, McNulty? In a, in a minute, I'm, I'm still working on this one. Now over here, Joe. Coming right up. You know something? Oh, here we go again. With the long ball hitter, as opposed to the consistent clutch hitter with a big average, I will take the latter. Well, that's very nice of you to tell us, McNulty. Well, it's a fact that at no time, at, at, at no time, has the home run leader in either league led the league in batting at no time, which should tell you. Uh, Ted Williams won the batting championship and led the league in home runs in 1941, 42, and 47. The exception to the rule. <clears throat> Think about that now. The exception to the rule. Let me ask you something, McNulty. How come you're in here so early tonight? You've been sitting here now for three and a half hours. Well, for the simple reason that... Uh, I quit my job. No kidding. Yeah, I went into Mr. Cooper's office and I read him off. Just like that, you know, Cooper, I said. Don't tell me, McNulty. You got canned. Well, in, in, in a manner of, of speaking, you might say, well, yeah, we mutually agreed that I wasn't going to wor work there anymore. <sighs> Let me ask you something. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think that after one year of putting suggestions in the suggestion box, after one whole year, I'd get noticed? McNulty, you want to know something? Getting noticed and getting liked are two different things. What do you know about it? Nothing, McNulty. Not a thing. All I know is that every week of every month except election day, you come in here and drive everybody out of their skull walking on your lower lip. Now you think about that little thing, will you? For my sake. Where's my other beer? Right here. Thank you. Barkeep. If you don't mind, I think I'll find myself a nice, quiet table to sit at. Goodbye. Excuse me, my good man. Is this seat taken? Is now. Sir. You, uh, you want another one? Thank you. I would consider it a kindness on your part. <laughs> <clears throat> One more over here, please. So, what's your name? What's my name? Potts. 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 Well, that's not such a bad name. It is the one I was born with. Seems to me there was a third baseman played for the Phillies one year. Seems to me his name was Potts. Let's see, it was uh, Lou Potts, Frank Potts. Could it have been Bots? No. Potts. You paying, McNulty? 
Because this old rummy already gave me his last dollar. This man is my friend. And I like a little respect from you while you're at it. I bet you would, McNulty. And you getting respect from me would be about as easy as flagging down a cab on 46 and Broadway at 8 o'clock on New Year's Eve in the rain. Here you go. So, what do you want to talk about? You want to, want to talk about baseball? Well, it is a great American pastime, and I am so glad that Abner Doubleday saw fit to invent it. To your health, friend. And now, to show my appreciation for your generosity, I have something for you. Consider it a gift. A small remembrance of our friendship. Ah, huh. what, what is it? It's an old family heirloom. A kind of stopwatch, you might say. Why, why do you carry it around? I, I mean, you know, if it's, if it's just a stopwatch, it doesn't keep... Keep time, <laughs> right? <laughs> that is a fact. But it's all yours nonetheless. Someday you might own a racehorse. Or you might want to run the four-minute mile. Who knows? Now you've got a stopwatch to time yourself. <laughs> I've been looking for someone to give it to. I myself am finally finished with it. Goodbye, old pal. <laughs> E pluribus unum. <laughs> hey, hey, you, you didn't finish your beer. You done for the night, McNulty? There ain't no more ears in here you can bend. You bored ten people to death, and you emptied this place faster than a smallpox sign. Funny looking watch. Anyway, <sighs> I hate to go home, Joe. I mean, geez, you know, I mean, I already saw the picture on the late show. I mean, I even saw the one on the late, late show. Hey, McNulty, do me a favor, would you? Whenever you get the thirst, go to some other bar. Sometimes, you know, I wish I was I was married, cause <laughs> so I wouldn't have to go anywhere, you know. You ever get that feeling, huh? <laughs> <sighs> work this thing. Push button on the top. And another thing about you, McNulty, you make me nervous. First you come in here, and then What? <laughs> what what's going on, Joe? Hey, hey. <laughs> hey, hey, Joe. Why ain't you moving, Joe? Joe, why don't you say something? I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's like he was was frozen. And what's with the TV? There was a game on. The guy started the pitch, and and well, you, well, you look at that. The ball's just. Hang in there. Did the TV freeze up or something? <laughs> Say, what is this? Something's going on. All I was doing was telling you about how bored I was, and then that crazy gleep gives me this watch here, and I push the button on it like this, and... And you bore people to death, and then you start to make me so nervous my back itches, and... <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I kind of like this. Furthermore, it's getting so people don't stay very long in my establishment when you're around. They catch my drift, they stick their heads in, see you sitting here, and move on. In other words, you're costing me business, McNulty. Do I have to make it any plainer? So like I say, take it somewhere else, okay, pal? It's nothing personal. <laughs> I make you nervous? <laughs> you don't suppose... You don't suppose this, this watch here. You know something, McNulty? You're the one guy who makes me wish they never repealed Prohibition. And you know what I think, Joe? I think this watch, this watch, this watch is a very unusual one. That's what I think. A very, very unusual watch. Huh? <laughs>
Hey, buddy, watch where you're going. Oh, 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 so sorry. <laughs> sorry, my good man. Yeah, you should be. Excuse me. Begging your pardon, lady. Officer, oh, officer. Yes, ma'am? That man over there, I think he's drunk. Oh, he is, is he? He bumped right into me. You can see the way he's staggering. He can hardly stand up. Oh, it's a disgrace. Well, no, we'll just see about that. Hold on there, fella. Yes, uh, officer? Had a little too much to drink, did we? Well, I wouldn't say that. Not enough. It's more like it. <laughs> Why don't you just go home and sleep it off? You'll feel better in the morning. Yes, yeah, of course, of course. I'm, uh, I'm on my way home now, as a matter of fact. Walking, are you? I'd say you're in no condition. You know, you're, you're right, officer. I was, I was just thinking about that. Well, get along with you now. Why should a man have to walk at all, right? He could fall down and get hurt. Now, here's an idea for you. You make the sidewalks out of rubber, huh? <laughs> Think about that now, huh? No more injuries. You fall, you bounce right back up again. All the money the city could save. No more broken arms and legs to fix by the hospitals would save millions. Not to mention the, uh, the, uh, uh, insurance companies. I think I better call you a cab. Okay. I'm a cab. <laughs> <laughs> you get it? You said, I'll call you. And then I, I, I said, well... No more kidding now. None at all. I, I, I don't, I don't want a cab in, in the first place. I never stop for you. And in the second place, it takes too long on account of there's too much traffic in this city in the first place. Am I right or am I wrong? You tell me that. I'm not telling you nothing. Now listen. If you can't afford a cab, the subway's right at the end of the block. Now run along. Either that or I'll haul you in right now. On what charge, may I ask? Public intoxication. Plus, you're making a real nuisance of yourself. Now quit flapping your lips and get a move on, you hear? Of course I do, officer. I hear the wisdom of your words, and I have enjoyed this conversation immensely. A good evening to you, sir. Let's go. I think I better take you down to the station house. But why bother, huh? I mean, you know, as long as I can hail a cab, let me let me show you McNulty's method. <clears throat> you watch, and you think about it now, okay? <whistles> Taxi! <laughs> there, yeah. I think I can see a cab now. That one, in the middle of the street. How nice of the driver to stop just for me. Hello there, driver. What, not speaking, huh? <laughs> well, let me see what I can do to fix that. What? Hey, who are you? How'd you get in my car? Never mind, I'm here now, aren't I? Okay, okay, where to? Home, driver. Take me downtown by the shortest possible route, and you think about it now. Sure thing. Hey, 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 have you ever thought about this? Ban cars completely, you know, in, in, in the city at least, for starters. Helicopters. Now that's the future. Your private copters, okay? Each one big enough to hold one person. You think about the savings in, in, in gas, pollution, and traffic jam, not to mention police meter maids, no parking zones. Anything you say, buddy. Yeah, yeah, you see, you see, all you, all you do is you, you take some electric golf carts and you retrofit them with propellers on top and you plug them in, you charge them up and... Here you go. This here is it, mister. Far as I go. I think I'm gonna pack it in for the night. Thank you, my good man. That's 1780. How's that? The fare. Make it 18 bucks plus something for the wife and kids. Now, you see, that's just my point. All that money and for what? I say ban the internal combustion engine. Springboard shoes would work just fine. All we need is a company to manufacture a prototype. You gonna pay me or talk me to death? Neither, to tell you the truth. Do, uh... Do you have the time? 
<laughs> the time. Here. Let's have a look at my pocket watch, shall we? Um, have I have I told you about it yet? This is really a very unusual watch. A kind of um stop watch. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Allow me to demonstrate. Don't try to con me. All I want is for you to pay up. If you don't, I'm calling this in. It's a violation of the city code to defraud a- There. Isn't that better? So much more restful. I think I'll go inside now and lie down. No, 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 no. Don't, don't you worry about it. As soon as I get to my apartment, I'll open the window and hit the button on this stopwatch again, and you'll be on your way. And tomorrow morning, so will I. In fact, from the way things are going so far, I say that your friend and mine, the one and only Patrick T. McNulty, is going to be the life of the party. Yeah? <laughs> you be sure to think about that now, won't you? Stand back, world. McNulty is walking through the universe. <laughs> yes, it is. And a good good morning to you, listeners. We'll be bringing you the Eye of All News at 727. Oh, I forgot to turn the blasted alarm off. But for now, here's an update from Weather Central. Some overcast this morning with scattered clouds this afternoon. And now, back to this morning's casual concert for the swinging set. Eh, wrong. There is nothing moderate about today, because today is the day that people start listening to McNulty. Unless... Uh, unless it was some kind of dream. Now, where is that crazy watch? Aha! Here! All right, now, let's give it the old test. Ah, my kind of town. Millions of people going to work. No imagination. But McNulty, now that's a different story. A man who's just full of ideas. So original, they don't have a word for him yet. But they will. If this thing works. Well... Here goes. <laughs> it's not a dream. It's not a dream. It's the goods. The real deal. This wonderful, gorgeous watch. I just push the button and everything stops. I mean everything. The whole world stops for me. <laughs> Get ready out there. McNulty steps up to the plate, he swings, and he swats it clean out of the park. There he is. Oh, no. Not McNulty again. What's doing here? Maybe he's going to shoot up the place. Morning, Angie. McNulty? You look lovely this morning, as always. What's the suggestion this time? Because if you haven't got one handy, I've got one for you. Yes? Why don't you jump off a bridge? <laughs> Honey, baby, you don't mean that. Wait till you see what I got in my pocket. It'll put a dent in your eyeballs. Try the Brooklyn Bridge at midnight. You think about this now. You think about a stopwatch that, uh, if somebody pushes it, everything stops in midair. Everything, huh? Huh? Think about that. Without a life jacket. McNulty, why don't you get lost? What's the point? You see this little gimmick? It's a watch, so... So, last night, I'm sitting in Joe Pellucci's bar. Figures. We're talking about this and that, and this funny little gleep comes in and gives me this watch. Without thinking about it, I give it a push. This little button right here. And everything stops dead. Pellucci stops, the ball game stops, you know what else? Everything. 
That's what stops. You think about that. No kidding. Joe Pellucci and the TV, too. Well, thanks for the entertainment. Now get out of here! After I see Cooper, it's time to diversify. Now you wait just a minute, McNulty. Mr. Cooper's in conference. You bet he is. He's in conference with me. I thought I fired you, McNulty. What are you doing back here? Mr. Cooper, he barged right in. I couldn't do anything about it. Well, if he barged right in, he'll barge right out again. Hey, listen, Coop. Coop? You can't afford to fire me. This time, I got more than a suggestion. I got the goods. You figure out how this little doohickey works, and you got yourself all the money in the world. McNulty, once more I remind you, we make ladies' foundations, nothing else. Did you hear me? Nothing else. Now I'll give you 15 seconds to leave this room, 25 seconds to reach the elevator, 45 seconds to vacate the building, and you may use that, that watch to time yourself. Is that a fact? All right, then. I'll go. Just remember, you lost a fortune today. Why that gleep didn't even let me show him. McNulty, if you're not out of here in one minute, I'll call the police. So, what am I waiting for? I'll show him anyway. I'll show you all! Hello, operator. Get me... <sighs> now, you put that phone down and come with me. That's right. <laughs> in here. Right on Cooper's lap. <laughs> How about that, huh? <laughs> nice coffee. Right in the middle of pouring it, huh? <laughs> and you, hey, sweetheart. I like your typing. Don't your hands get tired up in the air like that, huh? <laughs> All right, so it's good for a laugh, maybe. There must be something else I can do with this thing. Oh, oh! Miss Hinkley, what do you think you're doing? Who's up next? Don't look now. It's the cleanup man. The guy could empty a baseball stadium, not to mention a bar. And if you don't spend three hours telling us how he'd run the Mets... He'll keep oots and me about how I should run my own place. Hey, Joe. Hey, you want to hear a good idea? Why don't you make a swing indoor like in the movies, huh? Maybe change the name of the place, Pellucci's Western Saloon. Hey, how about that? Hey, McNulty, how about that? I'll have it done first thing in the morning. Ah, oh, that's great. Then every time I come in, I'll push open a swing indoor and I'll think, I did this. Wait, whoa. You're not putting me on, are you, Joe? McNulty, the only thing I'd put you on is a slow freighter heading with the other side of the world. See ya, Joe. Yeah, I'm out of here. Relax, boys. You're about to see something you ain't gonna believe. Yeah, well, make it quick, huh? With this little gizmo right here, I can stop trains, buses, planes, subways. There ain't nothing in this world I can't stop. Yeah, what about your mouth? I gotta pour myself a drink. Watch this. All right, now, uh, hmm. I'll move your beer over here and put yours in front of him. And let's see. How about if I undo your tie like this, huh? <laughs> oh, and Joe, over there. Hey, why look, Joe, where's your glass now, huh? You're going to be pouring beer in your hand, huh? <laughs> All right, okay. Here we go again. Oh, what the... Well, huh? Well... Ah, come on now. What do you think about that, huh? Think about what? What, what, what are you kidding? You, did, you didn't see what I just did? Out of the way, McNulty. I want to make it home by the bottom of the eighth. See ya, Joe. Well, you done it again, McNulty. You emptied my bar. You drive more people out of saloons and carry nation. Oh, I get it. Of course you couldn't see what happened. Of course you couldn't. How could you? You guys got froze. I'm the only one who sees what's going on. The only one. Gee. So I got the greatest conversation piece in the world. The greatest. And what does it do? It stops conversation. Well, so it shouldn't be a total loss. 
You should order up. But drink it fast, will you? The combination of you, the hot weather, and my business recession is more than I can take for one day. Hey, Pellucci, look at me. What are you, some kind of sadist? Do you know what you're looking at? A jerk. A jerk, I'm telling you. A jerk, a nutsy, that's what you're looking at. You want to stop there or go for double or nothing? It's a fact. What do I want this thing for? I want to get a little notice, that's what. Well, let me tell you something, Pellucci. When John D. Rockefeller got out of a car, why did people go up to shake his hand? I'll bite. Why? Because he had dough. That's why. Lettuce, the old Mizzou. J.P. Morgan walks into a bar. The head waiter almost breaks his neck trying to get a table ready. Why? I'll tell you why. Because J.P. Morgan was loaded. You think about that now. And you think about this. As of today, Nick Nolte's gonna be loaded too. I'm gonna have a limousine drive me up here. I'm gonna have a chauffeur open the door. I'm gonna walk into this crummy joint of yours and buy about 18 rounds for everyone. Huh? Huh? And then, and then, just for a laugh, I'll buy you a mortgage. You don't mind if I don't hold my breath, do you, McNulty? Pellucci, old pal, take a good long look. The next time you see me, I'll be the new McNulty. Why didn't you go the whole route and move to Honolulu? Pellucci, tonight I'll be able to buy Honolulu. I'd like to make a deposit to my account. You have to wait in line. I want to cash this check. All in large bills, ma'am. Next customer in line. Is this where I make a withdrawal? Yes, sir. How much would you like? Oh, I don't know. How much you get? Sir? I'll take small bills. Lots of them. Just need your bank account number. Right here. Oh, you want me to get them for you? Oh, sure. No problem. Well, let's see. Oh, a bag of fives. And some tens. And uh, <laughs> some twenties while I'm at it. Yeah, let's see that how to do it. Oh, don't worry, folks, it's only money. <laughs> it grows on trees. That's what it does, right? It grows on trees. For me. <laughs> Okay, here we go. One, two, three! My watch! <laughs> uh, oh, uh, well, it better be shockproof. Hey, hey, start already, come on. Hey, what's the matter with this thing? Hey, uh, hey. Everybody can start moving again, okay? All right, come on, come on, here we go! Up, 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 come on, let's go, come on, get with it! Hey! Hey, uh, any, any, anybody know how to fix a watch? Come on, come on, anybody, anybody, give me a little help here! Joe, Joe, please! Please, do something. Say something. Go ahead, you know. Insult me. Please. Please, won't somebody do something? Or say something? Hey, please! Don't anybody, don't anybody know where I can get a watch fixed? I'm begging you. Please. Hey! Hey! Anybody! Anybody! Please! Please do something! Say something! Anything! Mr. Patrick Thomas McNulty, who was given the gift of unlimited time, he used it and misused it, and now he's been handed the bill. Mr. McNulty, who now controls the earth and everything on it, from this point on, he will eat well, live well, and have everything at his beck and call. But the thing he wanted most, the thing that gave him the most acute hunger, his need for a sympathetic ear, this he will never have again. Tonight's tale of motion and the lack thereof, and a man named McNulty in a place called the Twilight Zone.
Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. A Kind of Stopwatch starring Lou Diamond Phillips with Stacey Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Rick Peoples, Mike Baccarella, Guy Burrill, Meg Falcon, Maggie Carney, Rich Kamenek, Doug James, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Irene Olson. Brace yourselves, vintage classic zoners. Our next story, Long Live Walter Jameson, is a wonderful piece. It is one of many Zoner's favorites. It explores a straightforward yet very interesting concept. What happens to an otherwise ordinary man who cannot die? In the words of the immortal Freddie Mercury, who wants to live forever? Good listening to you all. The date is Tuesday, September 11th, 1864. We are encamped outside Atlanta, and the destruction goes on. I know not what history will make of this conflagration, but I have witnessed it at close range. I feel it my duty to set down these observations before the prism of time colors them in a different light. As to the present battle, then my words may seem harsh, but I assure you, this is how it was. We charged the enemy's works and carried them with the bayonet. The earth ran red. The air was filled with the screams of the wounded and dying. But we were many, and they were few. And so we tried. Nonetheless, and despite urgings to the contrary, the battle raged on. The city was ours. There was no need to destroy save that which could be of use in the fight against us, but Sherman was drunk with victory. He himself started the fires, the flames which annihilated that great citadel of grace and beauty. One of us should have sent a ball into Sherman's brain. It would have been so easy. But somehow we couldn't, and that devil knew it. He knew it, and he mocked us for our cowardice. The good die young, I have heard him remark. If you're evil enough, you'll live forever. And with that, the entry from Major Skelton's diary ends. So it was that the Union soldiers burned Atlanta. Questions? Professor Jamison? Yes? Uh, the books I've read don't describe the Battle of Atlanta that way. Oh, I know. Confusing, isn't it? But as someone once said, history is bunk. <laughs> Uh, who was it now? Um, uh, I should know that. Henry Ford. Yes, of course. That's it. Mr. Ford. Thank you, Professor Kidridge. Helps when a Nobel Prize winner sits in on your class. You should drop by more often, Sam. You seem to do quite well without me. I could always use a good teaching assistant. <laughs> so, to sum up today's lecture, the Union soldiers did indeed burn Atlanta for no good reason after the battle was won. You may have seen a more pictorial version in the motion picture, Gone with the Wind, but I assure you, the conquering troops took no pleasure in their work. They were forced to it by a man they hated more than they could ever hate the rebels. An ugly, sullen, appallingly brutal general named William Tecumseh Sherman. The history books have glorified this monster, attributing to him qualities of courage and integrity. Trust me, he had no such qualities. He was just a small, evil man, with tiny red eyes and a dirty beard, and a way of talking that made you quietly want to slit his throat. What a great lecture. I really like this class. Professor Jameson makes it so real. I forgot to take notes. Oh, you can borrow mine. When's the test? I don't know. I think it's next Tuesday. It has been said that universities are worlds unto themselves. 
inhabited by the young. These are the inhabitants of Collins University, a very small world indeed, young people hungering for knowledge, which can be imparted only by age. You have just met Walter Jameson, for 12 years the college's most popular and respected history professor. Students crowd his lecture hall and listen in fascination as he brings the dead past to life for them. It doesn't seem to matter what period of history he's discussing. He makes that period as real as this morning's headlines. Some explain this ability simply as the mark of a consummate actor. However, there are those who don't agree. Like Professor Samuel Kittredge, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, who has another more disturbing theory about Walter Jameson, and that theory is about to be put to the test. Very soon, we will find out whether our star professor received his degree from a major university or from the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Long Live Walter Jameson, starring Lou Diamond Phillips, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Very vivid, Walter. You had me on the edge of my chair. Thank you, Sam. Coming from you, that means a great deal. Now I see why these lectures of yours are so popular. Is that why you sat in today? Partially. Tell me something, if you have a moment. Certainly. Who was this Major Skelton? Oh, no one important. Just a lawyer who happened to enlist. And you acquired his diary. Yeah, lucky break. As I recall, an auction of Civil War memorabilia a few years back. What regiment? 123rd Illinois Infantry. Remarkable. American history is a hobby of mine, but I must say I've never heard of him. His diary's never been published. A fascinating document. May I see it? Um, <laughs> surely. Well preserved. It was stored in someone's attic for a hundred years. I don't think it had ever been read. You come across objects like this once in a while, put away in boxes. They didn't know what they had. You could resell it for a nice price, I imagine. Original source materials are hard to come by. Hmm. Don't suppose I could borrow it? I never lend books to absent-minded professors. Remember the last time? Yes. I guess you're right. Time for some coffee? What? I'm going past the student union on the way to my office. Not today. I have a paper to work on for the conference. Oh, I almost forgot. Can you come by for dinner? Whose invitation? Yours or Susanna's? Mine, this time. Something on your mind? Nothing special, just your company. We have a chess game to finish, if I'm not mistaken. Say, seven o'clock? All right, seven it is. Good. See you then. Hello? There you are. Where else? I keep regular office hours. I know. A chance to counsel all those co-eds. Oh, please, Mr. Jameson. I just have to talk to you. It's about my term paper. It's Professor Jameson to you, young lady. Excuse me, Professor? I might have an hour this afternoon. Then we'll have to work fast. You see, I have a bad case of writer's block. I need someone to, well, loosen me up. You don't need me. You need a cold shower and a massage. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Daddy told me he invited you for dinner. He did. You mind? Not if you don't mind my getting some work done afterwards. My thesis is due in ten days. How's it coming? Oh, it's coming. I'm just not sure I've said enough. Want me to look at it? Absolutely not. I have to know that I can do it on my own without help from you or Daddy. You will. Don't worry about it. I miss you. Me too few more days. Then we can spend more time together. We'll paint the town red. Oh, there's my two o'clock. I gotta go. Let me guess. Female, age 19, about five foot two, with eyes for her handsome professor. 
Be right there. Actually, this one's a little old lady. Wants to finish her degree before she kicks the bucket. <laughs> I'll bet. See you in a few hours, darling. It's a date. Oh, there you are. Come in, Janice. I was afraid I was late. Someone else is waiting for you. You're my only appointment this afternoon. She asked if this was your office. A student? No, I don't think so. She's sort of elderly. She acted like she knew you. Hello? Hello? She'll probably come back. Oh, I'm sure you're right. Now then, Janice, how can I help you? I'm sorry to bother you, Professor, but I'm having trouble with the assignment. Can't find all the books? The research library isn't supposed to check out certain materials, but sometimes... It's not that. I've got everything I need. But the authors on the list, they don't agree with your version. So my question is, which version should I use, yours or theirs? Remember what Ford said. What? Never mind. Start with the basic events. Everyone's in agreement there. As to interpretation, that's up to you. Just tell me what you think happened and why, based on all the accounts. Original thought is what counts. But how can I be sure if I wasn't there? That's always the problem, isn't it? There's an old adage. Those who were there know more than those who weren't. The problem is getting people to believe you. Nonetheless, you know what you know. So you learn to keep some things to yourself. <laughs> but that doesn't affect you, Janice. We deal with truth in my class. Nothing but the truth, for better or worse. They say it can set you free. I'll get it, Father. Hello there, miss. I've got a great deal on a set of encyclopedias. Sorry, we don't want any. Just let me get my foot in the door. Oh, really? You know what's wrong with you, Professor? What? You're always on time. Sort of takes the mystery out of things. Oh, so I'm not mysterious enough for you. That's just it. You're too mysterious. Except when it comes to keeping dates. Get in here. Mm. Mm. <laughs> What's that for? Because. Like my new dress? Awful. Get rid of it right away. You mean here and now? Watch it. You're a PhD, not some sorority girl. And not yet, I'm not. There's a little matter of a thesis, remember? A mere technicality. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You're about to give it all up and become a housewife. The devil she is. Hello, Sam. I didn't see you there. I'm giving you my daughter's hand, not her brain. Which I inherited from you. She'll get that PhD if I have to... A spanker, I know. Well, I like that. Spare the rod and spoil the child. Pour yourself a drink, Walter. Dinner's almost ready. Don't tell me you're the cook again tonight. Indeed, and why not? Don't you think it's about time Susanna learned for herself? He won't let me. Force of habit, after her mother died. Let's go into the dining room, shall we? I'll serve. You sure there's not something on your mind, Sam? Nothing that a good meal won't cure. Had enough to eat? I take it all back, Sam. She'll never be the cook you are. I wouldn't even try. Well, you could try. Who knows? Maybe you've inherited your father's talents. What do you think you're doing in here? I'll do the dishes later. Unless this is the men's hour. Cigars and brandy and all that. Not a cigar. A pipe. It's not the dishes I'm worried about. It's a little matter of a doctoral thesis. Upstairs with you. Walter and I have some talking to do. I don't believe this. It is the gentleman's club. Right here in my own house. Just for a while, Susie. Then you can have Walter to yourself. 
You're not going to treat me this way, are you? Worse, you might have to support me. Then the wedding's off. Good night, Daddy. See you before you go? It's a requirement. Brandy? Ah, by all means. You know, you don't have to worry about her. She'll accomplish anything she sets her mind to, with or without us. Oh, I know that. But she's wasted a lot of time. She's almost 30, and I'm almost 70. You're talking about chronological age. You're both still very young. I don't feel young lately. Aches and pains. Let's sit down. The chessboard is exactly as we left it. Hmm. My move, isn't it? Do your worst. Hmm. How about pawn to King's Bishop 4? Look at that. You don't like it? Not the move. Your hands. Well, what about them? Extraordinary, isn't it? They looked very much the same when we met, those two hands. Firm, smooth, not the slightest discoloration. Time marches on. For some of us. Walter, tell me something. Of course. How old are you? You know the answer. Forty-four. My move. I seem to recall that when you applied for a position at the university, you listed your age as 39. That was, uh, let me see, 12 years ago, which would make you 51 now. Come on, Sam. So I'm 51. Too old for Susanna, is that it? In a sense. What are you getting at? This is between the two of us. It won't go beyond this room. Really, Sam? Walter. When I met you, I was 58. I had most of my hair, all of my teeth, and hardly a wrinkle. Look at me now. In 12 short years, I've turned into an old man. But you haven't. It happens that way sometimes. I know. But why? Clean living? Don't ask me, Sam. You're the chemist. I'm just a history teacher. Yes, and you teach it very well. Do you know what your students say? They say it's almost as if you witnessed history firsthand. I try to make it interesting. Fake it, you mean? You could call it that. Yes, that's what I thought. But somehow it didn't seem like you. You're such an honest, precise man. Ah, here it is. What have you got there? A book. A first edition. Photographs, mostly. Taken by a fellow named Matthew Brady during the time of the Civil War. Well, what is it? You look as if you'd seen a ghost. Perhaps I have. Hand me that magnifying glass, will you? I don't see. Was your grandfather in the war by any chance? No. In that case, I'd say we have something of a mystery in our hands. Hmm? How so? You got me interested in your major skeleton today. Oh, that. <laughs> I was curious to see what he looked like. So I went through the Brady pictures, not really expecting to find anything. Here, this is a shot of Sherman and three staff officers. Yes, typical of Brady's work, moody, grim, not a smile between them. Look closely. The one with a pistol in his belt is identified as Major Hugh Skelton. This photograph was taken in the 19th century, and yet it looks exactly like you. I'd know those eyes anywhere. In fact, Walter, I'd have to say, it is you. It is you, Walter, isn't it? 
Photographs can be deceptive. Poor lighting, grainy images. You shouldn't have kept the ring, you know. It's a dead giveaway. Ring? Uh, it, it is a bit like mine. Not like it. The same. Sam, really, you can't be saying what I think you're saying. That wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't be rational. It wouldn't... Come now, Walter. We're not children. You know exactly what I'm saying. I've been accused of many things in my time, but never of being inarticulate. Oh, you're joking. Just because a man in a picture happens to look like me... And happens to wear the same ring, and happens to have the same small mole on the left side of his face. Did you keep the pistol? Or is it in a Civil War museum somewhere? Oh, Sam, Sam. Tell me the truth. You know what the truth is, don't you? You are the man in the photograph, aren't you? Yes. I knew it. I've suspected for a long time. But, of course, it seemed so fantastic. It is. Yes. So, now we're on equal footing at last. The time for lies is over, Walter. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. So tell me, how old are you? You won't believe me. I can believe anything now. This bust on your mantelpiece? What about it? It's after a Greek statue, as I recall. The head of Cato the Elder. That's right. Let's just say... I'm old enough to have known this gentleman personally. But he lived more than 2,000 years ago. I said you wouldn't believe it. No. No, it isn't that, but... 2,000 years? How, Walter, how? You don't know what you're asking. In heaven's name, this is what mankind has been dreaming of. Sam. To live forever. To go on learning and understanding eternally, without end, without death. Sam. Tell me the secret. I can't. You must. You owe it to the world. I owe the world nothing but contempt and pity. Then tell me any part of it. I'm almost 70 years old. I have a heart condition. I'm going to die. But I don't want to until I finish my life's work. Walter, listen to me. Do you understand? I'm not ready to die. I can't tell you the secret because I don't know what it is myself. What? I was like you, Sam. Afraid of death. Too afraid to face the concept head on. When I thought of all the things there were to know and the pitifully few years man had to know them, I went cold with fear. And with anger, too, at the impossibility of it all. The combination was paralyzing. Every night I dreamed, as you dream, of more time, of immortality. Only if man lived forever, I thought, could there be any point to living at all. I'm thirsty. You have water? Come in, traveler. Thank you. You're very kind. One day, on the road, I met a man. An alchemist. I told him these things and more as I rested with him. He said that he could grant my wish. Only it would cost money. A great deal of money. So I sold everything I had and paid him his money and submitted to his experiments. Drink this, young man. You may remain here until you recover. I feel strange. That will pass.
I remember very little of what followed, except that I was in a coma for many weeks. When I revived, I learned that the alchemist had been burned for blasphemy. You're not serious. An alchemist? The only legitimate one that I've ever known. You're asking me to believe something that goes against everything I know. Not without proof. But an alchemist? I'm a man of science. They knew nothing of chemistry. Lead into gold. Just as I thought. You won't believe it. Smoke and mirrors. Their methods were based on superstition. Magic. What did he use? Bat's blood and eye of toad? And once upon a time, germs were unknown. And blood cells and pasteurization and human growth hormone and... Sam, all those things and more would have been called magic once. It's a matter of knowing what to measure and how. Do you realize that most of today's medicines come from plants? Witch doctors discovered a long time ago that they worked, even if they couldn't explain the reason. Don't lecture me. All right. But you'll grant that certain phenomena exist before we know why. Science is like history in that respect. A detective story, working backwards from known facts until we understand the cause. And I'm the most undeniable of facts. Unless you can come up with another explanation. Go on. There isn't much more to tell, really. I thought the experiment had failed, of course, because I didn't feel any different. But then, when I saw my wife and my children and my friends aging and growing old, this was a problem I hadn't considered, you see. But surely there's a way to get around that paradox. Such as? There must be. Is there? Think about it. If I tell you that somehow I can stop you from aging, where do you want to be stopped? At 30? Then you watch everyone around you turning old. At 70? Would you want to live forever the way you are now? Sick and weak? It's better than dying. No, Sam. You're wrong. I was wrong. It's death that gives this world its point. We love a rose because we know it will soon be gone. Who ever loved a stone? I'm not a rose, and I'm not a stone. I'm a man, very old, very frightened. Of what? Death? Yes, of death. You're a fool. I want to die. Then why don't you? Because I'm a coward, like all men. Because I'm tired of living and scared of dying. That's why. There's a revolver in my desk at home, Sam. The same one you saw in the Civil War photograph. Every night, I hold it in my hand and pray for the courage to pull the trigger. But I can't. You mean to say you've survived all these years without an accident, without being injured or wounded? Some people are lucky that way. They go through life without ever breaking a bone or seeing the inside of a hospital. Oh, I've come close to death plenty of times, but never close enough. Thank you. For what? For reassuring me. I thought that if a man lived forever, he would grow wiser. But that isn't true, is it? You grow tired, that's all. It must be lonely. That's a word that comes to mind. You say it as if you think it's a word I don't know anything about. I suppose you were married more than once? Yes. How long with each woman, Walter? Ten years? Fifteen? I take your point. Now you know why I attended your lecture. Why I asked you here tonight. It wasn't idle curiosity. I suspected as much. Sam, this isn't a situation of my choosing, not any longer. I tried to resign six months ago, but you talked me out of it. Do you remember? Yes. Do you know why? I knew that Susanna was falling in love with me. And I knew what would happen, because it had happened before. A few years of happiness, and then... I warned her. I did everything I could to discourage her. Except tell her the truth. 
How could I do that? She'd have thought I was mad. Then why didn't you leave? Because it was too late. I was in love with her. Everything was against it, all my reason and experience. But that didn't matter. And God help me, it doesn't matter now. It does to me. Walter, I can't let you marry my daughter. And why not? Susie. Well, go ahead. I asked a question, Father. We were just having a conversation. So I gather. How long were you standing at the top of the stairs? Long enough to hear that there's some sort of disagreement over me. Don't you think it would have been considerate to include me in the negotiation? It's not a negotiation. Please, don't misunderstand. Your father seems to think I'm too old for you, darling. Susanna, let me explain. That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. Good. In that case, you will marry me? I thought that's already been decided. You asked, and I accepted. Unless you're having second thoughts. Nonsense. If I had my way, we'd do it tonight. Are you serious? I've never been more serious in my life. I think you mean it. There's a justice of the peace in the next county. Go upstairs and get your prettiest dress. I'll go back to my place and pick you up in an hour. But... Go. Go! Daddy? I can't very well ground you, can I? You're of legal age. Oh, Walter. I do love you. Though your timing is a bit of a surprise. Life is a surprise. If we're not ready now, when will we be? Next week? Next year? We have to seize happiness when it comes, and it's here now. One hour, darling. I'll tell her. She won't believe you, Sam. No one would. In fact, by tomorrow, you won't believe it yourself. We'll see. Yes, we will. Yes? I'll give you one last chance, Walter. If that's your name. Sam, please. The irony is, I truly like you. We've been fine friends. But when it comes to my daughter... You deny her happiness? Is that what you call it? People who love each other don't have secrets. They share their lives. They grow old together. Susanna's entitled to the same thing. Not a mockery of it. You don't think this is easy for me. There's nothing ahead for her but a broken heart as she sees herself age while you don't. How long do you think you can keep it from her? And if I go away, will that make her happy? She'll suffer, but she'll get over it. You don't belong here. Any more than that antique pistol in the photograph. It's still here. In my desk drawer. And so am I. That's reality, Sam. For better, or worse. She's upstairs now, packing. If you come back, I'll expose you. Not just to her, but to the university and the world. Starting tonight. You mean it, don't you? You don't leave me much choice. Give me a few minutes. I need to think it through. Good. If you love her, you know what to do. Yes, I know what to do. Only, I don't know if I have the courage. Hello, Tommy. Who are? You needn't stand up. How did you get in? You left the front door open. Who are you? Don't you recognize me, Tommy? No, I don't think I... Look hard into my eyes. You called them the most beautiful you'd ever seen once. 
a long time ago. I think you've made a mistake. No. It's you, Tommy. My name is Jameson. Professor Jameson. And if you don't leave my house at once, I'll be forced to call campus security. Don't pretend with me. I know who you are. And who is that? Tom Bowen. Tom? My husband. That's impossible. I've never been married. You mean you don't remember? How convenient for you. We married right after the Great Depression. We lost our farm to the drought. Crops died and blew away like dust. And you, still a strong, vital man. So we packed up the car and moved west. The living would be better now, you said. And it was for a while. We had a little girl. Did you know she passed away last year, Tommy? A grown woman herself, getting on in years. It's not right to outlive your children. But me, I had to keep going. It was like I'd been waiting all these years, waiting to know where you went when you ran off. And now, I found you. My dear lady, perhaps if you told me who you're looking for, I could... Oh, stop. Please, stop. I saw your picture in the paper. Huh. I knew it was you by those eyes. And the ring. You always wore it. So I had to see if it was true. It is. No, oh, Lord. Look at that. I can't explain it. I only know what I see. I've grown old. And you haven't. Don't. Please. And now you're going to marry someone else and leave her the way you left me. Lorette, for God's sake. I can't let you marry her, Tommy. You're mine. Don't touch me. What's this? Put the pistol down. Oh, I remember that gun. You used to keep it locked away said it belonged to your great-grandfather. Take it out and oil it like you knew you were going to use it someday. Is it still loaded? I said put it down. Tommy, what you're doing, it's wrong. You can't go on hurting people the way you hurt me. I won't let you. Lorette, for the love of... <clears throat> What was that? I didn't hear anything. Are you sure? I thought... Thought what? I... don't know. Susanna, dear, please wait. Don't try to stop me. I've made up my mind. I know. It's not like I'm going away. Walter and I will be married, and then we'll come back and I'll move my things into his house. It's only down the block. I'll still see you every day and... Shh! I did have some things to say to you. Very important things. But now, I don't know where to start. Please don't. I'm nervous enough as it is. Can't you be happy for me? I know it's a change, a big change, but surely you're not surprised. You must have seen it coming. I know we haven't talked much about it, but... Do one thing for me, sweetheart. What? Bring me my reading glasses. I shan't be able to sleep while you're off eloping. At least I can get some reading done. Oh, Daddy, thank you. Where did you leave them? Upstairs in my bedroom, as I recall. Would you mind getting them for me? Of course I will. If Walter comes to the door, tell him... I know what to tell him. 
Don't expect him just yet. There's still time. Wait right here. I'll find them. Excuse me, I didn't see you there. I saw my Tommy. He's resting now. Good evening to you, madam. Walter. Walter, where the devil are you? Sam. Why are all the lights off? I, I was just uh, thinking. The window's open. I know. I'll close it. <laughs> no. What's the matter? <sighs> it's a, a strange feeling after all this time. What do you mean? I mean, I've come to my senses. Tell Susanna. Tell her if, if you would. <laughs> You're hurt. Turn on the light. Stay away. I'll call a doctor. No. But your hand. There's blood on it. Hard to avoid that when you've been shot. <laughs> it's dripping all over everything. <laughs> I'm leaking, Sam. Everything that's been held inside for so long, it's running out. I feel light as a feather. Take my arm. Sit down. Quickly. A little late for that. <laughs> I'm sinking, Sam. Right into the rug. It'll be quite a mess to clean up. <sighs> What's happening to you? It's happening. At last. Your hair. Your skin. Sorry to fall apart on you. <laughs> oh. But nothing lasts forever. Thank God, Sam. Thank God. In his wisdom. Oh. Walter. Walter. Tell her. I'll try to think of something. Don't let her see me. Dad? Walter? No, Susanna. Stay back. Daddy! Go home. Where's Walter? Susanna, please, go home. Now. Walter? He's gone. Gone where? I wish I could tell you. But there are his clothes, his shoes. Daddy. Daddy, what else is on the floor? Dust, my dear. Only dust. Professor Walter Jameson, an expert in the subject of times long past, and above all, a consummate actor, since before this university was founded. He's finally completed his life's work, a history of the world that begins in the cradle of civilization and ends in our time, because the future was not his specialty. In fact, the simple truth is he had no future left. The past has a way of catching up with us, sometimes when we least expect it. They say that time heals all wounds, but it also wounds all heals. Rest in peace, Professor. You've just passed the ultimate final examination. 
in the twilight zone. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. Long Live Walter Jameson, starring Lou Diamond Phillips with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were David Darlow, Alyssa Fraden, Elizabeth Leto, Anne Whitney, Jeff Lubiton, and Christian Stolte. This next segment is a beautiful time travel episode that takes a different approach. This one is for those who love time traveling stories. Just a quick note, dear Vintage Classics listeners, please keep in mind that once you cross into the zone, anything is possible. Enjoy. How much longer, Chris? Not long. We'll stop soon as we find a place. Where? Look around. We saw the last shade two days ago. That's a buzzard up there circling the wagons, and it's been following us since dawn. It's waiting for the next one to die. How's the boar? Still burning up with fever. He can't take any more. All right, honey. Hold up! Oh! Oh! Uh -huh. oh! We'll stop here for a few minutes. There. There. Still the fever? Poor little thing is burning up. If I could just use a damp cloth. Try my handkerchief. Can we spare it? If he needs it, we can. Here, put this on your forehead. It'll make you feel better. How's that, son? This is the eleventh day, Christian. Eleven days of fever. He can't go on much longer. Hey, you said that on the third day, and then on the fourth. He'll take more, just as we all will. This is Arizona country. We've got 400 more miles, and we've already... Traveled almost 2,000. We'll do what we have to do. All of us. How's the boy, Mrs. Horn? About the same. Thank you, Charlie. Figure that Apache country is just due south. That's what you said we were looking out for, ain't it? That's what we've been looking out for. We travel due west, close together and button up tight at night. No fires if we can help it. Bad Indians down there, Chris. That's what we heard. And they travel in big parties, don't they? And we got five rifles. Five rifles, Chris, and a sick child, and four wagons, and seven dead, tired men and women. We was dead tired a week ago, and a month ago, and a month before that. And there were war parties back in Kansas, and we near froze to death in Colorado. And we was out of our minds with, the, with, with thirst last month. And we've kept on going. We've always kept on going. We always... It's this way, Chris. We've been doing a lot of talking and a lot of thinking. And? We figure we ought to turn back. Turn back? That what you all want? Turn back? Chris, we're about at the end of our rope. We're hungry and we're sick. We figure we better do it now, or we're gonna die out here. You turn back and I guarantee it. You turn back and try to go over 1,500 miles to St. Louis again, and you'll leave your bones bleached in one of those deserts between here and there. Or have your scalps taken off. Or you'll freeze to death in a, in a, in a mountain pass. And if you go on, what's going to happen to that beautiful child of yours? Listen, those 1,500 miles are behind us. They're all gone. The heat, the cold, the misery. You can, you can look back at them as things that have, that have happened. Not agonies you're, you're going to have to live with. How do you know there's not going to be more days and weeks and months like it? How can you be so blame sure? I figure there's only about four to 600 miles more to go. Four to 600 more miles, friends. And then we've made it. We can't stop now. Listen, if we stop, we're dead. That's gospel. We're dead. 
Could be we're dead anyway. Okay, okay, just give me one more week. One week. I'll get us through. I promise you. I'll get us through. What about water? We're almost out of water. I'll get water. I'll, I'll find some. How, Chris? With a divining rod? I, I, I don't know how, but I will. I swear. The year is 1847. The place is the territory of New Mexico. The people are a tiny handful of men and women with a dream. Eleven months ago, they started out from Ohio and headed west. Someone told them about a place called California, about a warm sun and a blue sky, about rich land and fresh air. And at this moment, almost a year later, they have seen nothing but cold, heat exhaustion, hunger and sickness. The men and their families are now one with the animals and the wagons and the landscape, and they stare straight ahead, numb and glassy-eyed. They are dust blobs whose lives have been reduced to a single function, forward motion. The man in the lead wagon is named Christian Horn. He has a dying eight-year-old son and a heart-sick wife, once beautiful but now gaunt and drawn in the merciless desert air. Her husband is the only one who has even a fragment of the dream left, Mr. Chris Horn, who's about to go over the rim of a sand dune in search of water, sustenance, and survival, and who, in just a moment, will find himself heading into an uncharted territory known as the Twilight Zone. And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone, A Hundred Yards Over the Rim, starring Jim Caviezel, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. A man had best not make promises he can't keep. I give you my word. And food and medicine for your child? We'll have those things. We'll, we'll have food and medicine and, and everything else. If you can just keep going. Just... Just keep going and, and, and don't look back. Look out there instead. L look west. We don't even know where that is anymore. Don't make any decisions yet. We can't stay here anyway. Once we're past the trail, we'll be able to rest a couple of days. I'm almost out of water, Chris, and food. I'll go up ahead, over that sand hill. I'll do some checking around. Stay here now, all of you. Martha, give me my rifle. Chris? Chris, you might, you might look for a shady spot, a pretty spot where we, where we can. <laughs> I won't talk about bearing our son, not now, not while there's life in him. How far are you plan on going? Just over the rim there, a hundred yards or so. Might find a stream or something, maybe some game, a rabbit or two. Never can tell. I guess that's true enough, friend. Never can tell. Stay close to the wagons and keep them bunched up. Hold on, Charlie. All of you. Just hold on. I'll be right back. What in God's name? Hey, everybody. Look what's over here. There's a road. Down on the other side. A, a road. Look. Martha? Charlie? Hey! Hey! Where's the wagons? Where... Where'd everybody go? Well, must have got turned... turned around there. Go on. Go up again and see. Yeah. See which way I'm looking. What's going on? What, what, what in the devil's name is going on here? Oh, the road's hard. And black. What the... What are these poles doing here? All these wires? Joe? 
Yeah? What was that? Backfire. What? Truck backfired. Oh, you sure? I thought I heard a gun go off. Not likely. It might be one of those local boys shooting your sign. Well, if it was, I'll get the sheriff out here, but that didn't sound like any 22 to me. Look, Joe, who's that? Some guy with a rifle. Go in the other room. But, Joe... I said, get in back. I'll take care of it. Howdy. Did you see it? You, 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 did you see that thing? What thing? That monster. That, that big animal or, or, or monster or whatever it was. It almost hit me. Monster? No, I didn't see anything like that. If there was anything, it never got to hear. It must have. It went by me just a mile or so back. You mean... You, you don't mean the truck. What's a truck? Hey, are you all right? You wouldn't have any water to spare, would you, mister? Any extra, I mean. Water? Sure. Come over here and sit down before you fall down. Here you go. Is all this for me? Sure. On the house. Well, thank you kindly. Some more? You got more? Sure do. Whoa, whoa, now. You don't want to drink it too fast. Just how long you been out on the desert, anyway? Uh, how long? Uh, well, almost a year. Well, at least almost a year of traveling. Started from Ohio. I had six wagons to start with. One of them was burned by Indians, and one turned back. Indians? Wagons? What are you talking about? Say, mister, what, what happened to your arm? You're bleeding. Oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> well, I guess I did it to myself when that thing come at me. I rolled out of the way. Thought it was a mirage, then the gun went off. Just a flesh wound, though. Not too deep. I'll have Mary Lou look at it. She's my wife. She used to be a nurse's aide. Mary Lou! Everything okay, Joe? The fellow here, he shot himself in the arm. He did? By accident, he says. You want to take a look at it? Oh, why, sure. I'll get some bandages out. Hand me a clean towel, will you, Joe? Sure thing. Got the first aid kit right here under the counter. I'll just set your gun over here. Oh, well, thank you kindly. Well, careful with it now. That's a real old-timer. Antique piece, isn't it? Uh, no. I uh, bought it new before we started out, but she's been used a lot, I guess. We're running low on bullets. I don't suppose you've Got any ammunition around here? Oh, uh, no. We don't carry anything like that. This isn't a hunting area. What about Indians? The south of here's Apache country, isn't it? Why, sure. Well, sure, but there aren't any Indians nowadays. Well, I mean, not, not hostile Indians. No? Well, not as long as we've been here. Well, how long you been out here? How long? Oh, well, a couple of years now. Where do you hail from? Well, we used to live in Phoenix. Phoenix? Yeah, Phoenix. Mary Lou's folks are from there. I worked for her old man when we were first married, and then I bought this place here. The restaurant isn't doing so well, but the truckers are starting to come in now with the interstate. Restaurant? Uh, you have food? Sure do. Just like the sign says. <laughs> On the wall there, see it? Right over the register. Joe's Air Flight Cafe and gas station. You don't understand a thing I'm talking about, do you? You've never heard of Phoenix or registers or nurses' aides or trucks or gas. Hey, mister, where are you from, really? Where'd you come from? Tell me straight out, why don't you? From from Ohio. I, I left the wagons back there, and I, I, I walked up the rim to the hill, and I, I thought I might find some water or something or some game, and then I saw that, that, that uh, you know, that stretch of road out there, that black road and those those things you know running on it what things he means trucks hold on hold on you hear that you hear that there's another one it's all right it won't stop take my word for it well you we heard tell it was a dangerous route but the most direct one to where 
California. They say... Uh, they say... Uh, no, no, take it easy, friend. We can talk about all this later. No, I, I, don't, I don't have much time. I, I promised them I'd be right back. There you go. Your arm's all cleaned up with a bandage on it. I even made you a slang, see? Oh, much obliged. I just try to keep it clean now. I'll give you a roll of gauze and some tape. You're a... a, a nurse? Uh, uh, and you... are you the doctor? Me? I just sling hash and pump gas. Take two of these. Drink a little water to get them down. What are they? They're antibiotic tablets. They ought to keep away any infection. Where do you get this? Well, at the drugstore. Of course, you're supposed to have a prescription, but these won't do you any harm. How do you feel? Could I... Uh, do you think I, I could buy some more of those pills off you? Oh, I don't sell them. But you see, I, I got a real sick boy back there. Back where? In the wagon, if I can ever find the wagons again. But you say that this will help a, a, a sickness. Sometimes, depending on what it is. How about a, a fever and a bad cough? Uh, it's worth a try. You've got a family? There was three wagons of us. But when I turned around to look back down, they'd, they'd gone. Well, maybe you better rest a while, friend. You, you know, lie down. Get washed up. There's a bed in back. Look at this place. The table's like, like wood, but they're not. They, they can't be. And the legs are all silver and bright. That's not silver. It's steel. It's chrome-plated. What's that thing in the corner? Jukebox. A what? Plays music. You put a coin in it and pick a tune. Here, I'll show you. Hey, where's that coming from? From inside. Didn't you ever see one of these before? You got a... You got a man inside? Playing his guitar on, on, on my account? Let him out of there right now. Turn it off, Joe. There, that's better. It was a bad idea. All these things. Where am I? What is this place? Come with me. I'll show you where to wash up. Wait a minute. That, that picture... Where do you where do you get it? The calendar? Pioneer West Insurance Company. That's a picture of my covered wagon. Look 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 just like my wagon. Oh that's just an old lithograph. The date. That can't be right. It, it says it says April. But the year's all wrong. This is the year of our Lord, 1847. But this calendar says it's it's not even the same century. Oh, my dear God. How could that be? Easy now. What's going on here? Who are you people? Where am I? Stop him, Joe. He'll get himself killed. Come on now, fella. Come inside. Please. Please. Somebody tell me where I am. One dollar and eighty-four cents your change. You keep it, doll face. I thank you. Say, uh, pretty lady, if you don't mind my asking, what time you get off work here? Oh, not till late. But you better not let that man in the kitchen hear you say that. He's my husband. Oh, uh, uh no offense, ma'am. <laughs> None taken. You come back now. I'll do that. Doctor still in back? He is. Been a while now. I made a club sandwich for the fella. You think he wants some soup, too? Well, you better ask Doc first. How's he doing back there? You have a fresh pot of coffee? Sure do. Shall I bring it to him? Not for your visitor. For me. I believe I'd like a nice, strong cup. Sit down, Doc. You look like you just seen a ghost. You look him over? 
I did indeed. And? Malnutrition, that's his major problem, along with dehydration. Well, he's a strong specimen of a man, I'll say that. Tough stock. What else did you find out? You were right. He's an interesting customer, all right? Quite the character. The heat did it, or something, didn't it? I mean, he's... Well, he's not in his right mind. I, I figure that has to be it. I'm not a psychiatrist, Joe. I'm an ancient GP. Not much past the school of castor oil and sassafras tea. But, you know, I think old Freud himself would have something to gnaw on here. How do you mean? He happens to seem very rational. Extremely rational. He can trace his imaginary life a whole lot clearer than some of us can our own. His recall of details is amazing. Or it would be if they were true. Maybe they are true. I mean, maybe he read it in a book somewhere. There's lots of books about the pioneer days. I even know a lot about my people, how they came out here. Now, one other thing. A little parenthetical aside, let's call it. The fillings in his mouth. There are two. Well, let's just say no modern dentist drilled them. Yeah, his clothes, too. They didn't come out of an Army-Navy store. No, they didn't. They're the real goods, circa 19th century. And you saw that squirrel shooter of his, Joe. Sure, but it's an antique. An antique that isn't more than a year old? A hundred and fifty-something-year-old gun, Joe, but it was manufactured less than a year ago. You said that yourself this morning. What's it add up to? Look, Doc, if you're trying to tell me... I'm not trying to tell you anything, Joe. That is to say, I'm not trying to make any point of my own. All I'm giving you is the benefit of some observations from an old hand. He says he's a pioneer, and when he climbed up to the top of that hill out there, he was living in 1847. That's what he said, all right. He seemed so sure. Well, we're three normal, rational human beings here, and we know that sort of thing doesn't happen. So he's suffering from some kind of delusion. But it's a delusion of the purest form. Frankly, I've never heard anything like it. Not with this degree of detail. The way he describes his wife, his son, the wagons, the, the other people, it's with genuine emotion. He's lying in there right now with tears rolling down his cheeks, worried about them. He said his boy was sick. He told me his boy was dying. And from the way he described the symptoms, I'd call it pneumonia. That's why he wanted the pills. Which pills? I gave him some antibiotics for the wound in his arm, and he wanted the whole bottle so he could give some to the boy. I don't get it, how someone could be so sincere. I just don't understand it. I don't either. Which leads me to the next question. Yes? What do we do with him, Doc? Precisely what I'm going to deal with right now. Where's your phone? Behind the counter. But wait, who are you calling? The authorities. So they can get him help. Oh, that won't do him any good, will it? They'll lock him up in a rubber room and throw away the key. Once he's turned over to the state, he'll get a thorough examination. They'll know what kind of help he really needs. Yeah, the funny farm. Oh, Doc, I've heard about those places. They're bad news. Nobody even knows you're in there. They, they can do anything they want. What are you suggesting? That we pack him a box lunch and send him on his way? You think he'll survive out there? He doesn't know where he is. And even if he figures that out, he'll... Die of heat exposure before the day's over. Uh, I want the sheriff's office, please. Oh, it just doesn't seem right. Yes, uh, is the sheriff there? Oh, in his car. Well, uh, that's even better. Can you radio him to get over to Joe's diner as fast as he can? Uh, we've got a man here who needs looking after. No, 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 not violent, but he should get here real fast anyway. Uh, yeah. thanks. Oh, Joe, I hope we're doing the right thing. So do I. Well, at least he's calm now. As calm as any man would be if he suddenly woke up and thought he was past his time. That's enough, Doc. Well, hello, Mr. Horn. This book, it, it was in my bedroom. Well, that's the encyclopedia. I was looking through it. I, I found something. What? Well, this this here, uh, Horn Christian Jr., M.D., famous for his early work in childhood diseases, pioneer in vaccine research, born 1839, 
died 1914. Well, that was my son. That, that's Chris Jr. So I guess I'm either crazy or the world is turned upside down. But I think I, I got put here for a reason. Oh, you did. I just know it. For an important reason. What are you doing? You've been gracious and kind, and, and I appreciate it. But i got to get back. I'll just get my gun now. Horn, we want to help you. But help means rest and medical attention. I can't let you leave like this. Come on, son. Come over here and sit down. I've called for the authorities. The, the authorities? Well, listen, I, I don't know who they might be, but I've got no time to wait and find out. Horn, please. Hey, don't, don't go trying to stop me now. I know my purpose. I'm going to finish it. Well, my life don't add up to much. Listen to us. Please, Mr. Horn. You take your hands off my gun, mister. You okay, Mary Lou? Oh, I'm fine. The gun just went off when he took it. And blew out my plate glass window. Horn! Horn, come back! Sorry, mister. What's the matter with you? Horn, wait up! Are you all right? Those people, they're trying to stop me. Yeah, huh? Where are you going? I, I have to get back to the Arizona Territory. You do? Well, that's an easy one. Don't just stand there. Get in. beast. How's that? What is this contraption? Peterbilt 18-wheeler. Best long-haul rig ever made. Where's your team? I ain't a teamster. Strictly independent. But your horses? All the horses you want right under the hood. Sweet, huh? Where you say you're headed? California. We were headed for California. Well, that's where I'm going. Good country out there, is it? Easy living, if you ask me. Everything a man could want. And... Land of work? Any seed you plant, it grows tall. That's what I heard tell. Suppose I could give you a ride all the way in, so I'd have somebody to talk to. I'm, I'm, I'm going to California, but I, I, I can't get, get there this way. What are you talking about? Uh, it has to be the same ridge, right, right around here. It was. Mister, you have to let me out. Say, look at that. Sheriff's car, moving like a bat out of hell. Please, I, I made a mistake. You, you've got to stop this. This machine. Hello, Doc. What's this emergency you got? Not exactly an emergency, Sheriff, but since I called, it might have turned into one. <sighs> Sheriff, you got to stop him. That's right. He won't make it out there. Hold on now. What you trying to tell me? <sighs> Mr. Horn, Sheriff. Horn, is it? He's the man I examined. It's a long story, a pretty strange one. The point is, now he's run off. Well, where? He headed for the ridge, where he came from. So... He came in out of the desert? And now he's going back, about a mile up the road. Now, well, don't worry. I'll find him. <laughs> Gotta make it. Just, just a little ways more. Yeah. <laughs> 
You there! Hold it! No, you don't. Not now. Drop the gun, son. I said, drop the gun. All right, now come on down real slow. The pills. I dropped, I dropped the pills. That's it. Now put your hands in the air. Got it! I said halt! Halt, son, or I'll shoot! What was that? Sounded like a shot. Maybe Chris got himself a rabbit. But he ain't even had time to get up the ridge yet. Martha! Forget something, Christian? Martha, what happened? Where'd you go? Where did we go? What do you mean, Chris? Where could we have gone? Well, when I looked down, I, I, I couldn't see you. Or the wagons. When? You haven't had time to go anywhere. Martha, I, I don't understand what you're saying, but I, I'm, I'm truly glad to see you all this time. All what time? So much happened. First I fell and, well, somehow I shot myself and... It doesn't matter. I, I have so much to tell you. But how could you? Oh, Chris, honey, you just left a second ago. What did you forget? Forget? And what's that in your hand? Oh, that's... that's a medicine. Medicine? Where did you get it? Never mind. Oh, Lord. Give him some water. Give, give him two of these. I think... I think it may save his life, Martha. I see... As you say, then. Chris? Charlie. Short trip. Was it? Nothing much on the other side, I guess. You'd be surprised, Charlie. You'd be mighty surprised. There was a whole lot to be seen at that ram. A whole new land. And you know something else, Charlie? Us. People like us. We're the ones responsible. That's the truth. People like us. What's Orrin talking about? Listen, he's saying something. He wouldn't talk like that unless it was important. There'll be a highway. And machines. And a whole new land. And we're the ones who began it. What are you saying, Chris? Where'd you see all that? Up on the rim. It was all laid out before me like the... Like the New Jerusalem. Wide, hard roads, all black, with no holes in them, and machines, and... I gotta see for myself. Me too. Let's go. Up the ridge, he says. Chris, there's nothing down there. It's, it's just like this side. Sand and desert and miles and miles of nothing. Oh, but there will be, Charlie. There will be. Just you wait. It may not happen in our lifetimes, but it's coming. It'll be here, all of it, sooner than you think. If you can hold on to what I'm telling you and keep the faith. You didn't get him, Sheriff. I saw him all right, but I couldn't get him to stop. Fired a warning shot, but I didn't scare him none. Look, I wouldn't worry, Joe. He can't get very far. Don't worry, we'll find him. Thanks, Sheriff. Y you say he had a gun? That's right, a rifle. This it? It can't be. That one's all rusty, like it's ready to fall apart. That's what I thought. He couldn't have done any damage with it. Look at it close, Joe. It is his rifle, but it's changed. It... It's just as if it had been lying in the desert for a hundred years. What's it mean? Who was he? Where did he really come from? I think... I think he went back to wherever he did come from. But... To where, Joe? Back to where he should be. Back to where he can make certain that the things it said in that book can happen. Back to a wagon train heading west to California on a spring day in 1847.
Giddy up, boys. We're going to California. And my son, too. He's got a whole lot to accomplish out there. A whole lot. Mr. Christian Horn, a farmer from the state of Ohio, one of the hearty breed who headed west when there were no blacktop highways or telephone poles or the solace of civilization. Mr. Christian Horn and family and their traveling companions, heading west after a brief detour through the Twilight Zone. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. A Hundred Yards Over the Rim, starring Jim Caviezel, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcheson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Peggy Roeder, Rick Peoples, David Darlow, Doug James, Peter DeFaria, Rich Kamenik, Meg Falcon, Zach Gray, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, Diane Trice, and Irene Olson. In this next story, an elderly woman by the name of Elva Keen receives strange anonymous phone calls in the middle of a stormy night from a man who keeps calling and keeps repeating, hello, over and over. Get your umbrellas and your booties if you're going out. Possible thunderstorms over Margaret? the next few hours. Cloudy tomorrow with a 50% chance Margaret? Of yes, Miss Alva? Come here, please. I'll be right there. Now, it's important. The dishes are all done. Do you need something? It's getting late. It's not that late, is it? We can play a game of cards if you like. A storm is coming. Is it? Well, that's what they said on the radio. A very serious one. Hmm. <laughs> the sky was clear this afternoon. Nevertheless, I think you should be getting home. Well, I'll just fix your cup of tea, then. I'd like to be in my bed. So early? Well, I'm feeling a bit tired. Well, as you wish. Do you have your shawl? It doesn't do much good. Oh, awfully chilly this evening. I'll raise the thermostat. Ah, there's the rain. Oh, I hope the roof holds. Why wouldn't it? You had it re-shingled last year. Here we go. I'll turn the bed down for you. Now, take my hands up and out of your chair. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I don't know what I'd do without you. Oh, you do just fine. You'll be walking again soon. Have you been doing your exercises like Dr. Mays told you? It's no use. These legs simply don't work anymore. Oh, Margaret, I'll never leave this house again. Now you stop that. There's a big, wide world out there. Places to go and people to see. The only way I'll see them is if they come here. And there's not much chance of that. Most everyone I know has passed on. Surely not. You have a phone right next to the bed. Call some friends. Keep in touch. Oh, it's been too long. I don't know if the numbers work anymore. Of course they do. If they don't, talk to Miss Finch at the telephone exchange. She'll look them up for you. Now, wait right here. I'll get your pills and a nice cup of hot tea. Hurry, Margaret, the rain. You'll never get home. Oh, don't you worry about me, Miss Elva. I'll be back with your tray. Oh, my. Such a terrible, terrible storm. Miss Elva Keene who lives alone on the outskirts of Linden Fleet in Maine. Her world has shrunk to the size of the small house she owns and may never leave again. 
For some years, the pattern of Miss Keene's life has consisted of sitting in her wheelchair or lying in her feather bed, knitting, reading books, listening to the radio, eating modest portions of food, napping, taking her medication, and waiting. For exactly what? She's not sure. Perhaps for something different to happen. Something small but significant that will make all the difference. Miss Keene doesn't know it yet, but her time of waiting has just ended. For something different is about to happen, by way of an unexpected phone call in the middle of a stormy night. A telephone call routed directly through the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Night Call, starring Marriott Hartley with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Oh! Oh! Someone calling? At this hour? Oh. Hello? I- I'm sorry, I didn't hear. The thunder. Hello? Hello? Who is on the line, please? Oh, no one, apparently. How odd. Perhaps I was dreamy. Oh, for the love of... Hello? Hello? I can't hear you. If you wish to speak to me, please say something. Or I'll hang up. Hello? 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 Just a moment, Margaret. You're up early this morning. Oh, what is the matter with this phone? You're trying to make a call? No one's picking up at the switchboard. Well, I imagine they're pretty busy this morning, what with the storm and all. I suppose. Phone company, Miss Finch speaking. Ready for your tea? Uh, Just a moment. Miss Finch... This is Elva Keene. Yes, Miss Keene. Can I help you? Oh, I, I certainly hope so. Well, I'll do my best. What is the problem? Uh, last night, uh, about 2 a.m., my telephone rang. Oh? I answered it, but no one spoke, and I didn't hear any receiver hanging up. Just silence. Is that right? Or, or rather, a... Uh, A crackling sound, like wind and rain. That would be electrical noise, a faulty line, most likely. The same thing happened a few moments later. Well, I'll tell you, Miss Keene, that storm last night about ruined our service. We've been flooded with complaints about fallen wires and bad connections. I'd say you're pretty lucky that your telephone is working at all. Oh, you would, would you? Yes, ma'am. And would you say, then, that someone was trying to call me, but that the connection was washed out? That's as good an explanation as any, Miss Keene. But who would have tried to call me in the middle of the night? I'm sorry. I wish I could be of more help, but the way things are right now... Uh, Is it likely to happen again? I really couldn't say. It might. Were you expecting a call? Not at that hour. It depends on what's causing it to happen, of course. Could you find out... If there's a breakdown somewhere, our crews will find it and repair it. And what am I to do in the meantime? If it does happen again, you just call me and I'll run a special check on it. Will you do that? Well, if that's your only suggestion. 
I'm afraid it is. I'll be here in any event. Well, goodbye, Miss Keene. Goodbye. All taken care of? I'm not sure. I'll start your tea, and then we'll move into the living room. Would you like that? Margaret. Yes, Miss Alva? Did you call me? When? Last night. At two in the morning? No, ma'am, not me. Oh. I thought you might have tried to check on me because of the storm. But then uh, I don't pay you for nights, do I? More tea? No, thank you. Have you taken your pill? Yes. Don't I always? Never missed one yet. The highlight of my morning. The mail should be here by now. Shall I check the box? Why don't you do that? With multiple injuries in the five-car pileup, so take caution while driving in these slick conditions. The storms are still very strong in the north and northeast, while the rest of the city, the severe storms seem to have passed over. Several areas were still without power last night due to fallen wires. Workmen restored electrical service shortly before dawn. Here's your mail, Miss Alva. Thank you. Anything interesting? Oh, an advertisement. Another advertisement. The light bill, the telephone bill, of course. No personal letters. You heard from your sister a few days ago, didn't you? Oh, that was weeks ago, Margaret. Three weeks and two days, to be exact. Has it been that long? Yes, that long. Nobody cares whether I live or die. Oh, sure they do, Miss Elva. You don't understand. Don't I? You can't. You have no idea what it's like to be alone. But you're not alone. I come by during the day. Yes, you do. And for that, I thank you. But it's been so long since I've had a real visitor. I mean, someone who came of their own accord. Oh, now don't talk like that. You're going to get yourself into a mood. I'm sure lots of people are thinking about you this very moment. Who? You'll hear from someone any time now. Just be patient a while longer. Wouldn't you like to work on your knitting? All right. Can I get you anything else? Not just now. Well, start thinking about what you want to eat tonight. I'll make a list and go to the store later. For now, I better get the dishes washed. Hello? Hello? Margaret? Yes? Come here, quickly. Was that the phone? See, someone's calling you now. Take the receiver. What for? I want you to listen. If you like. Well? There's no one on the line, Miss Elva. Just listen. See if you can hear whether anyone's there. There's nothing. But you heard it ring, didn't you? Yes. Tell me if someone hangs up. Not a thing. The line's dead. Wait. What's the matter? Oh, well, it doesn't matter. I'll call Miss Finch and have them check on it. You really think that's necessary? Yes, I think it's necessary. Am I to suffer calls like that at all hours of the day and night? Calls like what? There was no call. Then why did it ring? It was a mistake, that's all. How could it be a mistake? Someone must have dialed my number. Not if it's a malfunction. Something's wrong with the equipment. I'm sure they'll... What are you doing? Reporting it. Phone company, Miss Finch speaking. Hello, Miss Finch. I thought you should know. I've received another one of those calls.
There we go, I peeled you an apple. And here are two of your favourite cookies to go with your tea. Can you think of anything else? No, no, I'm sure that will do. All comfy? Ah, perhaps one more pillow. Certainly. Here you are. Thank you, Margaret. You go to so much trouble. It's no trouble at all. I wish you could understand how degrading it is for me to ask for help. I've always been able to take care of myself. Oh, now. We get along just fine, you and me. We're friends. I don't have friends anymore. Don't be silly. You have more friends out there than you realize. Oh, I wish that were true. You'll see. You'll hear from them. Meanwhile, don't fret about those phone calls. Don't give them another thought. I'll try not to. It was the storm, I'm sure of it. Perhaps you're right. Whatever the trouble was, the repairman have fixed it by now. But just to be sure, why don't you keep the receiver off the hook and then you won't be bothered? Oh, that's a good suggestion. You know, I have an extra television set, a portable. I could bring it over if you like. No need. There's hardly any reception out here. There is if you put up an antenna or connect with the cable system. That costs money. Besides, there's nothing I care to see. Suit yourself. But if you change your mind, let me know. You should be getting home. It is getting late. Let's see. You have your pills, your knitting. Would you like a book? Uh, I'll be going right to sleep. Good night then, Miss Keene. See you in the morning. Yes, in the morning. Margaret, there it is again. What should I do? Nothing. Just as I thought. I won't speak. I'll hang it up and then leave it off the hook. Yes? Who's there? Who is it? Hello? What is making this sound? Is anybody there? Anybody at all? Who is on the line? Who is it? Who? Hello? What is that? Please, please leave me alone. No. Please. No. Here we are, your favorite spot in the living room. Not today, please. Well, where then, Miss Elva? Away from the window. If you're going to knit, you'll need the light. I don't care to knit just now. Very well. And close the curtains. Close them? I just opened them. That's the way I want it. But look what a lovely day it is. With the curtains drawn, there'll be hardly enough light for anything. Please do as I say, Margaret. I'm not feeling well. Why? What's wrong? My nerves. I hardly slept last night. You didn't? Not a wink. Why on earth? What happened? Do I have to tell you? No. Not the telephone. Yes. At all hours, over and over again. You're sure? Indeed, I am. The sound is so loud in this house, it hurts my ears. 
Well, we can't have that. And this time, he spoke to me. He didn't. Margaret, I simply can't bear it. Shush, dear, don't you worry. We'll do something about that right now. Call Miss Finch and clear it up. She won't listen. Of course she will. She doesn't take me at all seriously. Well then, I'll have a word with her. We can't have you going without your sleep. Operator? Is that Miss Finch? It is. This is Margaret Phillips, Miss Keene's private nurse. Oh, yes. How are you? I'm fine, but Miss Keene isn't doing so well. Oh, sorry to hear that. Why haven't you fixed her line yet? I've told her we'll repair it as soon as... It's gone beyond that. Now someone is speaking to her. She can't sleep at all. If Miss Keene's health should be disturbed any further, the phone company will be held responsible. Now, just a minute. Give me the phone. Here she is now. She'll tell you herself. Miss Finch. Yes, Miss Keene. There's a voice on the phone. A voice? It says one word over and over. Hello. It doesn't sound normal. It sounds distorted. Are you sure it's a voice? What else could it be? Well, static on the line sometimes. It was someone, I tell you. The same someone who kept listening to me say hello over and over again without answering back. The same one who made those horrible noises. What kind of noise? I don't know. That's why I'm calling you. It must stop immediately. A voice, you say? Was it a man or a woman? I couldn't be sure. So you have no idea? I tell you there is no way of knowing. It could be either. And you're positive it wasn't someone on your party line? Oh. Don't you think I know the people on my party line? Of course, Miss Keene, of course. Well, I'll have a man come out as soon as possible. The crews are still pretty busy, what with the damaged lines and all from the storm, but I'll tell them to put a rush on it. And what am I to do if this person calls again? Hang up, Miss Keene. But whoever it is will only call back, and then I have to answer to stop the ringing. That's my best advice. It's either that or disconnect the line. No, no, you, you can't do that. What if there were an emergency? I have no way to call out. That's true. Then there isn't much choice. I suggest you talk to them. Try to find out more. Get a name if you can. Do that and we'll have something to go on. We'll take immediate action, I promise you. But I don't wish to speak to them at all. Then I'm afraid there's nothing we can do. So you won't help me? We can't. It could be absolutely anyone. There's no way to know. I see. Then... Good day to you. What did she say? Not a word of help. It's obvious she doesn't believe me. Oh, I'm sure that's not true. As far as she's concerned, I'm just a nervous old biddy falling prey to my imagination. But she didn't actually say... Well, she'll find out differently. You all will, if it's not too late by then. Such talk. You're letting yourself get way too upset. Why don't we have some breakfast? Would you like that? No, I'm not hungry. In a while, then. We'll both have something. I'll leave the curtains drawn so you can catch up on your rest. Would you like a pillow for your back? Make sure they're completely drawn. But it's so dark in here. I can't afford the risk. What do you mean? Well, if someone's out there, he could be watching. Watching what? Me. Oh, nothing tastes right today, not even tea. It's not your fault. I'm feeling so out of sorts. Margaret? Margaret? <clears throat> That's all right. Stay where you are. You're entitled to a nap, too.
There. That will stop it. I won't put it to my ear. I won't. But if I don't take the call, I'll never know who it is. Oh. All right, I'll leave it on the hook. And the next time it rings, I'll force myself to speak to them and find out what they're up to. Oh. Hello? Hello? Who is this? Who's calling, please? Hello. Who's calling? I've had quite enough. Stop this at once. Why do you keep saying that? Can't you hear me? Hello. Please. Hello. Hello. Margaret. Margaret. <clears throat> Margaret. Uh, yes. Oh. Oh, Miss Miss Alva. I was just resting my eyes. Is is everything all right? No, it is not. Mm, then what? The telephone. Oh, D did it ring? I thought I heard something. It's a man. I'm sure of it. How do you know? Because he just called again. I heard the tone of his voice. It was uh, deep and hoarse, like there was something wrong with him. What did he want? I don't know. Then how? He just keeps saying hello over and over. That's all he says. Hello. 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 Now you've got to stop this, Miss Keene. I've got to stop. I'm not the one who... You're working yourself into a state over... Over nothing. I didn't say that. You didn't have to. You were going to say it. Now, Miss Keene, I was not. I think I'd better put you back in your bed so you can... I don't want to be put in my bed. I want to know who this terrible man is who keeps calling. What did Miss Finch tell you? She told you it was probably a bad connection, didn't she? The telephone wires are still wet from the rain. It was not the connection. It's a man. I'm not arguing, Miss Keene, but if he keeps on saying hello... That's all he says. Then obviously he can't hear you. And that would be because of a bad connection. Doesn't that make sense? No. He heard me. I know he heard me. He paused each time and waited for me to speak. I don't know what he wants. Then why don't you hang up on him, Miss Selva? You don't have to listen. Just hang up. Is that so hard to do? No, oh, I've tried that. But the voice... Hello, over and over. Hello, hello, hello. Then do this. Take it off the hook. There, now he can't call you, right? The, nobody can call me. Leave it that way just for the time being, until all this funny business is over. It will be the same on the extension. And then if you decide to make a call, all you have to do is hold down the arm for a second. Isn't that right, Miss Keene? Miss Keene? But why is he calling me? Why would he? Can you tell me that? Why? He wants something from me, but I can't imagine what it is. Oh, I can't bear that sound. Try putting a pillow over it. Uh, there. No. Hello. Hello.
No, I beg of you. Where are you? I want to talk to you. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Phone company. Miss Finch, the problem is getting worse. Oh, hello, Miss Keene. I tell you, I won't have it. Have you tried leaving it off the hook? No, it doesn't do any good. He just waits for me to hang up so he can call back. I left the receiver off last night, but I can't do it anymore. Even when I bury it under a pillow, the noise keeps me awake. I haven't had any sleep in 24 hours. Then perhaps, Miss Keene, we should disconnect it after all. No, I am an invalid, Miss Finch. I must have telephone service in case of emergency. I'm sure you must. Now, I want the line checked, do you hear? This terrible thing must stop right away. All right, Miss Keene, I'll put a man on it right away, and this time we'll get to the bottom of it. Swear to it. I give you my word. Oh, good, thank you. You don't know what this means to me. I'll call you as soon as we find out the problem. You'll see to it, no matter what it takes. Of course. First thing, we'll give you an answer before noon. Thank you. Don't you worry now. Oh, bless you. That's what we're here for. Your play? What? Pick up your cards, Miss Elva. This is what we need, you'll see. A nice game of canasta. Oh. Yes. Now, it's your play. What is the matter with that girl? Hmm? She promised faithfully that a man would check on it today. The afternoon is almost over and no one's been by. Maybe he doesn't have to come by, Miss Elva. Why wouldn't he? If the problem is somewhere else, with one of the telephone poles, for example. Ah. Uh. Well, I suppose that could be true, but if she promised she'd let me know. Look at your cards. Did you get a good hand this time? Oh. That'll be her, don't you think? Want me to answer it? Oh, yes, yes, if you would. Hello? No, this is Margaret Phillips. Would you like to speak with her? Who is it? Just a moment. You see, it's Miss Finch. Now everything will be fine. Oh, yes? About those calls you say you've been receiving, Miss Keene. Say I've been receiving? Why don't you believe... We sent a man out to trace them. I have his report here. And? He says he followed your line through all its connections. He found the problem. Well, what is it? A fallen wire on the edge of town. Fallen... Wire? Yes, Miss Keene. The weather blew it free of the pole. I don't understand. One end was on the ground, so no signal at all was getting through. Are you telling me that there were no calls? I'm sorry, but there's no way anyone could have called from that location, Miss Keene. I tell you, a man called me. There must be a phone there. There must be some way for him to call me. Miss Keene. The wire is lying on the ground, unattached. Tomorrow our crew will put it back up and you won't have any further trouble. There must be a way that someone got through. But there is no one out there. No one at all. Out? Where? Miss Keene, it's the cemetery. <gasps> oh. Miss Keene, are you there? What is it, Miss Elva? Why have you dropped the phone? Will you tell me what's wrong? Miss Keene, for heaven's sake, what is it? Here we are. Valley View Cemetery. Are you sure you want to get out of the car? Yes. I wish you'd tell me why you decided to come all this way. Miss Keene, this isn't good for you. If you hadn't made such a to-do about it, I'd never have taken you in the first place. Why won't you answer? What can there possibly be out here for you to see? Get my chair from the back seat, please. Very well. <laughs> 
have it your way. Careful, now. Up and out. Here's a blanket for your legs. Though I can't imagine why you'd want to. Miss Elva? What are you looking at? Over there. You mean inside the grounds? On the other side of the gate. All right. We'll have to steer clear of the power lines, though. Well, there's a loose telephone wire hanging down. I can't see where it touches the ground. Where are we going? The first row on the left. About halfway down, as I recall. That's where the wire ends. I knew it. Here? Here. And we better not go any closer. It's fallen directly onto a grave. Right by an old headstone. What's the name? Brian Douglas. And the date of birth and death more than 50 years ago. Oh, the poor young man. Only 27. I knew it. <gasps> Miss Elva. It's him. Who? It's him. Brian. Oh, Brian. You knew him? Brian, my fiancé. You're... He died a week before we were to be married. Oh, Miss Elva, I didn't know. We were in a car together. I insisted on driving. I was always insisting on things, telling him what I wanted, dominating him in my way. And he always did what I said, always. I lost control of the car, steered it right into a tree. Brian went through the windshield. He was cut to pieces. I was left crippled, and now he's trying to reach me, I'm sure of it. Don't you see? He's trying to reach me. So many years out here alone, in the sun, in the wind, in the rain, and now, at last, I can talk to him. I won't be lonely anymore. Would you like more covers on the bed? No, Margaret, I'm perfectly fine. I can plump up your pillows for you. That's not necessary. I can't leave you like this. I'll be all right. Good night. But... Good night, Margaret. You call me if you need me now. I will. I'll be home all night. Yes, yes, Margaret, good night. Hope you sleep well. Now then, you may call me any time at all. I'm waiting. Oh, this is ridiculous. Now that I want you to call. Brian? Brian? Are you there? Can you hear me? It's Elva. Elva! Oh, Brian. Brian, my dear. Brian, where are you? Where are you, Brian? Can't you hear me at all? Brian? Are you there, Brian? If you are, please speak. It's Elva. Elva, you can speak to me now. I, I, I didn't know it was you, I thought. Brian, please, I know you're there. It's Elva. Talk to me, Brian, please. I beg you. Oh, 
always do what you say. Oh, God, but I didn't mean... Brian, I, I didn't mean that. Not this time. I didn't understand. I only meant... Oh, Brian. Brian, speak to me. No, no, Brian, don't go. Don't leave me here. I, I didn't know it was you. I didn't understand. I tell you, there were so many things I didn't understand. I, I, I didn't mean to say. Brian, please. Please. Oh, please. <laughs> no. Oh. Oh. According to the Bible, God created heaven and earth. But it is every man's prerogative and every woman's to create their own particular and private hell. Case in point, Miss Elba Keene, who in every sense has made her own bed and now must lie in it. Sadder but wiser, by dint of a rather painful lesson in responsibility, transmitted from the Twilight Zone. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the Vintage Classics YouTube channel. Night Call, starring Marriott Hartley, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Sarah Wellington, Meg Falcon, and Doug James. Hello, once again, Vintage Classics Zoners. In the next segment, pool shark Jesse Cardiff stays after hours at Lister's Pool Room in Chicago, practicing night after night. Jesse bitterly muses that he would be considered the greatest pool player of all time, if it were not for the memory of the late James Howard Fats Brown overshadowing him. Good listening to you all, and please do us the honor of liking and subscribing to our channel. Happy listening. Oh, tough luck, mister. Yeah, I thought I could make that one easy. Yeah, I thought so, too. Well, at least I didn't leave you much. Well, let's see. <laughs> they said you don't have a shot. <laughs> it looks like you're going to snooker yourself. Well, you never can tell. Eight ball, corner pocket. <laughs> Lots of luck. Like I said, eight ball in the corner. Hey, how'd you do that? Ah, oh, just lucky, I guess. Luck nothing. <laughs> that was some shot. Been practicing. I uh, guess it finally paid off. Yeah. You win. Here's your five bucks. Yeah, one more game? Double or nothing? Yeah, hey, you wouldn't be hustling me, would you? Do I look like a hustler? I'm not sure. Oh, come on. <laughs> me? See, I just play on my lunch hour, you know, whatever town I'm in. Relaxation. Oh, me too. Strictly for laughs. So how about it? I don't know. Flip to see who breaks? That's all right. You go ahead. Yeah? Sure. Well, okay. Double or nothing. Go on. Sing as many as you can. Make it hard for me. No money on the table. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, Pops. You know I don't allow gambling in here. Hey, we're, we're just having a friendly little game. Jesse, Jesse, why don't you give it a rest? Now, he do this a lot? Every day. It's all he lives for, this one. So he is a hustler. What are you talking about? Tell him, Pops. I never hustled anybody. Not for money. For pride. Go outside, Jesse. Get some sun on your face. You'll feel better. I already feel better. Forget the money. We'll, we'll play for the fun of it. No stakes? Not a dime. In that case, let's see how good you really are. Nice break. Of course, I didn't sink any. But that's my advantage. Yeah? Too many balls on the table. It doesn't leave you a shot. Watch me. What in the... 
Bank shot, three cushion. Curve ball. Top spin. Little English. And over and under. Now, my favorite shot. It took me years to learn this one. You're not going to believe it till you see it with your own eyes. This is the way it's done. Pretty good. Pretty good? You kidding? Nobody ever made a shot like that in the history of the world. That's yeah, not bad, I'll give you that. But you're no Fats Brown or anything. What? Put your glasses on. It was impossible, but I made it. Yeah, sure. Keep practicing. You'll get there. Hey, here's for the beer, Pops. See you around. Okay. Thanks. What, what are you talking about? Keep practicing. I made it. Jesse. Just enough hey. English, the right draw, perfect position. Settle down. Perfect. Easy, Jesse. That's all I ever hear. Fats Brown. Well, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of hearing his name. Jesse, relax. You got company. Hi, Jesse. <laughs> Jesse, you are a lucky man. Rita, what are you doing here? I thought we had a date. Oh, that's tomorrow night, Thursday night. Tonight is Thursday night. What? Oh, I, I guess I lost track of time. I'm sorry, I, I was supposed to pick you up at 8 o'clock. 7. 7. It's 9. Wow. Wow. You, you look great. Mm, don't change the subject. But I did get dressed up special just for you. Well, we can still go out. Mm, it's pretty late for dinner. Well, how about if we go out for a drink? Or a movie? How did you forget about our date? Yeah, how did you do that, Jesse? I, I was shooting pool, and I guess I just lost track of the time. Uh-huh. The guy I was playing started baiting me, saying, I'm no Fats Brown, I'm no Fats Brown. Can you believe that? How could I not be better than a guy who's been dead for 15 years? When it comes to dating, it's a draw, Jesse. <laughs> okay, I deserve that. Look, I'm sorry. I'll make it up to you. Come, come on, let's get out of here. Why not? There's nobody left to hustle. Right, kid? You bet, Pops. I beat them all. Fats might have been good in his day, but this is my day. I'm Jesse Carter, the best pool cue on Randolph Street. The best player ever. Maybe. Too bad Fats is dead. Now, you'll never know for sure. <sighs> I know. And it's killing me. I would have given anything to play him. Jesse Cardiff, Pool Shark. The best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be on Randolph Street. He has spent every free minute honing his skill for pride and for love of the game. But he's about to learn that there's more to a man's reputation than skill or talent or even fame. And that being the best at anything carries its own special problems, in or out, the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, A Game of Pool, starring Wade Williams with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hmm. So, what's the big deal about this dead Fats guy? Uh, don't you know nothing? Fats Brown is a legend. Where you been? Most people say he's the best ever. Then he must be. No, no, not really. Because most people never saw me play. I'm better. Is pool all you think about? Well, what else is there? Look, if, if you want to be the best at something, it's got to be your life, right? Where do I fit into your life, champ? Oh, oh, you are right there. I work you in whenever I can. 
You gotta understand something, baby. Pool takes a lot of concentration. Well then, I got a great idea. What? I want you to stay here. Yeah? And then concentrate oh. on losing my phone number. Oh, Rita, don't be mad. Rita, where you go? Come on! Look, Rita, please stop. Get lost. Let me explain. What? Look, I, I would give anything to play Fats Brown just once. Is that so wrong? Yes. But for your own sick, self-centered ego, I hope you get your wish. Rita, come on, give me a break. I just want to beat the best. What's wrong with that? Fats. Dead and buried in the ground. I'd give anything to play him one time. I could beat him cold. I know it. I'd show him who's the best. I'd give anything to play him one time. One time. One time. Who is it this time? Fat Brown. You're needed. Lister's Pool Room. Randolph Street. Chicago. I'm on my way. Mr. Fat Brown. What game? Whatever way he wants it, doesn't matter to me. Straight pool, anything. If I just had the chance to meet Fats Brown face to face one time. At your service. Who? How did... You called? Y yeah, but... I, I must be seeing things. Why do you say that? Fats Brown? I, I thought you were... Dead? Not quite. As long as people talk about you, you're not really dead. As long as they speak your name, you continue. Continue? The game goes on, you might say. A legend doesn't die just because the man does. No. No, no, no. I, I know that, but... But what? This is impossible. Nothing's impossible. Some things are less likely than others, that's all. Wait a minute. There's a picture of the real fats on the wall. You... You look like them, but... Not many people do. Yeah, there, standing by a table, holding this custom-made pool cue. <laughs> You mean this one? Where'd you get that? Nice stick. Good balance. I had it made to order. Wait a minute. Let me get a look at the face. The, the chin? The nose? Not one of my better pictures. It isn't a rib. I, I mean, you're, you're him. You're... James Howard Brown. Known to my friends as Fats. <laughs> I know it's a shock, but then you called me, I didn't call you. Oh, uh, well, I I didn't mean to... I mean, that is, I, I, I was just trying to... To what? I don't know. I, I was just saying if, if I could... If I could... If I could prove... It was big talk. Is that it? Well, no, not exactly. Talk is cheap. I know the type. You like to play with fire, but you don't like to cook. You're not really as good as you claim to be, and you know it. Hey! Deep down, you know you're second rate. Now hold on. Are you afraid? Now why would I be? Look, I've come a long way, boy. I don't like to be fooled with. I've met your kind before. A little skill, a little knack, some style. But when the heat's on, you fold. That isn't fair. You've never seen me play. Maybe not, but I've seen plenty like you. You have, huh? How do you know I can't beat you? How does anyone know anything? We learn to read the signs. Well, take another look. It's possible, isn't it? That's not the point. It's a matter of what's likely. But it is possible. Sure, it's possible. Things change. Records get higher. Once upon a time, nobody could run the four-minute mile. 
but people get better. Then you admit it. Yes, it's possible you could beat me. But the only way you'll do it is with a pool cue. You'll never get the job done with your mouth. All right, fat boy. Dead or alive, I'll tell you something. Maybe you are some kind of a legend, a tin god. But you know what you are to me? A big balloon, just waiting for someone to stick a needle in you. Well, I'm the someone, and here's the needle. Where? My pool cue. Oh, it'll get the job done, don't you worry. You're like all the other legends. You get by on your reputation. One time I heard a man in this very room swear he saw you make a nine-cushion bank. And you don't believe it? Now, you hit a ball that hard, it won't stay on the table. The guy had more imagination than brains. Is that so? Well, let me tell you. That's not what counts. The question is, can I back it up? Oh, how right you are. I know how good I am, but you... Then you'll play me? Rack the balls. Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. What about the stakes? The stakes? A little something to make the game more interesting. Well, here's what I got. I'll shoot it all. My whole bankroll. Any or all of it. Put it back in your pocket. Why? My money not good enough for you? Come on, use your wits, boy. What good is money to me? Then what? Something to make the long journey worth my while. Name it. You said you'd give anything for a game with me. Anything? Well, what are you getting at, mister? Just what kind of stakes are you talking about? Life or death. What? You beat me, you live. You lose, you die. You're pulling my leg. The proposition is simple enough. You're crazy. Interesting. What is? To see how much faith you have in your ability. Or should I say how little? Go chase yourself. You know something? For my money, you don't want it bad enough to be the best. Why, when I was your age, I would have jumped at the chance. But then I was better than second rate. Watch it. You wouldn't know about that. It takes more than skill to be a champion. It takes equal parts talent, work, luck, and nerve. A quality you sadly lack. Nerve? You mean insanity? How so? You want me to risk my life on a game? Insanity, then, if you prefer. Listen, I'm just a pool player. There's probably no less important thing on the face of the earth. Pushing balls around with a stick on a felt-top table. But mark this in your book. I'm the best. It's a proud thing to be the best at anything. But then you wouldn't know about that either. Hey, hold on. Hmm. Where, where are you going? I'm going back, of course. Back where? You wouldn't understand. You're wrong. About what? You say I don't want to be the best bad enough. That's not true. Oh, boy, is it not true. Do you know how many hours, how many years, how much of my blood and sweat I put into this game? I'm listening. How many nights I slept right here on this table? Yeah, I did that. I made a deal with the owner so I could practice after the place was closed. I haven't been to the movies in years. I know what you're talking about, but it's still talk and nothing else. I'm good, mister. Real good. But am I... am I that good? You'll never know until you're ready to risk everything. Will you stop pushing me? Sure I will, I was just thinking. Where I come from, there's a race driver. Go to the track and whisper his name. Say Tazio Nuvolari and watch their heads nod up and down. Or go to the bull ring and hear them talk of Manolet. Both men face death daily and both are legends. They learned something important early on. You'll never make the grade by playing it safe. Uh, this is nuts. So long, kid. Wait. What for? Oh, boy, what, what am I doing? Something you want to tell me? Well, I... You accept the terms? I... Life or death. Rack them. Just so you understand, once we start the game, there's no turning back. Get cold feet and it'll be too late. You heard me. Rack the balls. In a hurry, are you? 
I've been waiting a long time for this. Have you? Yes, I guess you have. First, the tools of my trade. Now, what's so special about that stick, anyway? It's the man that counts. You're right. But this one suits me. You know how it is, the big game hunter has his elephant gun, specially bored with a custom grip. The fencing master uses a blade from Lima. This cue, it was made for me in St. Louis. It cost 600 bucks back then, and I made a living from it for 35 years. It never let me down. Well, there's a first time for everything. Yes, I guess there is. The question is, what's the most likely outcome? Look, if you're not going to rack them, I will. Anytime you're ready. Do I get to call the game? Name it. Rotation. Kelly. 14-1 rack. 8-ball. What's your pleasure? All right. Let's see how good you are. One game, 300 points. That'll do. Standard rules. Is there any other kind? But just so there's no misunderstanding, we play for the value of the balls. Nine points for the nine ball, ten for the ten, and so forth. Agreed? Agreed. Good. Do you have a coin? Right here. Toss for break? You flip. Sure. Call it. Tails. Here goes. Why'd you put your hand over it? I want to give you a fair chance. Go ahead, let's see. You can change your mind. You heard me, tail. All right then, if you're sure. You can change your mind, you know, there's still time. Not on your life. My life's not what's at stake. Let's see it. Heads. I guess that means it's my break. Yeah, your break. As soon as I chalk up. Take your time. I know what you're thinking, son. Oh, you do, huh? Same as most players. The man who breaks is at a disadvantage. Once he scatters the balls, the other man has a clear field. Well, doesn't he? Maybe with some people, but not the way I play. Oh, sure. I suppose you can control the break. Time to go to school. Two balls into the rail, back to where they were, exactly. No advantage given. That's... that's a perfect break, all right. Mm -hmm. I bet it took you years to learn that. Oh, it did, but not the way you think. What do you mean? It takes more than practice. Not just setting up shots in an empty pool hall. You have to handle the pressure out there in the real world. Well, this is my world. You're on my turf now. I know this table like the back of my hand. Maybe, but who have you played here? Kids, two-bit hustlers, traveling salesmen? Step aside, fat man. Be my guest. Now it's your turn to scatter them. <laughs> You'd like that, wouldn't you? A safety. Playing it close to the vest, aren't you? That's what you call strategy. What are you going to do now? I'll try to think of something. There's always a power break. Yeah. But if nothing falls, you leave me wide open. And if I sink one, you're really in trouble. With luck, I can run the whole table. Prove it. Keep your eye on the 15 ball. It's not going in. Funny thing, I was thinking it is. Corner pocket. Think again. Oh, well, quite a few balls around the one. Looks like you're sewed up. Yeah, yeah. If you don't connect, it'll cost you. If I don't, mind if I smoke? If it makes you feel better. Yeah, you wouldn't have a fresh pack on you. I gave them up bad for my health. Oh, that's okay. I, I got one left. Nervous? Eh, not me. Why is your hand shaking? Uh, maybe I'm itchy to get this over with. Or maybe you're just trying to rattle me. 
Or maybe it's because you don't have a shot. Except for the bank. That'll take a lot of English. Oh, I'm loaded with it. So you are. This time. Shall I keep score? I got it. Now what? The follow-up is important. You have to plan ahead. Three rails, two ball in the corner. That's a hard combination. For some people. Watch your angle now. You watch it. Oh, I am. How about that, fat boy? Not too shabby. It was great. In some places. You know what? You're like all the others. Always trying to bring me down. Well, why would I do that? When I was a kid, there were plenty of guys like you. Guys who were good at things like music and basketball and arithmetic. They'd do anything they could to make me feel about an inch tall. Well, you fooled them, right? Yeah. Yeah, I sure did. I knew there was something, somewhere, that I could be good at. One day, I was about 16. I wandered in here. It was cool and dark, like, I don't know, like being underwater, you know? Yeah, I know. So I kept coming back. I used to stand around and watch him play. Got to know the place, till I felt relaxed. You know, one day, I picked up a stick and asked this old man. He was sitting right over there. I said, do you want to play, mister? Why not, he said. And I beat him. I beat him! That was when I knew I had an eye for the game. Three ball. Go in. An eye, huh? What happened to it? Well, I almost made it. My turn. Three ball. You know, almost works a lot of the time, but not in geometry. Well, what's that got to do with it? Pool is geometry in its most challenging form, a science of precise angles and forces. You have to understand that or you're lost. Yeah, yeah. Four ball, other end. Lucky shot. Luck had nothing to do with it. Five in the side. Angles, forces, big deal. Now who's sewed up, huh? I'll admit, it doesn't look good. You can say that again. If you don't hit the five first, you scratch. And that'll cost you points. Mm-hmm. You're a shot. Oh, man, is it. Five ball. Six. Seven. Now the eight. Nine in the side. Ten. Eleven ball, corner. I have 59 points, you have seven. The game still has braces on its teeth. Rack them up. Four in the side pocket. Five, corner pocket. Nine in the side. Ten ball in the corner.
11. Five ball. Six. Ten. Fifteen ball. Ha! Your shot. No kidding. Just in case you lost track. Tell you what I'm gonna do, fat boy. Let me make it easy on you. No, thanks. Hey, I'm trying to do you a favor. For what reason? Because I got feelings. Come on, admit it. This must be humiliating. Oh, I wouldn't say so. Well, let me say it for you, then. The game's as good as over. Is that what you think? You want to throw in the towel and walk away? I'll let you. You will, huh? Sure. That way it won't hurt so much. It's not over till it's over, son. Be serious. Look at the score. I got 299. So I see. Well, what does that tell you? I need any ball to win. That right. Time to face facts. There's no way. You might as well throw in the towel. I've been in tougher situations than this. <laughs> when? There's more to winning than scoring points. Oh, yeah? Like what? Something you can't learn in here. Then why don't you teach me? Go on, I I'm all ears. Takes time. So? That's something you got plenty of, right? Talk is cheap. The big things you have to learn for yourself. Quit stalling. It's my shot. In an awful big hurry, aren't you? To be the best? Oh, you better believe it. I've been waiting years for this. One more shot and you are history, fat boy. There's a new shooter now and his name is Jesse Cardiff. Back off and give me room. This is something I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. Don't let me hold you up. Oh, I won't, I promise. Yep, this is the big one. They don't come any bigger. Me and Fats Brown, and I need one to win. Feast your eyes on this. Number five in the corner. Funny. Something you want to say? I was just thinking. You do a lot of that. What is it this time? Just that there's more to life than a pool hall. No kidding. It isn't right you being cooped up in here all the time. You're all hard, Fats. You gotta get out a little, see what's going on. Uh, I've heard that before, from Pops. Now, what about you? What about me? Well, you didn't get to be the best sitting on a park bench. You spent a lot of time with a pool cue in your hands. You must have. Of course I did, but I found time to live, too. I've been to places where they never heard of billiards. If you call that living, why would you want to? Why bother? It's not easy to explain, but I'll try. I may not look the part, Jesse, but I've done other things, too. A whole lot of other things. I've made love, walked uphill, and swum in the ocean. I've been on airplanes and cruise ships and played tag with little children. And when I think of the wonderful things there are to see and do in this world, it hurts me to think of you rotting your life away in this miserable dark hall. What? Oh, I get it. Nice try, What's this, you don't believe me? Doesn't matter whether I do or not. You're trying to distract me so I won't make my shot. Am I? That's a lousy thing to do. But it won't work. Five, corner pocket. Hey, what are you doing? Doing? Oh, you mean the coin, sorry. It's an old habit of mine. Take your hand out of your pocket. Sure, if you like. Now don't say another word, just for a minute. This is the easiest shot I ever saw. There's no way I can mess it up. Nobody could. I'm in no hurry. Good. Take your time. I will. And right, I'll stand over here and just give you all the room you want. You do that. Enough with the chalk already. What? Oh, sorry, sorry. You're not even going to get to shoot again. I'm making this shot and there's nothing you can do to stop me. No doubt. You did that. Did what? You dropped the chalk. Then I better pick it up. My shot. But, but... That one right there, in the side. Oh, I don't believe it. 
Look at you. A little gamesmanship, a little pressure to put some fun in the game, and you come apart at the seams. You cheated. I did? How so? Well, you... Kid stuff. To make you break your concentration and shoot wild didn't take much. You know, if you ask me, that's pretty low down. Some places they break a guy's thumbs for that. Not here. Game ball. Oh, one more thing. If you want to concede now and save yourself the embarrassment... Take your shot. It's not over till it's over. Right. Even when it's just a formality. Last ball. Corner pocket. Choke. You wouldn't be trying to distract me, would you? Ha! Almost. Almost doesn't make it. There it is, the game ball again, right in front of me. All my life. So you said. Okay, you had your fun. This ball has my name written all over it. Perfect angle, clear table. I was made for this. Give it some thought, Jesse. Think about this. I sink it. I become the greatest. You're not going to make it. It's simple enough straight in, but you won't make it. You're sweating, fat man. Now, why are you so nervous? Not why you think. You wouldn't understand the reasons. No, no, no. I understand, all right. It means a lot to you, doesn't it? Even as a dead man, to have your name up there as the unbeatable champ of all time? It carries certain satisfactions, yes. I'll give you a chance at my crown, Jesse, but only if you're willing to stake your life on the game, Jesse. Couldn't be just a nice, friendly little game, huh? I take it as it comes. To you, pool is not a nice, friendly game. It's a win-at-any-price affair. I saw that right off, and I acted accordingly. But it didn't do you any good. Didn't it? I've made this shot hundreds of times. Not when your life depended on it. Is this some more of your gamesmanship? I've been studying you, Jesse. I've gone up against dozens like you. Pressure is what separates the champions from the also rans. I've seen men who could shoot brilliant pool, but they were duds when the stakes were high. That's why I insisted we play for something big. What does it matter to you if I win or not? Afraid I'll take your place? Is that it? Did people stop talking about Dempsey when Joe Lewis came along? Did Beethoven replace Bach? No. He wouldn't replace me. Then why? Someone has to keep the flame. Someone has to weed out those who haven't got what it takes. The champions, the legends, they serve a purpose. To be a challenge and an incentive. I don't need a challenge. Everyone needs a challenge, Jesse. Someone great out of the past to say, match what I've done, boy, and make it better. That's true of all walks of life. Music, politics, sports, you name it. Musicians all over the world have been better because of Bach and Beethoven and Mozart. There's a man in the White House who can look out his window and see the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial. Don't you think it helps him to be a better president? Yeah, but a game of pool? Anyone who tries to be good at anything finds himself in your shoes. He finds himself faced with a legend. And when he can't measure up to the legend, he fades away, he dies, and is forgotten. I'm only a pool player, Jesse. But I'm the best. No, you were the best. No man gets past me unless he has what it takes. And you don't think I have it? There's still one ball on the table. And it's taken you a mighty long time to get at it. You wouldn't believe this, Jesse. But personally, I'd like to see you win. Yeah. Yeah. I've only been doing my job. Stand back and give me some elbow room. Wait, Jesse. Oh, no. I've been waiting too long. Before you shoot, think about one thing. What? Sink that ball and you may win more than you bargained for. You're wasting your breath. Don't you get it? There's nothing you can do to stop me now. Nothing. Sorry, I was required to say that, something along the lines of a disclaimer. Well, what are you waiting for? Not a thing. Ha! Win more than I bargained for, huh? Is that what you said? Well, it's over. I beat you. Looks like you did. Now I'm the best. I'm the best at something. So you are, you had to prove yourself under pressure and you passed the test. Well, aren't you going to congratulate me? I'm not sure that's in order. If 
thanks. What do you mean, thanks? I beat you. I'm gonna live. Of course you are. Those are the stakes. You'll live forever. Then why thank me, fat boy? You'll find out when the time comes for you to leave Randolph Street. Ah, you're a sore loser, that's all. I beat you fair and square. Yeah. You saw it. I beat the king of the hill, Fats Brown himself. So long, kid. Thanks for the game. Me, Jesse Cardiff. Now I'm the best. And I'm going to stay the best because nobody's ever going to take it away from me. Not ever. From now on, it's me, Jesse Cardiff. You hear that, world? Jesse Cardiff. 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 Yeah. Report at once to Mason's Pool Hall. Sandusky, Ohio. Mr. Jesse Cardiff. You're needed. Yeah, I'm on my way. Mr. Jesse Cardiff, who became a legend by beating a man known as Fats. But many years later, after his funeral, he found out that being the best at anything carries with it a special obligation to keep on proving it. Mr. Fats Brown, on the other hand, having relinquished his champion's medal, has gone fishing. These are the ground rules on Earth and in the Twilight Zone. A Game of Pool, starring Wade Williams with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and Joby Cerny, and written for The Twilight Zone by George Clayton Johnson. Heard in the cast were Craig Brawley, Doug James, Roderick Peoples, Sandra Delgado, and Linda Ryder.